Section 33 of The Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Plain Speaker. Opinions on Books, Men and Things by William Hazlitt. Section 33. On a Portrait of an English Lady by Van Dyke. Part 1. The portrait I speak of is in the Louvre, where it is numbered 416, and the only account of it in the catalogue is that of a lady and her daughter. It is companion to another whole length by the same artist, number 417, of a gentleman and a little girl. Both are evidently English. The face of the lady has nothing very remarkable in it, but that it may be said to be the very perfection of the English female face. It is not particularly beautiful, but there is a sweetness in it, and a goodness conjoined, which is inexpressibly delightful. The smooth ivory forehead is a little ruffled, as if some slight cause of uneasiness, like a cloud, had just passed over it. The eyes are raised with a look of timid attention. The mouth is compressed with modest sensibility. The complexion is delicate and clear, and over the whole figure, which is seated, there reign the utmost propriety and decorum. The habitual gentleness of the character seems to have been dashed with some anxious thought or momentary disquiet, and, like the shrinking flower, in whose leaves the lucid drop yet trembles, looks out and smiles at the storm that is overblown. A mother's tenderness, a mother's fear, appears to flutter on the surface, and on the extreme verge of the expression, and not to have quite subsided into thoughtless indifference or mild composure. There is a reflection of the same expression in the little child at her knee, who turns her head round with a certain appearance of constraint and innocent wonder, and perhaps it is the difficulty of getting her to sit, or to sit still, that has caused the transient contraction of her mother's brow that lovely unstained mirror of pure affection, too fair, too delicate, too soft and feminine, for the breath of serious misfortune ever to come near, or not to crush it. It is a face, in short, of the greatest purity and sensibility, sweetness and simplicity, or such as Chaucer might have described where all is conscience and tender heart. I have said that it is an English face, and I may add, without being invidious, that it is not a French one. I will not say that they have no face to equal this, of that I am not a judge, but I am sure they have no face equal to this in the qualities by which it is distinguished. They may have faces as amiable, but then the possessors of them will be conscious of it. There may be equal elegance, but not the same ease. There may be even greater intelligence, but without the innocence. More vivacity, but then it will run into petulance and coquetry. In short, there may be every other good quality but a total absence of all pretension to, or wish to make a display of it, but the same unaffected modesty and simplicity. In French faces, and I have seen some that were charming, both for the features and expression, there is a varnish of insincerity, 
a something theatrical or meretricious. But here, every particle is pure to the last recesses of the mind. The face, such as it is, and it has a considerable share both of beauty and meaning, is without the smallest alloy of affectation. There is no false glitter in the eyes to make them look brighter, no little wrinkles about the corners of the eyelids, the effect of self-conceit, no pursing up of the mouth, no significant leer, no primness, no extravagance, no assumed levity or gravity. You have the genuine text of nature without gloss or comment. There is no heightening of conscious charms to produce greater effect, no studying of airs and graces in the glass of vanity. You have not the remotest hint of the milliner, the dancing master, the dealer in paints and patches. You have before you a real English lady of the seventeenth century, who looks like one, because she cannot look otherwise, whose expression of sweetness, intelligence, or concern is just what is natural to her, and what the occasion requires, whose entire demeanour is the emanation of her habitual sentiments and disposition, and who is as free from guile or affectation as the little child by her side. I repeat that this is not the distinguishing character of the French physiognomy, which at its best is often spoiled by a consciousness of what it is, and a restless desire to be something more. Goodness of disposition, with a clear complexion and handsome features, is the chief ingredient in English beauty. There is a great difference in this respect between Van Dyck's portraits of women and Titian's, of which we may find examples, in the Louvre. The picture which goes by the name of his mistress is one of the most celebrated of the latter. The neck of this picture is like a broad crystal mirror, and the hair which she holds so callously in her hand is like meshes of beaten gold. The eyes which roll in their ample sockets like two shining orbs, and which are turned away from the spectator, only dart their glances the more powerfully into the soul. And the whole picture is a paragon of frank cordial grace and transparent brilliancy of colouring. Her tight bodice compresses her full but finely proportioned waist, while the tucker in part conceals and almost clasps the snowy bosom but you never think of anything beyond the personal attractions and a certain sparkling intelligence. She is not marble, but a fine piece of animated clay. There is none of that retired and shrinking character, that modesty of demeanour, that sensitive delicacy, that starts even at the shadow of evil, that are so evidently to be traced in the portrait by Van Dyck. Still, there is no positive vice, no meanness, no hypocrisy, but an unconstrained elastic spirit of self-enjoyment, more bent on the end than scrupulous about the means, with firmly braced nerves and a tincture of vulgarity. She is not like an English lady, nor like a lady at all, but she is a very fine servant girl, conscious of her advantages and willing to make the most of them. In fact, Titian's mistress answers exactly, I conceive, to the idea conveyed by the English word sweetheart. The Marchioness of Guasto is a fair comparison. She is by the supposition a lady, but still an Italian one. There is a honeyed richness about the texture of the skin, and her air is languid from a sense of pleasure. Her dress, though modest, has the marks of studied coquetry about it. It touches the very limits which it dares not pass. And her eyes, which are bashful and downcast, do not seem to droop under the fear of observation, but to retire from the gaze of kindled admiration. 
as if they thrilled frail hearts, yet quenched not. One might say with Othello, of the hand with which she holds the globe that is offered to her acceptance. This hand of yours requires a sequester from liberty, fasting and prayer, much castigation, exercise devout. For here's a young and sweating devil here that commonly rebels. The hands of Van Dyck's portrait have the purity and coldness of marble. The colour of the face is such as might be breathed upon it by the refreshing breeze. That of the Marchioness of Guastos is like the glow it might imbibe from a golden sunset. The expression in the English lady springs from her duties and her affections. That of the Italian countess inclines more to her ease and pleasures. The Marchioness of Guasto was one of three sisters to whom it is said the inhabitants of Pisa proposed to pay divine honours in the manner that beauty was worshipped by the fabulous enthusiasts of old. Her husband seems to have participated in the common infatuation from the fanciful homage that is paid to her in this allegorical composition. And if she was at all intoxicated by the incense offered to her vanity, the painter must be allowed to have qualified the expression of it very craftily. I pass on to another female face and figure, that of the Virgin, in the beautiful picture of The Presentation in the Temple by Guido. The expression here is ideal, and has a reference to visionary objects and feelings. It is marked by an abstraction from outward impressions, a downcast look, an elevated brow, an absorption of purpose, a stillness and resignation that become the person and the scene in which she is engaged. The colour is pale and gone, so that purified from every grossness, dead to worldly passions, she almost seems like a statue kneeling, with knees bent and hands uplifted. Her motionless figure appears supported by a soul within, all whose thoughts, from the low ground of humility, tend heavenward. We find none of the triumphant buoyancy of health and spirit, as in the Titian's mistress, nor the luxurious softness of the portrait of the Marchioness of Guasto, nor the flexible, tremulous sensibility, nor the anxious attention to passing circumstances, nor the familiar look of the lady by Van Dyck. On the contrary, there is a complete unity and concentration of expression. The whole is wrought up and moulded into one intense feeling, but that feeling fixed on objects remote, refined and ethereal, as the form of the fair supplicant. A still greater contrast to this internal, or, as it were, introverted expression, is to be found in the group of female heads by the same artist, Guido, in his picture of The Flight of Paris and Helen. They are the last three heads on the left-hand side of the picture. They are thrown into every variety of attitude, as if to take the heart by surprise at every avenue. A tender warmth is suffused over their faces. Their headdresses are airy and fanciful, their complexion sparkling and glossy. Their features seem to catch pleasure from every surrounding object, and to reflect it back again. Vanity, beauty, gaiety glance from their conscious looks and wreathed smiles, like the changing colours from the ring-dove's neck. To sharpen the effect and point the moral, they are accompanied by a little negro boy, who holds up the train of elegance, fashion, and voluptuous grace. Guido was the gentilest of painters. He was a poetical Van Dyck. The latter could give, with inimitable and perfect skill, the airs and graces of people of fashion under their daily and habitual aspects, or as he might see them in a looking-glass. The former saw them in his mind's eye, and could transform them into supposed characters 
and imaginary situations. Still the elements were the same. Van Dyke gave them with the mannerism of habit and the individual details. Guido, as they were rounded into grace and smoothness by the breath of fancy, and borne along by the tide of sentiment. Guido did not want the ideal faculty, though he wanted strength and variety. There is an effeminacy about his pictures, for he gave only the different modifications of beauty. It was the goddess that inspired him, the siren that seduced him, and whether as saint or sinner, was equally welcome to him. His creations are as frail as they are fair. They all turn on a passion for beauty, and without this support are nothing. He could paint beauty, combined with pleasure or sweetness, or grief or devotion, but unless it were the groundwork and the primary condition of his performance, he became insipid, ridiculous, and extravagant. There is one thing to be said in his favour. He knew his own powers, or followed his own inclinations, and the delicacy of his tact in general prevented him from attempting subjects uncongenial with it. He trod the primrose path of dalliance with equal prudence and modesty. That he is a little monotonous and tame is all that can be said against him. And he seldom went out of his way to expose his deficiencies in a glaring point of view. He came round to subjects of beauty at last, or gave them that turn. A story is told of his having painted a very lovely head of a girl, and being asked from whom he had taken it, he replied, From his old man. This is not unlikely. He is the only great painter, except Correggio, who appears constantly to have subjected what he saw to an imaginary standard. His Magdalens are more beautiful than sorrowful. In his Madonnas there is more of sweetness and modesty, than of elevation. He makes but little difference between his heroes and his heroines. His angels are women, and his women angels. If it be said that he repeated himself too often, and has painted too many Magdalens and Madonnas, I can only say in answer, would he had painted twice as many. If Guido wanted compass and variety in his art, it signifies little, since what he wanted is abundantly supplied by others. He had softness, delicacy, and ideal grace in a supreme degree, and his fame rests on these, as the cloud on the rock. It is to the highest point of excellence, in any art or department, that we look back with gratitude and admiration, as it is the highest mountain peak that we catch in the distance, and lose sight of it only when it turns to air. I know of no other difference between Raphael and Guido than that the one was twice the man the other was. Raphael was a bolder genius and invented according to nature. Guido only made draughts after his own disposition and character. There is a common cant of criticism which makes Titian merely a colorist. What he really wanted was invention. He had expression in the highest degree. I declare that I have seen heads of his with more meaning in them than any of Raphael's. But he fell short of Raphael in this, that, except in one or two instances, he could not heighten and adapt the expression that he saw to different and more striking circumstances. He gave more of what he saw than any other painter that ever lived, and in the imitative part of his art, had a more universal genius than Raphael had in composition and invention. Beyond the actual and habitual look of nature, however, the demon that he served deserted him, or became a very tame one. Van Dyck gave more of the general air and manners of fashionable life than of individual character, and the subjects that he treated are neither remarkable for intellect nor passion. They are people of polished manners, and placid constitutions, and many of the very best of them are stupidly good. Titian's portraits, on the other hand, frequently present a much more formidable than inviting appearance. You would hardly trust yourself in a room with them. You do not bestow a cold, leisurely approbation upon them, 
but look to see what they may be thinking of you, not without some apprehension for the result. They have not the clear, smooth skins, or the even pulse, that Van Dyck's seem to possess. They are, for the most part, fierce, wary, voluptuous, subtle, haughty. Raphael painted Italian faces as well as Titian, but he threw into them a character of intellect rather than of temperament. In Titian the irritability takes the lead, sharpens and gives direction to the understanding. There seems to be a personal controversy between the spectator and the individual whose portrait he contemplates, which shall be master of the other. I may refer to two portraits in the Louvre, the one by Raphael, the other by Titian, numbers 1153 and 1210, in illustration of these remarks. I do not know two finer or more characteristic specimens of these masters, each in its way. The one is of a student dressed in black, absorbed in thought, intent on some problem, with the hands crossed and leaning on a table for support as it were to give freer scope to the labour of the brain, and though the eyes are directed towards you, it is with evident absence of mind. Not so the other portrait, number 1210. All its faculties are collected to see what it can make of you, as if you had intruded upon it with some hostile design. It takes a defensive attitude, and shows as much vigilance as dignity. It draws itself up, as if to say, well, what do you think of me? And exercises a discretionary power over you. It has an eye to threaten and command, not to be lost in idle thought, or in ruminating over some abstruse speculative proposition. It is this intense personal character, which I think gives the superiority to Titian's portraits over all others, and stamps them with a living and permanent interest. Of other pictures you tire, if you have them constantly before you. Of his, never. For other pictures have either an abstracted look, and you dismiss them, when you have made up your mind on the subject as a matter of criticism, or an heroic look, and you cannot be always straining your enthusiasm, or an insipid look, and you sicken of it. But whenever you turn to look at Titian's portraits, they appear to be looking at you. There seems to be some question pending between you, as though an intimate friend or inveterate foe were in the room with you. They exert a kind of fascinating power, and there is that exact resemblance of individual nature, which is always new and always interesting, because you cannot carry away a mental abstraction of it, and you must recur to the object to revive it in its full force and integrity. I would as soon have Raphael's, or most other pictures hanging up in a collection, that I might pay an occasional visit to them. Titians are the only ones that I should wish to have hanging in the same room with me, for company. End of section 33of the plain speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Plain Speaker Opinions on Books, Men and Things by William Hazlitt Section 34 On a Portrait of an English Lady by Van Dyck Part 2 Titian, in his portraits, appears to have understood the principle of historical design better than anybody. Every part tells and has a bearing on the whole. There is no one who has such simplicity and repose, no violence, 
no affectation, no attempt at forcing an effect, insomuch that by the uninitiated he is often condemned as unmeaning and insipid. A turn of the eye, a compression of the lip, decides the point. He just draws the face out of its most ordinary state and gives it the direction he would have it take, but then every part takes the same direction, and the effect of this united impression, which is absolutely momentary and all but habitual, is wonderful. It is that which makes his portraits the most natural and the most striking in the world. It may be compared to the effect of a number of small lodestones that by acting together lift the greatest weights. Titian seized upon the lines of character in the most original and connected point of view. Thus, in his celebrated portrait of Ippolito de Medici, there is a keen, sharpened expression that strikes you, like a blow from the spear that he holds in his hand. The look goes through you, yet it has no frown, no startling gesticulation, no affected penetration. It is quiet, simple, but it almost withers you. The whole face, and each separate feature, is cast in the same acute or wedge-like form. The forehead is high and narrow, the eyebrows raised and coming to a point in the middle, the nose straight and peaked, the mouth contracted and drawn up at the corners, the chin acute, and the two sides of the face slanting to a point. The number of acute angles which the lines of the face form are in fact a net entangling the attention and subduing the will. The effect is felt at once, though it asks time and consideration to understand the cause. It is a face which you would beware of rousing into anger or hostility, as you would beware of setting in motion some complicated and dangerous machinery. The possessor of it, you may be sure, is no trifler. Such, indeed, was the character of the man. This is to paint true portrait and true history. So if our artist painted a mild and thoughtful expression, all the lines of the countenance were softened and relaxed. If the mouth was going to speak, the whole face was going to speak. It was the same in colour. The gradations are infinite, and yet so blended as to be imperceptible. No two tints are the same, though they produce the greatest harmony and simplicity of tone, like flesh itself. If, said a person, pointing to the shaded side of a portrait of Titian, you could turn this round to the light, you would find it would be of the same colour as the other side. In short, there is manifest in his portraits a greater tenaciousness and identity of impression than in those of any painter. Form, colour, feeling, character seemed to adhere to his eye and to become part of himself and his pictures, on this account, leave stings in the minds of the spectators. There is, I grant, the same personal appeal, the same point-blank look in some of Raphael's portraits. See those of a princess of Aragon and of Count Castiglione, numbers 1150 and 1151 as in Titian, but they want the texture of the skin and the minute individual details 
to stamp them with the same reality. And again, as to the uniformity of outline in the features, this principle has been acted upon and carried to excess by Nella and other artists. The eyes, the eyebrows, the nose, the mouth, the chin, are rounded off as if they were turned in a lathe, or as a peruke maker arranges the curls of a wig. In them it is vile and mechanical, without any reference to truth of character or nature, and instead of being pregnant with meaning and originality of expression, produces only insipidity and monotony. Perhaps what is offered above as a key to the peculiar expression of Titian's heads may also serve to explain the difference between painting and copying a portrait. As the perfection of his faces consists in the entire unity and coincidence of all the parts, so the difficulty of ordinary portrait painting is to bring them to bear at all, or to piece one feature or one day's labour on to another. In copying, this difficulty does not occur at all. The human face is not one thing, as the vulgar suppose, nor does it remain always the same. It has infinite varieties, which the artist is obliged to notice and to reconcile, or he will make strange work. Not only the light and shade upon it do not continue for two minutes the same. The position of the head constantly varies, or, if you are strict with a sitter, he grows sullen and stupid. Each feature is in motion every moment, even while the artist is working at it. And in the course of a day, the whole expression of the countenance undergoes a change, so that the expression which you gave to the forehead or eyes yesterday is totally incompatible with that which you have to give to the mouth today. You can only bring it back again to the same point or give it a consistent construction by an effort of imagination or a strong feeling of character, and you must connect the features together less by the eye than by the mind. The mere setting down what you see in this medley of successive, teasing, contradictory impressions would never do. Either you must continually efface what you have done the instant before, or, if you retain it, you will produce a piece of patchwork worse than any caricature. There must be a comprehension of the whole, and in truth a moral sense, as well as a literal one, to unravel the confusion and guide you through the labyrinth of shifting muscles and features. You must feel what this means and dive into the hidden soul in order to know whether that is as it ought to be. For you cannot be sure that it remains as it was. Portrait painting is then painting from the recollection and from a conception of character. With the object before us, to assist the memory and understanding. In copying, on the contrary, one part does not run away and leave you in the lurch while you are intent upon another. You have only to attend to what is before you and finish it carefully a bit at a time and you are sure that the whole will come right. One might parcel it out into squares as in engraving, and copy one at a time, without seeing or thinking of the rest. I do not say that a conception of the whole 
and a feeling of the art will not abridge the labour of copying or produce a truer likeness but it is the changeableness or identity of the object that chiefly constitutes the difficulty or facility of imitating it and in the latter case reduces it nearly to a mechanical operation it is the same in the imitation of still life where real objects have not a principle of motion in them it is as easy to produce a facsimile of a table or a chair as to copy a picture because these things do not stir from their places any more than the features of a portrait stir from theirs you may therefore bestow any given degree of minute and continued attention on finishing any given part without being afraid that when finished it will not correspond with the rest nay it requires more talent to copy a fine portrait than to paint an original picture of a table or a chair for the picture has a soul in it and the table has not it has been made an objection and i think a just one against the extreme high finishing of the drapery and backgrounds in portraits to which some schools particularly the french are addicted that it gives an unfinished look to the face the most important part of the picture a lady or a gentleman cannot sit quite so long or so still as a lay figure and if you finish up each part according to the length of time it will remain in one position the face will seem to have been painted for the sake of the drapery not the drapery to set off the face there is an obvious limit to everything if we attend to common sense and feeling if a carpet or a curtain will admit of being finished more than the living face we finish them less because they excite less interest and we are less willing to throw away our time and pains upon them this is the unavoidable result in a natural and well-regulated style of art but what is to be said of a school where no interest is felt in anything where nothing is known of any object but that it is there and where superficial and petty details which the eye can explore and the hand execute with persevering and systematic indifference constitute the soul of art the expression is the great difficulty in history or portrait painting and yet it is the great clue to both it renders forms doubly impressive from the interest and signification attached to them and at the same time renders the imitation of them critically nice by making any departure from the line of truth doubly sensible mr coleridge used to say that what gave the romantic and mysterious interest to salvator's landscapes was their containing some implicit analogy to human or other living forms his rocks had a latent resemblance to the outline of a human face his trees had the distorted jagged shape of a satyr's horns and grotesque features i do not think this is the case but it may serve to supply us with an illustration of the present question suppose a given outline to represent a human face but to be so disguised by circumstances and little interruptions as to be mistaken for a projecting fragment of a rock in a natural scenery as long as we conceive of this outline merely as a representation of a rock or other inanimate substance any copy of it however rude will seem the same 
and as good as the original. Now let the disguise be removed, and the general resemblance to a human face pointed out, and what before seemed perfect will be found to be deficient in the most essential features. Let it be further understood to be a profile of a particular face that we know and all likeness will vanish from the want of the individual expression which can only be given by being felt that is the imitation of external and visible form is only correct or nearly perfect when the information of the eye and the direction of the hand are aided and confirmed by the previous knowledge and actual feeling of character in the object represented. The more there is of character and feeling in any object, and the greater sympathy there is with it in the mind of the artist, the closer will be the affinity between the imitation and the thing imitated, as the more there is of character and expression in the object without a proportionable sympathy with it in the imitator, the more obvious will this defect and the imperfection of the copy become. That is, expression is the great test and measure of a genius for painting and the fine arts. The mere imitation of still life, however perfect, can never furnish proofs of the highest skill or talent for there is an inner sense a deeper intuition into nature that is never unfolded by merely mechanical objects and which if it were called out by a new soul being suddenly infused into an inanimate substance would make the former unconscious representation appear crude and vapid. The eye is sharpened, and the hand made more delicate in its tact, while by the power of harmony, and the deep power of joy, we see into the life of things. We not only see, but feel expression, by the help of the finest of all our senses, the sense of pleasure and pain. He then is the greatest painter who can put the greatest quantity of expression into his works. For this is the nicest and most subtle object of imitation. It is that in which any defect is soonest visible, which must be able to stand the severest scrutiny, and where the power of avoiding errors extravagance or tameness can only be supplied by the fund of moral feeling the strength or delicacy of the artist's sympathy with the ideal object of his imitation to see or imitate any given sensible object is one thing the effect of attention and practice but to give expression to a face is to collect its meaning from a thousand other sources, is to bring into play the observation and feeling of one's whole life, or an infinity of knowledge bearing upon a single object in different degrees and manners, and implying a loftiness and refinement of character proportioned to the loftiness and refinement of expression delineated. Expression is, of all things, the least to be mistaken and the most evanescent in its manifestations. Pope's lines on the character of women may be addressed to the painter who undertakes to embody it. Come then, the colours and the ground prepare dip in the rainbow trick it off in air 
Choose a firm cloud before it falls and in it. Catch ere it change the Cynthia of the minute. It is a maxim among painters that no one can paint more than his own character or more than he himself understands or can enter into. Nay, even in copying a head, we have some difficulty in making the features unlike our own. A person with a low forehead or a short chin puts a constraint on himself in painting a high forehead or a long chin. So much has sympathy to do with what is supposed to be a mere act of servile imitation. To pursue this argument one step further, people sometimes wonder what difficulty there can be in painting and ask what you have to do but to set down what you see. This is true, but the difficulty is to see what is before you. This is at least as difficult as to learn any trade or language. We imagine that we see the whole of nature because we are aware of no more than we see of it. We also suppose that any given object, a head, a hand, is one thing, because we see it at once, and call it by one name. But how little we see or know, even of the most familiar face, beyond a vague abstraction, will be evident to every one who tries to recollect distinctly all its component parts, or to draw the most rude outline of it for the first time, or who considers the variety of surface, the numberless lights and shades, the tints of the skin, every particle and pore of which varies, the forms and markings of the features, the combined expression, and all these caught, as far as common use is concerned, by a random glance, and communicated by a passing word. A student when he first copies a head, soon comes to a stand, or is at a loss to proceed from seeing nothing more in the face than there is in his copy. After a year or two's practice, he never knows when to have done, and the longer he has been occupied in copying a face or any particular feature, sees more and more in it that he has left undone and can never hope to do. There have been only four or five painters who could ever produce a copy of the human countenance really fit to be seen, and even of these few, none was ever perfect, except in giving some single quality or partial aspect of nature, which happened to fall in with his own particular studies and the bias of his genius, as Raphael the drawing, Rembrandt the light and shade, Van Dyck ease and delicacy of appearance, etc. Titian gave more than any one else, and yet he had his defects. After this, Shall we say that any, the commonest and most uninstructed spectator, sees the whole of nature at a single glance, and would be able to stamp a perfect representation of it on the canvas if he could embody the image in his mind's eye? I have in this essay mentioned one or two of the portraits in the Louvre that I like best. The two landscapes which I should most covet are the one with the rainbow by Rubens and the Adam and Eve in Paradise by Poussin. In the first, shepherds are reposing with their flocks under the shelter of a breezy grove. The distances are of air and the whole landscape seems just washed 
with the shower that has passed off. The Adam and Eve by Poussin is the full growth and luxuriant expansion of the principle of vegetation. It is the first lovely dawn of creation, when nature played her virgin fancies wild, when all was sweetness and freshness, and the heavens dropped fatness. It is the very ideal of landscape painting, and of the scene it is intended to represent. It throws us back to the first ages of the world, and to the only period of perfect human bliss, which is, however, on the point of being soon disturbed. I should be contented with these four or five pictures. The Lady by Van Dyck, the Titian, the Presentation in the Temple, the Rubens, and the Poussin, or even with faithful copies of them, added to the two which I have of a young Neapolitan nobleman and of the Ippolito de' Medici, and which, when I look at them, recall other times and the feelings with which they were done. It is now twenty years since I made those copies, and I hope to keep them while I live. It seems to me no longer ago than yesterday. Should the next twenty years pass as swiftly, forty years will have glided by me like a dream. By this kind of speculation I can look down as from a slippery height on the beginning and the end of life beneath my feet, and the thought makes me dizzy. My taste in pictures is, I believe, very different from that of rich and princely collectors. I would not give tuppence for the whole gallery at Fonthill. I should like to have a few pictures hung round the room, that speak to me with well-known looks, that touch some string of memory, not a number of varnished, smooth, glittering gewgaws. The taste of the great in pictures is singular but not unaccountable. The king is said to prefer the Dutch to the Italian school of painting. And if you hint your surprise at this, you are looked upon as a very Gothic and outre sort of person. You are told, however, by way of consolation, to be sure, there is Lord Carlyle likes an Italian picture, Mr. Holwell Carr likes an Italian picture, the Marquis of Stafford is fond of an Italian picture, Sir George Beaumont likes an Italian picture. These notwithstanding are regarded as quaint and daring exceptions to the established rule, and their preference is a species of les majeste in the fine arts, as great an eccentricity and want of fashionable etiquette, as if any gentleman or nobleman still preferred old claret to new, when the king is known to have changed his mind on this subject, or was guilty of the offence of dipping his forefinger and thumb in the middle of a snuff-box, instead of gradually approximating the contents to the edge of the box according to the most approved models. One would imagine that the great and exalted in station would like lofty subjects in works of art, whereas they seem to have an almost exclusive predilection for the mean and mechanical. One would think those whose word was law would be pleased with the great and striking effects of the pencil. On the contrary, they admire nothing but the little and elaborate. They have a fondness for cabinet and furniture pictures, and a proportional antipathy to works of genius. Even art with them must be servile to be tolerated. Perhaps the seeming contradiction may be explained thus. Such persons 
are raised so high above the rest of the species that the more violent and agitating pursuits of mankind appear to them like the turmoil of ants on a molehill. Nothing interests them but their own pride and self-importance. Our passions are to them an impertinence, an expression of high sentiment they rather shrink from as a ludicrous and upstart assumption of equality. They therefore like what glitters to the eye, what is smooth to the touch, but they shun by an instinct of sovereign taste whatever has a soul in it, or implies a reciprocity of feeling. The gods of the earth can have no interest in anything human. They are cut off from all sympathy with the bosoms and business of men. Instead of requiring to be wound up beyond their habitual feeling of stately dignity, they wish to have the springs of overstrained pretension let down, to be relaxed with trifles light as air, to be amused with the familiar and frivolous, and to have the world appear a scene of still life, except as they disturb it. The little in thought and internal sentiment is a natural relief and set-off to the oppressive sense of external magnificence. Hence kings babble and repeat they know not what. A childish dotage often accompanies the consciousness of absolute power. Repose is somewhere necessary, and the soul sleeps while the senses gloat around. Besides, the mechanical and high-finished style of art may be considered as something done to order. It is a task to be executed more or less perfectly, according to the price given and the industry of the artist. We stand by, as it were, to see the work done, insist upon a greater degree of neatness and accuracy and exercise a sort of petty, jealous jurisdiction over each particular. We are judges of the minuteness of the details, and though ever so nicely executed, as they give us no ideas beyond what we had before, we do not feel humbled in the comparison. The artisan scarcely rises into the artist, and the name of genius is degraded rather than exalted in his person. The performance is so far ours that we have paid for it, and the highest price is all that is necessary to produce the highest finishing. But it is not so in works of genius and imagination. Their price is above rubies. The inspiration of muse comes not with the fiat of a monarch, with the donation of a patron. And therefore, the great turn, with disgust or effeminate indifference, from the mighty masters of the Italian school, because such works baffle and confound their self-love, and make them feel that there is something in the mind of man which they can neither give nor take away quam nihil ad tuum papiniane ingenium. End of section 34section 35 of The Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Plain Speaker. Opinions on Books, Men and Things by William Hazlitt. Section 35. On Novelty and Familiarity. Part 1. Horatio. Custom hath made it in him a property of easiness. Hamlet. Tis even so. The hand of little employment hath the daintier sense. Shakespeare represents his grave-digger as singing while he is occupied in his usual task 
of flinging the skulls out of the earth with his spade. On this he takes occasion to remark, through one of his speakers, the effect of habit in blunting our sensibility to what is painful or disgusting in itself. Quote, Custom hath made it a property of easiness in him. End quote to which the other is made to reply in substance that those who have the least to do have the finest feelings generally. The minds and bodies of those who are enervated by luxury and ease, and who have not had to encounter the wear and tear of life, present a soft, unresisting surface to outward impressions, and are endued with a greater degree of susceptibility to pleasure and pain. Habit, in most cases, hardens and encrusts, by taking away the keener edge of our sensations. But does it not in others quicken and refine by giving a mechanical facility and by engrafting an acquired sense? Habit may be said in technical language to add to our irritability and lessen our sensibility, or to sharpen our active perceptions and deaden our passive ones. Practice makes perfect. Experience makes us wise. The one refers to what we have to do, the other to what we feel. I will endeavour to explain the distinction, and to give some examples in each kind. Clowns, servants, and common labourers have, it is true, hard and coarse hands, because they are accustomed to hard and coarse employments. But mechanics, artisans, and artists of various descriptions, who are as constantly employed, though on works demanding greater skill and exactness, acquire a proportionable nicety and discrimination of tact with practice and unremitted application. A working jeweller can perceive slight distinctions of surface and make the smallest incisions in the hardest substances for mere practice. A woollen draper perceives the different degrees of the fineness in cloth on the same principle. A watchmaker will insert a great bony fist and perform the nicest operations among the springs and wheels of a complicated and curious machinery, where the soft delicate hand of a woman or a child would make nothing but blunders. Again, a blind man shows a prodigious sagacity in hearing and almost feeling objects at a distance from him. His other senses acquire an almost preternatural quickness from the necessity of recurring to them oftener and relying on them more implicitly, in consequence of the privation of sight. The musician distinguishes tones and notes, the painter expressions and colours, from constant habit and unwearied attention, that are quite lost upon the common observer. The critic discovers beauties in a poem, the poet features in nature, that are generally overlooked by those who have not employed their imaginations or understandings on these particular studies. Whatever art or science we devote ourselves to, we grow more perfect in it with time and practice. The range of our perceptions is at once enlarged and refined. But, there lies the question that must give us pause, is the pleasure increased in proportion to our habitual and critical discernment, or does not our familiarity with nature, with science and with art, breed an indifference for those objects we are most conversant with and most masters of? I am afraid the answer if an honest one, must be on the unfavourable side, and that from the moment that we can be said to understand any subject thoroughly, or can execute any art skilfully, our pleasure in it will be found to be on the decline. No doubt that with the opening of every new inlet of ideas there is unfolded a new source of pleasure, but this does not last much longer than the first discovery we make of this terra incognita, and with the closing up of every avenue of novelty, of curiosity, and of mystery, there is an end also of our transport, our wonder, and our delight, or it is converted into a very sober, rational, and household sort of satisfaction. There is a craving after information, as there is after food, and it is in supplying the void, in satisfying the appetite, that the pleasure in both cases chiefly consists. When the uneasy want is removed, both the pleasure and the pain cease. So in the acquisition of knowledge, or of skill, it is the transition from perplexity and helplessness that relieves and delights us. It is the surprise occasioned by the unfolding of some new aspect of nature that fills our eyes with tears and our hearts with joy. It is the fear of not succeeding that makes success so welcome, 
and a giddy uncertainty about the extent of our acquisitions that makes us drunk with unexpected possession. We are happy not in the total amount of our knowledge, but in the last addition we have made to it, in the removal of some obstacle, in the drawing aside of some veil, in the contrast between the obscurity of night and the brightness of the dawn. But objects are magnified in the mist and haze of confusion. The mind is most open to receive striking impressions of things in the outset of its progress. The most trivial pursuits or successes then agitate the whole brain, whereas afterwards the most important only occupy one corner of it. The facility which habit gives in admitting new ideas, or in reflecting upon old ones, renders the exercise of intellectual activity a matter of comparative insignificance, and by taking away the resistance and the difficulty, takes away the liveness of impulse that imparts a sense of pleasure or of pain to the soul. No one reads the same book twice over with the same satisfaction. It is not that our knowledge of it is not greater the second time than the first, but our interest in it is less, because the addition we make to our knowledge the second time is very trifling, while in the first perusal it was all clear gain. Thus, in youth and childhood, every step is fairy ground, because every step is an advance in knowledge and pleasure, opens new prospects, and excites new hopes. As in after years, though we may enlarge our circle a little, and measure our way more accurately, yet in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred we only retrace our steps, and repeat the same dull round of weariness and disappointment. Knowledge is power, but it is not pleasure, except when it springs immediately out of ignorance and incapacity. An actor who plays a character for the hundred and fortieth time understands, and perhaps performs it better. But does he feel the part? Has he the same pleasure in it as he had the first time? The wonder is how he can go through with it at all. Nor could he, were he not supported by the plaudits of the audience, who seem like new friends to him, or urged on by the fear of disgrace, to which no man is ever reconciled. I will here take occasion to suggest what appears to me the true state of the question, whether a great actor is enabled to embody his part from feeling or from study. I think at the time from neither, but merely, or chiefly at least, from habit. But I think he must have felt the character in the first instance with all the enthusiasm of nature and genius, or he never would have distinguished himself in it. To say that the intellect alone can determine or supply the movements or the language of passion is little short of a contradiction in terms. Substituting the head for the heart is like saying that the eye is a judge of sounds or the ear of colours. If a man in cold blood knows how another feels in a fit of passion, it is from having been in a passion himself before. Nor can the indifferent observation of the outward signs attain to the truth of nature without the inward sympathy to impel us forward and to tell us where to stop. Without that living criterion we shall be either tame and mechanical or turgid and extravagant. The study of individual models produces imitators and mannerists. The study of general principles produces pedants. It is feeling alone that makes up for the deficiencies of either mode of study, that expands the meagerness of the one, that abends the rigidity of the other, that floats a man into the tide of popularity and electrifies an audience. It is feeling, or it is hope and fear, joy and sorrow, love and hatred, that is the original source of the effects in nature which are brought forward on the stage and assuredly it is a sympathy with this feeling that must dictate the truest and most natural imitations of them. To suppose that a person altogether dead to these primary passions of the human breast can make a great actor, or feign the effects while he is entirely ignorant of the cause, is no less absurd than to suppose that I can describe a place which I never saw, or mimic a voice which I never heard, or speak a language which I never learned. An actor, void of genius and passion, may be taught to strut about the stage, and mouth out his words with mock solemnity, and give himself the airs of a great actor, but he will never be one. He may express his own emptiness and vanity, and make people stare, but he will not, quote, send the hearers weeping to their beds, end quote. The true, original master-touches that go to the heart must come from it. 
there is neither truth nor beauty without nature. Habit may repeat the lesson that is thus learned, just as a poet may transcribe a fine passage without being affected by it at the time, but he could not have written it in the first instance without feeling the beauty of the object he was describing, or without having been deeply impressed with it in some moment of enthusiasm. It was then that his genius was inspired, his style formed, and the foundation of his fame laid. People tell you that Stern was hard-hearted, that the author of Waverley is a mere worldling, that Shakespeare was a man without passions. Do not believe them. Their passions might have worn themselves out with constant over-excitement, so that they only knew how they formerly felt, or they might have the control over them, or from their very compass and variety they might have kept one another in check, so that none got very much ahead and broke out into extravagant and overt acts. But those persons must have experienced the feelings they express, and entered into the situations they describe so finely, at some period or other of their lives. The sacred source from whence the tears trickle down the cheeks of others was once full, though it may be now dried up, and in all cases where a strong impression of truth and nature is conveyed to the minds of others, it must have previously existed in an equal or greater degree in the mind producing it. Perhaps it does not strictly follow that, quote, they best can paint them who have felt them most, end quote. To do this in perfection, other qualifications may be necessary. Language may be wanting where the heart speaks, but that the tongue or the pen or pencil can describe the workings of nature with the highest truth and eloquence without being prompted or holding any communication with the heart, past, present, or to come, I utterly deny. When Talma, in the part of Oedipus, after the discovery of his misfortune, slowly raises his hands and joins them together over his head in an attitude of despair, I conceive it is because in the extremity of his anguish, and in the full sense of his ghastly and desolate situation, he feels a want of something as a shield, a covering, to protect him from the weight that is ready to fall and crush him, and he makes use of that fine and impressive action for this purpose. Not that I suppose he is affected in this manner every time he repeats it, but he never would have thought of it but from having this deep and bewildering feeling of weight and oppression, which naturally suggested it to his imagination, and at the same time assured him that it was just. Feeling is in fact the scale that weighs the truth of all original conceptions. When Mrs. Siddons played the part of Mrs. Beverley in The Gamester, and on Stukeley's abrupt declaration of his unprincipled passion at the moment of her husband's imprisonment, threw into her face that noble succession of varying emotions, first seeming not to understand him, then, as her doubt is removed, rising into sudden indignation, then turning to pity, and ending in a burst of hysteric scorn and laughter. Was this the effect of stratagem, or forethought, as a painter arranges a number of colours on his palette? No, but by placing herself amply in the situation of her heroine, and entering into all the circumstances, and feeling the dignity of insulted virtue and misfortune, that wonderful display of keen and high-wrought expressions burst from her involuntarily at the same moment, and kindled her face almost into a blaze of lightning. Yet Mrs. Siddons is sometimes accused of being cold and insensible. I do not wonder that she may seem so, after exertions such as these, as the sibyls of old, after their inspired prophetic fury, sank upon the ground, breathless and exhausted. But that any one can embody high thoughts and passions, without having the prototypes in their own breast, is what I shall not believe upon hearsay, and what I am sure cannot be proved by argument. It is a common complaint that actors and actresses are dull when off the stage. I do not know that it is the case, but I own I should be surprised if it were otherwise. Many persons expect from the eclat with which they appear in certain characters to find them equally brilliant in company, not considering that the effect they produce in their artificial characters is the very circumstance that must disqualify them for producing any in ordinary cases. They who have intoxicated and maddened multitudes by their public display of talent 
can rarely be supposed to feel much stimulus in entertaining one or two friends, or in being the life of a dinner-party. She who perished overnight by the dagger, or the bowl, as Cassandra or Cleopatra, may be allowed to sip her tea in silence, and not to be herself again, till she revives an Aspasia. A tragic tone does not become familiar conversation, and any other must come very awkwardly and reluctantly from a great tragic actress. At least, in the intervals of her professional paroxysms, she will hardly set up for a verbal critic or blue-stocking. Comic actors, again, have their repartees put into their mouths, and must feel considerably at a loss when their cue is taken from them. The most sensible among them are modest and silent. It is only those of second-rate pretensions who think to make up for the want of original wit by practical jokes and slang phrases. Theatrical manners are, I think, the most repulsive of all others. Actors live on applause, and drag on a laborious artificial existence by the administration of perpetual provocatives to their sympathy with the public gratification. I will not call it altogether vanity in them who delight to make others laugh, any more than in us who delight to laugh with them. They have a significant phrase to express the absence of a proper sense in the audience. There was not a hand in the house. I have heard one of the most modest and meritorious of them declare that if there was nobody else to applaud, he should like to see a dog wag his tail in approbation. There cannot be a greater mistake than to suppose that singers dislike to be encored. There is often a violent opposition out of compassion, with cries of, Shame! Shame! when a young female debutante is about to be encored twice in a favourite air, as if it were taking a cruel advantage of her. Instead of the third, she would be glad to sing it for the thirtieth time, and die of an encore in operatic pain. The excitement of public applause at last becomes a painful habit, and either in indolent or overactive temperaments produces a corresponding craving after privacy and leisure. Mr. Liston, a short time ago, was in treaty for a snug little place near his friend Mr. Matthews at Highgate, on which he had so set his heart, that when the bargain failed he actually shed tears like a child. He has a right to blubber like a schoolboy whenever he pleases, who almost every night of his life makes hundreds of people laugh till they forget they are no longer schoolboys. I hope, if this should prove a hard winter, he will again wrap himself up in flannel and lamb's wool take to his fireside, and read the English novelists once more fairly through. Let him have these lying on his table, Hogarth's prince hung round the room, and with his own face to boot, I defy the world to match them again. There is something very amiable and praiseworthy in the friendships of the two ingenious actors I have just alluded to. From the example of contrast and disinterestedness it affords, it puts me in mind of that of Rosinant and Dapple. These Arcadian retirements and ornamented retreats are, I suspect, tantalizing and unsatisfactory resources to the favorites of the town. The constant fever of applause and of anxiety to deserve it, which produces the wish for repose, disables them from enjoying it. Let the cancher be as strong as it will, the eye of the pit is upon them in the midst of it. The smile of the boxes, the roar of the gallery, pierces through their holly hedges and overthrows all their pastoral theories. Of the public, as of the sex, it may be said, when one has once been a candidate for their favours, quote, there is no living with them nor without them. End quote. I wish the late Mr. Campbell had not written that stupid book about Richard the Third and closed the proud theatrical career with a piece of literary foppery. Yet why do I wish it if it pleased him, since it made no alteration in my opinion respecting him? Its dry details, its little tortuous struggles after contradiction, nay, its fulsome praises of a kinder critic, Mr. Gifford. Aside, what will not a retired tragedian do for a niche in the quarterly review, and aside, did not blot from our memory his stately form, his noble features, in which old Rome saw herself revived, his manly sense and plaintive tones that were an echo to deep fraught sentiment, nor make me forget another volume published and suppressed long before, a volume of poems addressed to Mrs. Inchbald, The Silver-Voiced Anna. Both are dead. Such is the stuff of which our lives are made, bubbles that reflect the glorious features of the universe, and that glance a passing shadow, a feeble gleam on those around them. 
Mrs. Siddons was in the meridian of her reputation when I first became acquainted with the stage. She was an established veteran when I was an unfledged novice, and perhaps played those scenes without emotion which filled me and so many others with delight and awe. So far I had the advantage of her, and of myself too. I did not then analyse her excellences as I should now, or divide her merits into physical and intellectual advantages, or see that her majestic form rose up against misfortune in equal sublimity, an antagonist power to it. But the total impression, unquestioned, unrefined upon, overwhelmed and drowned me in a flood of tears. I was stunned and torpid after seeing her in any of her great parts. I was uneasy, and hardly myself, but I felt, more than ever, that human life was something very far from being indifferent, and I seemed to have got a key to unlock the springs of joy and sorrow in the human heart. This was no mean possession, and I availed myself of it with no sparing hand. The pleasure I anticipated at that time in witnessing her dullest performance was certainly greater than I should have now in seeing her in the most brilliant. The very sight of her name in the playbills in Tamerlane or Alexander the Great threw a light upon the day, and drew after it a long trail of eastern glory, a joy and felicity unutterable, that has since vanished in the mists of criticism and glitter of idle distinctions. I was in a trance, and my dreams were of mighty empires fallen, or vast burning zones, of waning time, of Persian thrones, and them that sat on them, of sovereign beauty, and of victors vanquished by love. Death and life played their pageant before me. The gates were unbarred, the folding doors of fancy were thrown open, and I saw all that mankind had been, or that I myself could conceive, pass in sudden and gorgeous review before me. No wonder that the huge, dim, disjointed vision should enchant and startle me. One reason why our first impressions are so strong and lasting is that they are whole-length ones. We afterwards divide and compare, and judge of things only as they differ from other things. At first we measure them from the ground, take in only the groups and masses, and are struck with the entire contrast to our former ignorance and inexperience. If we apprehend only a vague, gaudy outline, this is not a disadvantage, for we fill it up with our desires and fancies, which are most potent in their capacity to create good or evil. The first glow of passion in the breast throws its radiance over the opening path of life, and it is wonderful how much of the volume of our future existence the mere title-page discloses. The results do not indeed exactly correspond with our expectations, but our passions survive their first eager ebullition and bitter disappointment. The bulk of our sensations consists of broken vows and fading recollections, and it is not astonishing that there is so near a resemblance between our earliest anticipations and our latest sigh, since we obstinately believe things to be to the last what we at first wished to find them. Quote, Hope travels through, nor quits us till we die. End quote. Our existence is a tissue of passion, and our successive years only present us with fainter and fainter copies of the first proof impressions. The dregs of life, therefore, contain very little of force or spirit which, quote, the first sprightly runnings could not give. End, quote. End of section 35。section 36 of The Plain Speaker。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Plain Speaker. Opinions on Books, Men, and Things by William Hazlitt. Section 36. On Novelty and Familiarity. Part 2. Imagination is, in this sense, sometimes truer than reality. For our passions being, quote, compacted of imagination, end quote, and our desires wetted by impatience and delay, often lose some of their taste and essence with possession. So in youth we look forward to the advances of age, and feel them more strongly than when they arrive. Nor is this more extraordinary than that from the height of a precipice the descent below should make us giddy, and that we should be less sensible of it when we come to the ground. Experience can teach us little, I suspect, 
after the first unfolding of our faculties, and the first strong excitement of outward objects. It can only add to or take away from our original impressions, and the imagination can make out the addition as largely, or feel the privation as sharply, as the senses. The little it can teach us, which is to moderate our chagrins and sober our expectations to the dull standard of reality, we will not learn. Reason panders will, and if we have been disappointed forty times, we are only the more resolved that the forty-first time shall make up for all the rest, and our hope grows desperate as the chances are against it. A man who is wary is so naturally. He who is of a sanguine and credulous disposition will continue so in spite of warning. We hearken to no voice but that of our secret inclinations and native bias. Mr. Wordsworth, being asked why he admired the sleep of infancy, said he thought, quote, there was a grandeur in it, end quote, the reason of which is partly owing to the contrast of total unconsciousness to all the ills of life, and partly that it is the germ implying all the future good, an untouched, untold treasure. In the outset of life, all that is to come of it seems to press with double force upon the heart, and our yearnings after good and dread of evil are in proportion to the little we have known of either. The first ebullitions of hope and fear in the human heart lift us to heaven, or sink us to the abyss. But when served out to us in driblets, and pulled by repetition, they lose their interest and effect. Or the dawn of experience, like that of day, shows the wide prospect stretched out before us, and dressed in its liveliest colours. As we proceed, we tire of the length of the way, and complain of its sameness. The path of life is stripped of its freshness and beauty and as we grow acquainted with them, we become indifferent to weal or woe. The best part of our lives we pass in counting on what is to come, or in fancying what may have happened in real or fictitious story to others. I have had more pleasure in reading the adventures of a novel, and perhaps changing situations with the hero, than I ever had in my own. I do not think anyone can feel much happier, a greater degree of heart's ease, than I used to feel in reading Tristram Shandy, and Peregrine Pickle, and Tom Jones, and the Tatler, and Gilblas of Santelaine, and Werther, and Boccaccio. It was some years after that I read the last, but his tales, quote, dallied with the innocence of love like the old time, end quote. The story of Federico Alberici affected me as if it had been my own case, and I saw his hawk upon her perch in the clear cold air, and how fat and fair a bird she was, as plain as ever I saw a picture of Titian's, and felt that I should have served her up as he did, as a banquet for his mistress, who came to visit him at his own poor farm. I could wish that Lord Byron had employed himself, while in Italy, in rescuing such a writer as Boccaccio from unmerited obloquy, instead of making those notable discoveries, that Pope was a poet, and that Shakespeare was not one. Mrs. Inchbold was always a great favourite with me. There is the true soul of woman breathing from what she writes, as much as if you heard her voice. It is as if Venus had written books. I first read her simple story, of all places in the world, at M. No matter where it was, for it transported me out of myself. I recollect walking out to escape from one of the tenderest parts, in order to return to it again with double relish. An old crazy hand-organ was playing Robin Adair, a summer shower dropped mana on my head, and slaked my feverish thirst of happiness. Her heroine, Miss Milner, was at my side. My dream has since been verified. How like it was to the reality! In truth, the reality itself was but a dream. Do I not still see that, quote, simple movement of her finger, end quote, with which Madame Basil beckoned Jean-Jacques to the seat at her feet, the heightened colour that tinged her profile as she sat at her work netting, the bunch of flowers in her hair? Is not the glow of youth and beauty in her cheek blended with the blushes of the roses in her hair? Do they not breathe the breath of love? And, what though the adventure was unfinished by either writer or reader, is not the blank filled up with the rare and subtle spirit of fancy that imparts the fullness of delight to the air-drawn creations of brain. 
I once sat on a sunny bank in a field in which the green blades of corn waved in the fitful northern breeze, and read the letter in the new Eloise in which saint Preux describes the Pays de Vaux. I never felt what Shakespeare calls my glassy essence so much as then. My thoughts were pure and free. They took a tone from the objects before me, and from the simple manners of the inhabitants of mountain scenery so well described in the letter. The style gave me the same sensation as the drops of morning dew before they are scorched by the sun, and I thought Julia did well to praise it. I wished I could have written such a letter. That wish, enhanced by my admiration of genius and the feeling of the objects around me, was accompanied with more pleasure than if I had written fifty such letters, or had gained all the reputation of its immortal author. Of all the pictures, prints, or drawings I ever saw, none ever gave me such satisfaction as the rude etchings at the top of Rousseau's confessions. There is a necromantic spell in the outlines. Imagination is a witch. It is not even said anywhere that such is the case, but I had got it into my head that the rude sketches of old-fashioned houses, stone walls, and stumps of trees represented the scenes at Annecy and Vevey, where he who relished all more sharply than others, and by his own intense aspirations after good, had nearly delivered mankind from the yoke of evil, first drew the breath of hope. Here love's golden wriggle bound his brows, and here fell from it. It was the partition wall between life and death to him, and all beyond it was a desert. Quote, and bade the lovely scenes at distance hail. End quote. I used to apply this line to the distant range of hills in a paltry landscape, which, however, had a tender vernal tone and a dewy freshness. I could look at them till my eyes filled with tears and my heart dissolved in faintness. Why do I recall the circumstance, after a lapse of years, with so much interest? Because I felt it then. Those feeble outlines were linked in my brain to the purest, fondest yearnings after good. That dim, airy space contained my little all of hope, buoyed up by charming fears. The delight with which I dwelt upon it, enhanced by my ignorance of what was in store for me, was free from mortal grossness, familiarity or disappointment, and I drank pleasure out of the bosom of the silent hills and gleaming valleys, as from a cup filled to the brim with love filters and poisonous sweetness by the sorcerer's fancy. Mr. Opie used to consider it as an error to suppose that an artist's first works were necessarily crude and raw, and that he went on regularly improving on them afterwards. On the contrary, he maintained that they had the advantage of being done with all his heart and soul and might, that they contained his best thoughts, those which his genius most eagerly prompted, and which he had matured and treasured up longest, from the first dawn of art and nature on his mind, and that his subsequent works were rather afterthoughts, and the leavings and makeshifts of his invention. There is a great deal of truth in this view of the matter. Poeta, nascitur, non fit. That is, it is the strong character and impulse of the mind that forces it out of its way and stamps itself upon outward objects, not that is elicited and laboriously raised into artificial importance by contrivance and study. An improving actor, artist or poet, never becomes a great one. I have known such in my time, who are always advancing by slow and sure steps to the height of their profession, but in the meantime some man of genius rose, and passing them, at once seized on the topmost round of ambition's ladder, so that they still remained in the second class. A volcano does not give warning when it will break out, nor a thunderbolt send word of its approach. Mr. Keene stamped himself the first night in Shylock. He never did any better. Mr. Campbell is the only great and truly impressive actor I remember who rose to his stately height by the interposition of art and gradations of merit. A man of genius is sui generis. To be known, he need only to be seen. You can no more dispute whether he is one than you can dispute whether it is a panther that is shown you in a cage. Mrs. Siddons did not succeed the first time she appeared on the London boards, but then it was in Garrick's time, who sent her back to the country. He startled and put her out in some part she had to play with him, by the amazing vividness and intrepidity of her style of acting. Yet old Dr. Chauncey, who frequented Sir Joshua Reynolds's, said that he was not himself in his latter days, 
that he got to play Harlequin's tricks, and was too much in the trammels of the stage, and was quite different from what he was when he came out at Goodman's Fields, when he surprised the town in Richard, as if he had dropped from the clouds, and his acting was all fire and air. Mrs. Siddons was hardly satisfied with the admiration of those who had only seen her latter performances, which were distinguished chiefly by their towering height and marble outline. She has been heard to exclaim, quote, you have seen me only in Lady Macbeth and Queen Catherine, and Belvedere and Jane Shaw. You should have seen me when I played these characters alternately with Juliet, and Desdemona, and Callista, and the Morning Bride, night after night, when I first came from Bath. End quote. If she indeed filled these parts with a beauty and tenderness equal to the sublimity of her other performances, one had only to see her in them and die. Lord Byron says that Lady Macbeth died when Mrs. Siddons left the stage. Could not even her acting help him to understand Shakespeare? Sir Joshua Reynolds, at a late period, saw some portraits he had done in early life, and lamented the little progress he had made. Yet he belonged to the laborious and climbing class. No one generation improves much upon another, no one individual improves much upon himself. What we impart to others we have within us, and we have it almost from the first. The strongest insight we obtain into nature is that which we receive from the broad light thrown upon it by the sudden development of our own faculties and feelings. Even in science the greatest discoveries have been made at an early age. Sir Isaac Newton was not twenty when he saw the apple fall to the ground. Harvey, I believe, discovered the circulation of the blood at eighteen. Barclay was only six-and-twenty when he published his Essay on Vision. Hartley's great principle was developed in an inaugural's dissertation at college. Hume wrote his treatise on human nature while he was yet quite a young man. Hobbes put forth his metaphysical system very soon after he quitted the service of Bacon. I believe also that Galileo, Leibniz, and Euler commenced their career of discovery quite young, and I think it is only then, before the mind becomes set in its own opinions or the dogma of others, that it can have vigour or elasticity to throw off the load of prejudice and seize on new and extensive combinations of things. In exploring new and doubtful tracts of speculation, the mind strikes out true and original views, as a drop of water hesitates at first what direction it shall take, but afterwards follows its own course. The very oscillation of the mind in its first perilous and staggering search after truth brings together extreme arguments and illustrations that would never occur in a more settled and methodized state of opinion, and felicitous suggestions turn up when we are trying experiments on the understanding, of which we can have no hope when we have once made up our minds to a conclusion, and only go over the previous steps that led to it, so that the greater number of opinions we have formed we are less capable of forming new ones and slide into commonplaces, according as we have them at hand to resort to. It is easier taking the beaten path than making our way over bogs and precipices. The great difficulty in philosophy is to come to every question with a mind fresh and unshackled by former theories, though strengthened by exercise and information. As in the practice of art, the great thing is to retain our admiration of the beautiful in nature, together with the power to imitate it, and not from a want of this original feeling, to be enslaved by formal rules, or dazzled by the mere difficulties of execution. Habit is necessary to give power. But with the stimulus of novelty, the love of truth and nature ceases through indolence or insensibility. Hence wisdom too commonly degenerates into prejudice, and skill into pedantry. Ask a metaphysician what subject he understands best, and he will tell you that which he knows the least about. Ask a musician to play a favourite tune, and he will select an air the most difficult of execution. If you ask an artist his opinion of a picture, he will point to some defect in perspective or anatomy. If an opera dancer wishes to impress you with an idea of his grace and accomplishments, he will throw himself into the most distorted attitude possible. Who would not rather see a dance in the forest of Montmorency, on a summer's evening, by a hundred laughing peasant girls and their partners, who come to this scene for several miles round, rushing through the forest glades, as the heart panteth for the water brooks, than all the pirouettes, pierre de and entrechats performed at the French opera by the whole corps de ballet. Yet the first only just contrive to exert their heels and not put their partners out, whilst the last perform nothing but feats of dexterity and miracles of skill. 
not one of which they could ever perform, if they had not lost every idea of natural grace, ease, or decorum in habitual callousness or professional vanity, or had one feeling left which prompts their rustic rivals to run through the mazes of the dance, quote, with heedless haste and giddy cunning, end quote, while the leaves tremble to the festive sounds of music, and the air circles in gladder currents to their joyous movements. There was a dance in the pantomime at Covent Garden two years ago, which I could have gone to see every night. I did go to see it every night that I could make an excuse for that purpose. It was nothing. It was childish. Yet I could not keep away from it. Some young people came out of a large twelfth cake, dressed in full court costume, and danced a quadrille, and then a minuet, to some divine air. Was it that it put me in mind of my schoolboy days, and of the large bunch of lilac that I used to send as a present to my partner? Or, of times still longer past, the court of Louis the Sixteenth, the Duke de Nemours, and the Princess of Cleves? Or of the time when she who was all grace moved in measured steps before me, and wafted me into Elysium? I know not how it was, but it came over the sense with power not to be resisted, quote, like the sweet south that breathes upon a bank of violets, stealing and giving odour. I mention these things to show, as I think, that pleasures are not quote, like poppies spread, you seize the flower, the bloom is shed, or like the snow falls in the river, a moment white, then melts for ever, or like the borealis race that flit ere you can point their place or like the rainbow's lovely form a vanishing amid the storm. End quote. On the contrary, I think they leave traces of themselves behind them, durable and delightful, even in proportion to the regrets accompanying them, and which we relinquish only with our being. The most irreconcilable disappointments are perhaps those which arise from our obtaining all we wish. The opera figurant despises the peasant girl that dances on the green, however much happier she may be, or may be thought by the first. The one can do what the other cannot. Pride is founded not on the sense of happiness, but on the sense of power, and this is one great source of self-congratulation, if not of self-satisfaction. This, however, is continually increasing, or at least renewing with our advances in skill and the conquest of difficulties, and, accordingly, there is no end of it while we live or till our faculties decay. He who undertakes to master any art or science has cut himself out work enough to last the rest of his life, and may promise himself all the enjoyment that is to be found in looking down with self-complacent triumph on the inferiority of others, or all the torment that there is in envying their success. There is no danger that the machine will ever stand still afterwards. Mandeville has endeavoured to show that if it were not for envy, malice, and all uncharitableness, Mankind would perish of pure chagrin and ennui, and I am not in the humour to contradict him. The same spirit of emulation that urges us on to surpass others supplies us with a new source of satisfaction, of something which is at least the reverse of indifference and apathy, in the indefatigable exertion of our faculties and the perception of new and minor shades of distinction. These, if not so delightful, are more subtle, and may be multiplied indefinitely. They borrow something of taste and pleasure from their first origin, till they dwindle away into mere abstractions. The exercise, whether of our minds or bodies, sharpens and gives additional alacrity to our active impressions, as the indulgence of our sensibility, whether to pleasure or pain, blunts our passive ones. The will to do, the power to think, is a progressive faculty, though not the capacity to feel. Otherwise, the business of life could not go on. If it were necessity alone that oiled the springs of society, people would grow tired and restive, they would lie down and die. But with us there comes a habit, a positive need of something to keep off the horror of vacancy. The sense of power has a sense of pleasure annexed to it, or what is practically a tantamount, an impulse, an endeavour, that carries us through the most tiresome drudgery or the hardest tasks. Indolence is a part of our nature, too. There is a vis inertia at first, a difficulty in beginning or in leaving off. I have spun out this essay in a good measure from the dread I feel of entering upon new subjects. 
Some such reasoning is necessary to account for the headstrong and incorrigible violence of the passions when the will is once implicated. So in ambition, in avarice, in the love of gaming and of drinking, where the strong stimulus is its chief excitement, there is no hope of any termination, of any pause or relaxation, but we are hurried forward as by a fever when all sense of pleasure is dead, and we only persevere as it were out of contradiction and in defiance of the obstacles, the mortifications and privations we have to encounter. The resistance of the will to outward circumstances, its determination to create its own good or evil, is also a part of the same constitution of the mind. The solitary captive can make a companion of the spider that straggles into his cell, or find amusement in counting the nails in his dungeon door, while the proud lord that placed him there feels the death of solitude in crowded ballrooms and hot theatres, and turns with weariness from the scenes of luxury and dissipation. Defoe's romance is the finest possible exemplification of the manner in which our internal resources increase with our external wants. Our affections are enlarged and unfolded with time and acquaintance. If we like new books, new faces, new scenes, or hanker after those we have never seen, we also like old books, old faces, old haunts, Quote, round which, with tendrils strong as flesh and blood, our pastime and our happiness have grown. End quote. If we are repelled after a while by familiarity, or when the first gloss of novelty wears off, we are brought back from time to time by recurring recollections, and are at last wedded to them by a thousand associations. Passion is the undue irritation of the will from indulgence or opposition. Imagination is the anticipation of unknown good. Affection is the attachment we form to any object from its being connected with the habitual impression of numberless sources and ramifications of pleasure. The heart is the most central of all things. Our duties also, in which either our affections or our understandings are our teachers, are uniform and must find us at our posts. If this is ever difficult at first, it is always easy in the end. The last pleasure in life is the sense of discharging our duty. Our physical pleasures, unless as they depend on imagination and opinion, undergo less alteration and are even more lasting than any others. They return with returning appetite and are as good as new. We do not read the same book twice two days following, but we had rather eat the same dinner two days following than go without one. Our intellectual pleasures, which are spread out over a large service, are variable for that very reason, that they tire by repetition and are diminished in comparison. Footnote. I remember Mr. Worthwood saying that he thought we had pleasanter days in the outside of life, but that our years slid on pretty even one with another, as we gained in variety and richness what we lost in intensity. This balance of pleasure can, however, only be hoped for by those who retain the best feelings of their early youth, and sometimes deign to look out of their own minds into those of others. For without this we shall grow weary of the continual contemplation of self, particularly as that self will be a very shabby one. End footnote. Our physical ones have but one condition for their duration and sincerity, that is, that they shall be unforced and natural. Our passions of a grosser kind wear out before our senses. But in ordinary cases they grow indolent and conform to habit, instead of becoming impatient and inordinate from a desire of change, as we are satisfied with more moderate bodily exercise in age or middle life than we are in youth. Upon the whole, there are many things to prop up and reinforce our fondness for existence after the intoxication of our first acquaintance with it, it is over. Health a walk and the appetite it creates, a book, the doing a good-natured or friendly action, are satisfactions that hold out to the last, and with these, and any others to aid us that fall harmlessly in our way, we may make a shift for a few seasons, after having exhausted the short-lived transports of an eager and enthusiastic imagination, and without being under the necessity of hanging or drowning ourselves as soon as we come to years of discretion." End of section 36
Section 37 of The Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Plain Speaker. Opinions on Books, Men and Things by William Hazlitt. Section 37. On Old English Writers and Speakers. Part 1. When I see a whole row of standard French authors piled up on a Paris bookstore, to the height of twenty or thirty volumes, showing their mealy coats to the sun, pink, blue, and yellow, they seem to me a wall built up to keep out the intrusion of foreign letters. There is scarcely such a thing as an English book to be met with, unless perhaps a dusty edition of Clarissa Harlowe lurks in an obscure corner, or a volume of The Sentimental Journey perks its well-known title in your face. But there is a huge column of Voltaire's works, complete in sixty volumes, another, not so frequent, of Rousseau's in fifty, Racine in ten volumes, Moliere in about the same number, La Fontaine, Marmontel, Gibla for ever, Madame Sévigné's letters, Pascal, Montesquieu, Crébillon, Marivaux, with Montaigne, Rabelais, and the Grand Cornet, more rare, and eighteen full-sized volumes of La Harpe's Criticism, towering vain gloriously in the midst of them, furnishing the streets of Paris with a graduated scale of merit for all the rest, and teaching the very garçon perruquier how to measure the length of each act of each play by a stopwatch, and to ascertain whether the angles at the four corners of each classic volume, are right ones. How climb over this lofty pile of taste and elegance, to wander down into the bogs and wastes of English, or of any other literature, to this obscure and wild? Must they, on that fair mountain, leave to feed, to batten on this moor? Or why should they? Have they not literature enough of their own, and to spare, without coming to us? Is not the public mind crammed, choked, with French books, pictures, statues, plays, operas, newspapers, parties, and an incessant farrago of words, so that it has not a moment left to look at home into itself, or abroad into nature? Must they cross the channel to increase the vast stock of impertinence, to acquire foreign tastes, suppress native prejudices, and reconcile the opinions of the Edinburgh and Quarterly Reviews, it is quite needless. There is a project at present entertained in certain circles to give the French a taste for Shakespeare. They should really begin with the English. Many of their own best authors are neglected. Others of whom new editions have been printed, lie heavy on the bookseller's hands. It is by an especial dispensation of providence that languages wear out, as otherwise we should be buried alive under a load of books and knowledge. People talk of a philosophical and universal language. We have enough to do to understand our own, and to read a thousandth part, perhaps not the best, of what is written in it. It is ridiculous and a monstrous vanity. We would set up a standard of general taste and of immortal renown. We would have the benefits of science and of art universal, because we suppose our own capacity to receive them unbounded. And we would have the thoughts of others never die, because we flatter ourselves that our own will last for ever and like the frog imitating the ox in the fable, 
we burst in the vain attempt. Man, whatever he may think, is a very limited being. The world is a narrow circle drawn about him. The horizon limits our immediate view. Immortality means a century or two. Languages happily restrict the mind to what is of its own native growth and fitted for it, as rivers and mountains bound countries. Or the empire of learning, as well as states, would become unwieldy and overgrown. A little importation from foreign markets may be good, but the home production is the chief thing to be looked to. The proper study of the French is French. No people can act more uniformly upon a conviction of this maxim, and in that respect I think they are much to be commended. Mr. Lamb has lately taken it into his head to read St. Evremont and works of that stamp. I neither praise nor blame him for it. He observed that St. Evremont was a writer halfway between Montaigne and Voltaire, with a spice of the wit of the one and the sense of the other. I said I was always of opinion that there had been a great many clever people in the world, both in France and England, but I had been sometimes rebuked for it. Lamb took this as a slight reproach, for he has been a little exclusive and national in his tastes. He said that Coleridge had lately given up all his opinions respecting German literature, that all their high-flown pretensions were in his present estimate sheer cant and affectation, and that none of their works were worth anything but Schiller's and the early ones of Goethe. What, I said, my old friend Werther? How many battles have I had in my own mind, and compunctious visitings of criticism to stick to my old favourite, because Coleridge thought nothing of it? It is hard to find oneself right at last. I found they were off my mind with respect to the celebrated Faust, that it is a mere piece of abortive perverseness, a willful evasion of the subject and omission of the characters. That it is written on the absurd principle that as to produce a popular and powerful effect is not a proof of the highest genius, so to produce no effect at all is an evidence of the highest poetry. And, in fine, that the German play is not to be named in a day with Marlowe's. Poor Kit! How Lord Byron would have sneered at this comparison between the boasted modern and a contemporary of Shakespeare's. Captain Medwin, or his lordship, must have made a mistake in the enumeration of plays of that period still acted. There is one of Ben Jonson's, every man in his humour, and one of Massinger's, a new way to pay old debts. But there is none of Ford's either acted or worth acting, except tis pity she's a whore, and that would no more bear acting than Lord Byron and Goethe together could have written it. This account of Coleridge's vacillations of opinion on such subjects might be adduced to show that our love for foreign literature is an acquired, or rather an assumed taste, that it is, like a foreign religion, adopted for the moment, to answer a purpose or to please an idle humour, that we do not enter into the dialect of truth and nature in their works, as we do in our own, and that consequently our taste for them seldom becomes a part of ourselves, that grows with our growth and strengthens with our strength, and only quits us when we die. Probably it is this acquaintance with, and pretended admiration of, extraneous models, that adulterates and spoils our native literature, that polishes the surface, but undermines its basis, and by taking away its original simplicity, character, and force, makes it just tolerable to others, 
and a matter of much indifference to ourselves. When I see Lord Byron's poems stuck all over Paris, it strikes me as ominous of the decline of English genius. On the contrary, when I find the Scotch novels in still greater request, I think it augurs well for the improvement of French taste. There was advertised not long ago in Paris an elegy on the death of Lord Byron by his friend Sir Thomas More, evidently confounding the living bard with the old statesman. It is thus the French, in their light, salient way, transpose everything. The mistake is particularly ludicrous to those who have ever seen Mr. Moore, or Mr. She's portrait of him in Mr. Hookham's shop, and who chance to see Holbein's head of Sir Thomas Moore in the Louvre. There is the same difference that there is between a surly English mastiff and a little lively French pug. Mr. Moore's face is gay and smiling enough. Old Sir Thomas's is severe, not to say sour. It seems twisted awry with difficult questions, and bursting asunder with a ponderous load of meaning. Mr. Moore has nothing of this painful and puritanical cast. He floats idly and fantastically on the top of the literature of his age, his renowned and almost forgotten namesake, has nearly sunk to the bottom of his. The author of Utopia was no flincher. He was a martyr to his opinions, and was burnt to death for them. The most heroic action of Mr. Moore's life is the having burnt the memoirs of his friend. The expression in Holbein's pictures conveys a faithful but not very favourable notion of the literary character of that period, it is painful, dry, and laboured. Learning was then an ascetic, but recluse, and profound. You see a weight of thought and care in the studious heads of the time of the Reformation, a sincerity, an integrity, a sanctity of purpose, like that of a formal dedication to a religious life, or the inviolability of monastic vows. They had their work to do. We reap the benefits of it. We skim the surface and travel along the high road. They had to explore dark recesses, to dig through mountains and make their way through pathless wildernesses. It is no wonder they looked grave upon it. The seriousness, indeed, amounts to an air of devotion, and it has to me something fine, manly, and old English about it. There is a heartiness and determined resolution, a willingness to contend with opposition, a superiority to ease and pleasure, some sullen pride, but no trifling vanity. They address themselves to study as to a duty, and were ready to leave all and follow it. In the beginning of such an era, the difference between ignorance and learning, between what was commonly known and what was possible to be known, would appear immense, and no pains or time would be thought too great to master the difficulty. Conscious of their own deficiencies and the scanty information of those about them, they would be glad to look out for aids and support, and to put themselves apprentices to time and nature. This temper would lead them to exaggerate, rather than to make light, of the difficulties of their undertaking, and would call forth sacrifices in proportion. Feeling how little they knew, they would be anxious to discover all that others had known, and instead of making a display of themselves, their first object would be to dispel the mist and darkness that surrounded them, they did not cull the flowers of learning, or pluck a leaf of laurel for their own heads, but tugged at the roots and very heart of their subject, as the woodman tugs at the roots of the gnarled oak. The sense of the arduousness of their enterprise braced their courage, so that they left nothing half done. They inquired de omne shibile 
et quibusdam aliis. They ransacked libraries. They exhausted authorities. They acquired languages, consulted books, and deciphered manuscripts. They devoured learning and swallowed antiquity whole, and what is more, digested it. They read incessantly, and remembered what they read, from the zealous interest they took in it. Repletion is only bad when it is accompanied with apathy and want of exercise. They laboured hard and showed great activity, both of reasoning and speculation. Their fault was that they were too prone to unlock the secrets of nature with the key of learning, and often to substitute authority in the place of argument. They were also too polemical, as was but naturally to be expected in the first breaking up of established prejudices and opinions. It is curious to observe the slow progress of the human mind in loosening and getting rid of its trammels link by link, and how it crept on its hands and feet, and with its eyes bent on the ground out of the cave of bigotry, making its way through one dark passage after another. Those who gave up one half of an absurdity contending as strenuously for the remaining half. The lazy current of tradition stemming the tide of innovation, and making an endless struggle between the two. But in the dullest minds of this period, there was a deference to the opinions of their leaders, an imposing sense of the importance of the subject, of the necessity of bringing all the faculties to bear upon it, a weight either of armour or of internal strength, a zeal either for or against, a head, a heart, and a hand, a holding out to the death for conscience sake, a strong spirit of proselytism, no flippancy, no indifference, no compromising, no pert, shallow scepticism, but truth was supposed indissolubly knit to good, knowledge to usefulness, and the temporal and eternal welfare of mankind to hang in the balance. The pure springs of a lofty faith, so to speak, had not then descended by various gradations from their skyey regions and cloudy height to find their level in the smooth, glittering expanse of modern philosophy or to settle in the stagnant pool of stale hypocrisy. A learned man of that day, if he knew no better than others, at least knew all that they did. He did not come to his subject like some dapper barrister, who has never looked at his brief, and trusts to the smartness of his wit and person for the agreeable effect he means to produce but like an old and practised counsellor, covered over with the dust and cobwebs of the law. If it was a speaker in Parliament, he came prepared to handle his subject, armed with cases and precedents, the constitution and history of Parliament from the earliest period, a knowledge of the details of business and the local interests of the country. In short, he had taken up the freedom of the house, and did not treat the question like a cosmopolite or a writer in a magazine. If it were a divine, he knew the scriptures and the fathers, and the councils and the commentators by heart, and thundered them in the ears of his astonished audience. Not a trim essay or a tumid oration, patronising religion by modern sophisms, but the law and the prophets, the chapter and the verse. If it was a philosopher, Aristotle and the schoolmen were drawn out in battle array against you. If an antiquarian, the Lord bless us. There is a passage in Selden's notes on Drayton's Polyolbion, in which he elucidates some points of topography, by a reference not only to Stowe and Hollinshed and Camden, and Saxo Grammaticus, and Dugdale, and several other authors that we are acquainted with, 
but to twenty obscure names that no modern reader ever heard of. And so on through the notes to a folio volume, written apparently for relaxation. Such were the intellectual amusements of our ancestors. Learning then ordinarily lay in of folio volumes. Now she litters octavos and duodecimos, and will soon, as in France, miscarry of half-sheets. Poor Job Orton! Why should I not record a jest of his? Perhaps the only one he ever made. Emblematic as it is, of the living and the learning of the good old times. The Reverend Job Orton was a dissenting minister, in the middle of the last century, and had grown heavy and gouty by sitting long at dinner and at his studies. He could only get downstairs at last by spreading the folio volumes of Carroll's commentaries upon Job on the steps and sliding down them. Surprised one day in his descent, he exclaimed, You have often heard of Carroll upon Job. Now you see Job upon Carroll. This same quaint-witted gouty old gentleman seems to have been one of those superior happy spirits who slid through life on the rollers of learning, enjoying the good things of the world and laughing at them, and turning his infirmities to a livelier account than his patriarchal namesake. Reader, didst thou ever hear either of Job Orton, or of Carroll on Job? I dare say not. Yet the one did not therefore slide down his theological staircase, the less pleasantly. Nor did the other compile his commentaries in vain. For myself, I should like to browse on folios, and have to deal chiefly with authors that I have scarcely strength to lift, that are as solid as they are heavy, and if dull, are full of matter. It is delightful to repose on the wisdom of the ancients, to have some great name at hand, besides one's own initials, always staring one in the face. To travel out of oneself into the Chaldee, Hebrew, and Egyptian characters. To have the palm trees waving mystically in the margin of the page, and the camels moving slowly on in the distance of three thousand years. In that dry desert of learning, we gather strength and patience, and a strange and insatiable thirst of knowledge. The ruined monuments of antiquity are also there, and the fragments of buried cities, under which the adder lurks, and cool springs, and green sunny spots, and the whirlwind and the lion's roar, and the shadow of angelic wings. To those who turn with supercilious disgust from the ponderous tomes of scholastic learning, who never felt the witchery of the Talmuds and the Kabbalah, of the commentators and the schoolmen, of texts and authorities, of types and antitypes, hieroglyphics and mysteries, dogmas and contradictions, and endless controversies and doubtful labyrinths, and quaint traditions, I would recommend the lines of Wharton, written in a blank leaf of Dugdale's Monasticon, Deem not devoid of elegance the sage, by fancy's genuine feelings unbeguiled, of painful pedantry the pouring child, who turns of these proud domes the historic page, now sunk by time and Henry's fiercer rage. Thinks thou the warbling muses never smiled on his lone hours, ingenious views engage his thoughts, on themes unclassic falsely styled intent. While cloistered piety displays her mouldering scroll, the piercing eye explores new manners and the pomp of elder days. Whence culls the pensive bard his pictured stores? Nor rough nor barren are the winding ways of hoar antiquity, but strewn with flowers. This sonnet if it were not for a certain intricacy in the style, would be a perfect one. At any rate, the thought it contains is fine and just. Some of the caput mortuum of learning is a useful ballast and relief to the mind. It must turn back to the acquisitions of others, 
as its natural sustenance and support. Facts must go hand in hand with feelings, or it will soon prey like an empty stomach on itself, or be the sport of the windy impertinence of ingenuity self-begotten. Away, then, with this idle cant, as if everything were barbarous and without interest, that is not the growth of our own times and of our own taste, with this everlasting evaporation of mere sentiment, this affected glitter of style, this equivocal generation of thought out of ignorance and vanity, this total forgetfulness of the subject and display of the writer, as if every possible train of speculation must originate in the pronoun I, and the world had nothing to do but to look on and admire. It will not do to consider all truth or good as a reflection of our own pampered and inordinate self-love. To resolve the solid fabric of the universe into an essence of delicruscan witticism and conceit, the perpetual search after effect, the premature and effeminate indulgence of nervous sensibility, defeats and wears itself out. We cannot make an abstraction of the intellectual ore from the material dross, of feelings from objects, of results from causes. We must get at the kernel of pleasure through the dry and hard husk of truth. We must wait nature's time. These false births weaken the constitution. It has been observed that men of science live longer than mere men of letters. They exercise their understandings more, their sensibility less. There is with them less wear and tear of the irritable fibre, which is not shattered and worn to a very thread. On the hill of science they keep an eye intent on truth and fame. Calm pleasures there abide, majestic pains. While the man of letters mingles in the crowd below, courting popularity and pleasure. His is a frail and feverish existence, accordingly, and he soon exhausts himself in the tormenting pursuit, in the alternate excitement of his imagination and gratification of his vanity. Earth destroys those raptures duly, Erebus disdains. Lord Byron appears to me to have fairly run himself out in his debilitating intercourse with the wanton muse. He had no other idea left but that of himself and the public. He was uneasy unless he was occupied in administering repeated provocatives to idle curiosity and receiving strong doses of praise or censure in return. The irritation at last became so violent and importunate that he could neither keep on with it nor take any repose from it. The glistering orb of heated popularity glared round his soul and mocked his closing eyelids. The successive endless cantos of Don Juan were the quotidian that killed him. Old Sir Walter will last long enough, stuffing his wallet and his wain as he does, with mouldy fragments and crumbs of comfort. He does not spin his brains, but something much better. The cunning Child, the old canty Gabalunzi, has got hold of another clue, that of nature and history. And long may he spin it, even to the crack of doom, watching the threads as they are about to break through his fringed eyelids, catching a tradition in his mouth like a trap, and heaping his forehead with facts, till it shoves up the baronet's blue bonnet into a baron's crown, and then will the old boy turn in his chair, rest his chin upon his crutch, give a last look to the highlands, and with his latest breath thank God that he leaves the world as he found it. And so he will pretty nearly, with one exception, the Scotch novels. They are a small addition to this round world of ours. We and they shall jog on merrily together for a century or two, I hope, till some future Lord Byron asks, 
who reads Sir Walter Scott now? There is the last and almost worst of them. I would take it with me into a wilderness. Three pages of poor Peter Peebles will at any time redeem three volumes of Red Gauntlet. And Nanty Ewart is even better with his steady walk upon the deck of the jumping Jenny, and his story of himself, and her whose foot, whether he came in or went out, was never off the stair. There you came near me. There you touched me, old true penny. And then again the cat that blind Willie and his wife, and the boy sing in the hollow of the heath. There's more mirth and heart's ease in it than in all Lord Byron's Don Juan, or in Mr. Moore's lyrics. And why? Because the author is thinking of beggars and a beggar's brat, and not of himself while he writes it. He looks at nature, sees it, hears it, feels it, and believes that it exists, before it is printed, hot-pressed, and labelled on the back by the author of Waverley. He does not fancy, nor would he for one moment have it supposed, that his name and fame compose all that is worth a moment's consideration in the universe. This is the great secret of his writings, a perfect indifference to self. Whether it is the same in his politics I cannot say. I see no comparison between his prose writing and Lord Byron's poems. The only writer that I should hesitate about is Wordsworth. There are thoughts and lines of his that to me show as fine a mind, a subtler sense of beauty, than anything of Sir Walter's, such as those above quoted, and that other line in the Laudamia. Elysian beauty, melancholy grace. I would as soon have written that line as have carved a Greek statue. But in this opinion I shall have three or four with me, and all the rest of the world against me. I do not dislike a House of Commons minority in matters of taste. That is, one that is select, independent, and has a proxy from posterity. To return to the question with which I set out. End of section 37「Section 38 of The Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Plain Speaker. Opinions on Books, Men and Things by William Hazlitt. Section 38 On Old English Writers and Speakers Part 2 Learning is its own exceeding great reward, and at the period of which we speak, it bore other fruits, not unworthy of it. Genius when not smothered, and kept down by learning, blazed out triumphantly over it, and the fancy often rose to a height proportioned to the depth to which the understanding had struck its roots. After the first emancipation of the mind, from the trammels of papal ignorance and superstition, people seemed to be in a state of breathless wonder at the new light that was suffered to break in upon them. They were startled as at the birth of nature from the unapparent deep. They seized on all objects that rose in view, with a firm and eager grasp, in order to be sure whether they were imposed upon or not. The mind of man, pawing to get free from custom and prejudice, struggled and plunged, and like fabled Pegasus, opened at each spring a new source of truth. Images were piled on heaps, as well as opinions and facts the ample materials for poetry and prose, to which the bold hand of enthusiasm applied its torch and kindled it into a flame. The accumulation of past records seemed to form the framework of their prose, as the observation of external objects did of their poetry. 
whose body nature was, and man the soul. Among poets they have to boast such names, for instance, as Shakespeare, Spencer, Beaumont and Fletcher, Marlowe, Webster, Decker, and soon after, Milton. Among prose writers, Selden, Bacon, Jeremy Taylor, Baxter, and Sir Thomas Brown. For patriots they have such men as Pym, Hampden, Sidney, and for a witness of their zeal and piety, they have Fox's Book of Martyrs, instead of which we have Mr. Southey's Book of the Church, and a whole host of renegades. Perhaps Jeremy Taylor, and also Beaumont and Fletcher, may be mentioned as rather exceptions to the gravity and severity I have spoken of, as characteristic of our earlier literature. It is true they are florid and voluptuous in their style, but they still keep their state apart, and there is an eloquence of the heart about them, which seems to gush from the pure well of English undefiled, the one treats of sacred things with a vividness and fervour as if he had a revelation of them. The others speak of human interests, with a tenderness as if man's nature were divine. Jeremy Taylor's pen seems to have been guided by the very spirit of joy and youth, but yet with a sense of what was due to the reverence of age, and tears of pious awe that feared to have offended. Beaumont and Fletcher's love scenes are like the meeting of hearts in Elysium, let any one have dwelt on any object with the greatest fondness, let him have cherished the feeling to the utmost height, and have it put to the test in the most trying circumstances, and he will find it described to the life in Beaumont and Fletcher. Our modern dramatists, with one exception, appeal not to nature or the heart, but to the readers of modern poetry. Words and paper, each couleur de rose, are the two requisites of a fashionable style. But the glossy splendour, the voluptuous glow of the obsolete, old-fashioned writers just mentioned, has nothing artificial, nothing meretricious in it. It is the luxuriance of natural feeling and fancy. I should as soon think of accusing the summer rose of vanity for unfolding its leaves to the dawn, or the hawthorn that puts forth its blossoms in the genial warmth of spring of affecting to be fine. We have heard a good deal of the pulpit eloquence of Bossuet, and other celebrated preachers of the time of Fenelon, but I doubt much whether all of them together could produce any number of passages to match the best of those in the holy living and dying, or even Baxter's severe but thrilling denunciations of the insignificance and nothingness of life, and the certainty of a judgment to come. There is a fine portrait of this last-named powerful controversialist, with his high forehead and black velvet cap, in Calamy's Nonconformist Memorial, containing an account of the two thousand ejected ministers at the restoration of Charles the Second. This was a proud list for old England, and the account of their lives, their zeal, their eloquence and sufferings for conscience' sake, is one of the most interesting chapters in the history of the human mind, how high it can soar in faith, how nobly it can arm itself with resolution and fortitude, how far it can surpass itself in cruelty and fraud, how incapable it seems to be of good, except as it is urged on by the contention with evil. The retired and inflexible descendants of the two thousand ejected ministers and their adherents are gone with the spirit of persecution that gave a soul and body to them. And with them, I am afraid, the spirit of liberty, of manly independence, and of inward self-respect, is nearly extinguished in England. There appears to be no natural necessity for evil, but there is a perfect indifference to good without it. One thing exists, and has a value set upon it, only as it has a foil in some other. Learning is set off by ignorance, liberty by slavery, refinement by barbarism. The cultivation and attainment of any art or excellence is followed by its neglect and decay, and even religion owes its zest 
to the spirit of contradiction, for it flourishes most from persecution and hostile factions. Mr. Irvine speaks of the great superiority of religion over every other motive, since it enabled its professors to endure having hot molten lead poured down their throats. He forgets that it was religion that poured it down their throats, and that this principle, mixed with the frailty of human passion, has often been as ready to inflict as to endure. I could make the world good, wise, happy to-morrow, if, when made, it would be contented to remain so, without the alloy of mischief, misery, and absurdity. That is, if every possession did not require the principle of contrast, contradiction, and excess, to enliven and set it off, and keep it at a safe distance from sameness and insipidity. The different styles of art and schools of learning vary and fluctuate on this principle. After the restoration of Charles, the grave, enthusiastic, puritanical, prick-eared style became quite exploded, and a gay and piquant style, the reflection of courtly conversation and polished manners, and borrowed from the French, came into fashion, and lasted till the Revolution. Some examples of the same thing were given, in the time of Charles I, by Sir J. Suckling and others, but they were eclipsed and overlaid by the prevalence and splendour of the opposite examples. It was at its height, however, in the reign of the restored monarch, and in the witty and licentious writings of Wycherley, Congreve, Rochester, and Waller. Milton alone stood out as a partisan of the old Elizabethan school. Out of compliment, I suppose, to the houses of Orange and Hanover, we sobered down, after the revolution, into a strain of greater demureness, and into a Dutch and German fidelity of imitation of domestic manners and individual character, as in the periodical essayists, and in the works of Fielding and Hogarth. Yet, if the two last-named painters of manners are not English, who are so? I cannot give up my partiality to them for the fag-end of a theory. They have this mark of genuine English intellect, that they constantly combine truth of external observation with strength of internal meaning. The Dutch are patient observers of nature, but want character and feeling. The French, as far as we have imitated them, aim only at the pleasing, and glance over the surfaces of words and things. Thus has our literature descended, according to the foregoing scale, from the tone of the pulpit, to that of the court or drawing-room, from the drawing-room into the parlour, and from thence, if some critics say true, into the kitchen and alehouse. It may do even worse than that. French literature has undergone great changes in like manner, and was supposed to be at its height in the time of Louis the Fourteenth. We sympathise less, however, with the pompous and set speeches in the tragedies of Racine and Corneille, or in the serious comedies of Molière, than we do with the grotesque farces of the latter, with the exaggerated descriptions and humour of Rabelais, whose wit was a madness, a drunkenness, or with the accomplished humanity, the easy style, and gentlemanly and scholar-like sense of Montaigne. But these we consider as in a great measure English, or as what the old French character inclined to, before it was corrupted by courts and academies of criticism. The exquisite graces of La Fontaine, the indifferent sarcastic tone of Voltaire and Le Sage, who make light of everything, and who produce their greatest effects with the most imperceptible and rapid touches, we give wholly to the constitutional genius of the French, and despair of imitating. Perhaps in all this we proceed by guesswork at best. Nations, particularly rival nations, are bad judges of one another's literature or physiognomy. The French certainly do not understand us. It is most probable we do not understand them. How slowly great works, great names, make their way across the channel. Monsieur Chassis's ideology has not yet been heard of amongst us, and a Frenchman who asks if you have read it 
almost subjects himself to the suspicion of being the author. They have also their little sects and parties in literature, and though they do not nickname and vilify their rivals, as is done with us, thanks to the national politeness, yet, if you do not belong to the prevailing party, they very civilly suppress all mention of you, your name is not noticed in the journals, nor your work inquired for at the shops. Those who explain everything by final causes, that is, who deduce causes from effects, might avail themselves of their privilege on this occasion. There must be some checks to the excessive increase of literature, as of population, or we should be overwhelmed by it, and they are happily found in the envy, dullness, prejudices, and vanity of mankind. While we think we are weighing the merits of an author, we are indulging our own national pride, indolence or ill-humour, by laughing at what we do not understand, or condemning what thoughts are inclinations. The French reduce all philosophy to a set of agreeable sensations. The Germans reduce the commonest things to an abstruse metaphysics. The one are a mystical, the other a superficial people. Both proceed by the severest logic. But the real guide to their conclusions is the proportion of phlegm or mercury in their dispositions. When we appeal to a man's reason against his inclinations, we speak a language without meaning and which he will not understand. Different nations have favourite modes of feeling and of accounting for things to please themselves and fall in with their ordinary habits. And our different systems of philosophy, literature and art meet, contend and repel one another on the confines of opinion, because their elements will not amalgamate with our several humours, and all the while we fancy we settle the question by an abstract exercise of reason, and by laying down some refined and exclusive standard of taste. There is no great harm in this delusion, nor can there be much in seeing through it, for we shall still go on just as we did before. End of section 38「Section 39 of The Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Agnew. The Plain Speaker. Opinions on Books, Men, and Things. By William Hazlitt. Section 39. Madame Pasta and Mademoiselle Mars. I liked Mademoiselle Mars exceedingly well, till I saw Madame Pasta, whom I like so much better. The reason is, the one is the perfection of French, the other of natural acting. Madame Pasta is Italian, and she might be English. Mademoiselle Mars belongs emphatically to her country. The scene of her triumph is Paris. She plays naturally, too, but it is French nature. Let me explain. She has, it is true, none of the vices of the French theatre, its extravagance, its flutter, its grimace and affectation. But her merit in these respects is, as it were, negative. She seems to put on an artificial restraint upon herself. There is still a pettiness, an attention to minutia, an etiquette, a mannerism about her acting. She does not give an entire loose to her feelings, or trust to the unmitigated and habitual impulse of her situation. She has greater elegance, perhaps, and precision of style than Madame Pasta, but not half her boldness or grace. In short, everything she does is voluntary, instead of being spontaneous. It seems as if she might be acting from marginal directions to her part. When not speaking, she stands in general quite still. When she speaks, she extends first one hand, and then the other, in a way that you can foresee every time she does so, or in which a machine might be elaborately constructed to develop different successive movements. 
When she enters, she advances in a straight line from the other end to the middle of the stage with the slight, unvarying trip of her countrywoman, and then stops short, as if under the drill of a fugleman. When she speaks, she articulates with perfect clearness and propriety. But it is the facility of a singer executing a difficult passage. The case that is of habit, not of nature. Whatever she does is right in the intention, and she takes care not to carry it too far. But she appears to say beforehand, This I will do, I must not do that. Her acting is an inimitable study or consummate rehearsal of the part as a preparatory performance. She hardly yet appears to assume the character. Something more is wanting, and that's something you find in Madame Pasta. If Mademoiselle Mars has to smile, a slight and evanescent expression of pleasure passes across the surface of her face, twinkles in her eyelids, dimples her chin, compresses her lips, and plays on each feature. When Madame Pasta smiles, a beam of joy seems to have struck upon her heart and to irradiate her countenance. Her whole face is bathed and melted in expression, instead of its glancing from at particular points. When she speaks, it is in music. When she moves, it is without thinking whether she is graceful or not. When she weeps, it is a fountain of tears, not a few trickling drops that glitter and vanish the instant after. The French themselves admire Madame Pasta's acting, who indeed can help it, but they go away thinking how much more of her simple movements would be improved by their extravagant gesticulations, and that her noble, natural expression would be the better for having twenty airs of mincing affectation added to it. In her Nina there is a listless vacancy, an awkward grace, a want of benaissance that is like a child or a changeling, and that no French actress would venture upon for a moment, lest she be suspected of want of esprit or bas mien. A French actress always plays before the court. She is always in the presence of an audience, with whom she first settles her personal pretensions by a significant hint or side glance, and then as much nature and simplicity as you please. Poor Madame Pasta thinks no more of the audience than Nina herself would, if she could be observed by stealth, or than the fawn that wounded comes to drink, or the flower that droops in the sun or wags its sweet head in the gale. She gives herself entirely up to the impression of the part, loses her power over herself, is led away by her feelings either to an expression of stupor or of artless joy, borrows beauty from deformity, charms unconsciously, and is transformed into the very being she represents. She does not act the character, she is it, looks it, breathes it. She does not study for an effect, but strives to possess herself of the feeling which should dictate what she is to do, and which gives birth to the proper degree of grace, dignity, ease, or force. She makes no point all the way through, but her whole style and manner is in perfect keeping, as if she really were a love-sick, care-crazed maiden, occupied with one deep sorrow, or who had no other idea or interest in the world. This alone is true nature and true art. The rest is sophistical. And the French art is not free from impetuation. It never places an implicit faith in nature, but always mixes up a certain portion of art, that is, of consciousness and affectation with it. I shall illustrate this subject from a passage in Shakespeare. Polyxenes, shepherdess, a fair one are you, well you fit our ages with flowers of winter. Perdita. Sir, the year growing ancient, Yet on summer's death, nor on the birth of trembling winter, the fairest flowers o' the season are our carnations and streak of gullivores, which some call nature's bastards, of that kind our rustic gardens barren, and I care not to get slips of them. Pollux. Wherefore, gentle maiden, do you neglect them? Perdita. 
for I have heard it said there is an art which, in their pedus, shares with great creating nature. Collix. Say there be, yet nature is made better by no mean, but nature makes that mean. So or that art which you say adds to nature is an art that nature makes. You see, sweet maid, we marry a gentler scion in the wildest stock, and may conceive a bark of beiger kind by bud of nobler race. This is an art which does not mend nature, change it rather, but the art itself is nature. Perdita. So it is. Pollux. Then make your garden rich in gullivores, and do not call them bastards. Perdita. I'll not put a dibble in earth to set one slip of them, no more than where I painted. I should wish this youth to say, "'Twere well, and only therefore desire to breed by me." Madame Pasta appears to be of Perdita's mind in respect to her acting, and I applaud her resolution heartily. We English are charged unjustly with wishing to disparage the French. We cannot help it. There is a natural antipathy between the two nations. Thus, unable to deny their theatrical merit, we are said insidiously to have invented the appellation, French nature, to explain away or throw a stigma on their most successful exertions. Though that their art be nature, we throw such changes of vexation on it as it may lose some color. The English are a heavy people and the most like a stone of all others. The French are a lively people, and more like a feather. They are easily moved, and by slight causes, and each part of the impression has its separate effect. The English, if they move at all, which is a work of time and difficulty, are moved altogether, or in mass, and the impression, if it takes root, strikes deep and spreads wide, involving a number of other impressions in it. If a fragment of rock, wrenched from its place, rolls slowly at first, gathers strength and fury as it proceeds, tears up everything in its way, and thunders on the plain below, there is something noble and imposing in that sight, for it is an image of our own headlong passions, and the increasing vehemence of our desires. But we hate to see a feather launched into the air and driven back on the hand that throws it, shifting its course with every puff of wind and carried no farther by the strongest than by the slightest impulse. It is provoking, is it not, to see the strength of the blow always defeated by the very insignificance and want of resistance in the object, and the impulse received never answering to the impulse given. It is this very same fluttering, fidgeting, tantalizing, inconsequential, ridiculous process that annoys us in the French character. There seems no natural correspondence between objects and feelings, between things and words. By yielding to every impulse at once, nothing produces an aggregate impression, for every part tells separately. Every idea turns off to something else or back upon itself. There is no progress made, no blind impulse, no accumulation of imagination with circumstances, no absorption of all other feelings in one overwhelming one. That is, no keeping, no momentum, no integrity, no totality, no inflexible sincerity of purpose. And it is this resolution of the sentiments into detached points and first impressions, so that they do not take an entire and involuntary hold of them, but either they can throw them off with their lightness, or escape from them by reason of their minuteness, that we English complain of as French nature or want of nature for by nature is only meant that the mind identifies itself with something so as to be no longer master of itself. And the French mind never identifies itself with anything, but always has its own consciousness, its own affectation, its own gratification, its own slippery inconstancy, or impertinent prolixity interposed between the object and the impression. It is this theatrical or artificial nature with which we cannot and will not sympathize, because it circumscribes the truth of things and the capacities of the human mind within the petty round of vanity, indifference, and physical sensations, stunts the growth of imagination, 
effaces the broad light of nature, and requires us to look at all things through the prism of their petulance and self-conceit. The French, in a word, leave sincerity out of their nature. Not moral, but imaginative sincerity. Cut down the varieties of feelings to their own narrow and superficial standard, and having clipped and adulterated the current coin of expression, would pass it off as sterling gold. We cannot make an exchange with them. They are affected by things in a different manner from us, not in a different degree, and a mutual understanding is hopeless. We have no dislike to foreigners as such. On the contrary, a rage of foreign artists and works of art is one of our foibles. But if we give up our national pride, it must be to our taste and understandings. Nay, we adopt the manners and the fashions of the French, their dancing and their cooking, not their music, not their painting, not their poetry, not their metaphysics, not their style of acting. If we are sensible of our own stupidity, we cannot admire their vivacity. If we are sick of our own awkwardness, we like it better than their grace. We cannot part with our own grossness for their refinement. If we would be glad to have our lumpish clay animated, it must be with true Promethean heat, not with painted phosphorus. They are not the Frankensteins that must perform this feat, who among us in reading Schiller's Bobblers for the first time ever asked if it was German or not, who in reading Klopstock's Messiah did not object that it was German, not because it was German, but because it was heavy, that is, because the imagination and the heart do not act like a machine, so as to be wound up or let down by the pulleys of the will. Do not the French complain, and complain justly, that a picture is English, then it is coarse and unfinished, and leaves out the details which are part of nature? Do not the English remonstrate against this defect too, and endeavor to cure it? But it may be said we relish Schiller, because he is barbarous, violent, unlike Shakespeare. We have the cartoons of Raphael, then, and the Elgin marbles, and we profess to admire and understand these too. And I think without affectation, the reason is that there is no affectation in them. We like those noble outlines of the human face at Hampton Court, the sustained dignity of expression, the broad ample folds of the drapery, the bold massive limbs, there is breath and motion in them, and we would willingly be so transformed and spiritualized. But we do not want to have our heavy, stupid faces flitted away into a number of glittering points, or transfixed into smooth petrification on French canvas. Our faces, if wanting an expression, have a settled purpose in them. They are solid as they are stupid, and we are at least flesh and blood. We also like the sway of limbs and the negligent grandeur of the Elgin marbles. In spite of their huge weight and manly strength, they have the buoyancy of a wave of the sea, and all of the ease and softness of flesh. They fall into attitudes of themselves. But if they were put into attitudes by the genius of opera dancing, we should feel no disposition to imitate or envy them, any more than we do the Zephyr and Flora graces of French tastuary. We prefer a single head of chantries to a quarry of French sculpture. The English are a modest people, except in comparing themselves with their next neighbors, and nothing provokes their pride in case so much as the self-sufficiency of the latter. When Madame Pasta walks in upon the stage, and looks about her with the same unconsciousness or timid wonder as the young stag in the forest, when she moves her limbs as carelessly as a tree its branches, when she unfolds one of her divine expressions of countenance, which reflect the innermost feelings of the soul, of the calm, deep lake reflects the face of heaven. We do not sufficiently admire her. Do we not wish hers ours, and feel with the same cast of thought and character, a want of glow, of grace, and ease and expression of what we feel? We bow, like Gerdius and Avigonus, in the cave where they saw Imogene, as if a thing superior. On the other hand, when Mademoiselle Mars comes on the stage, something in the manner of a Fantoccanini figure slid along on a wood frame 
and making directly for the point at which her official operations commence, when her face is puckered into a hundred little expressions like the wrinkles on the skin of a bowl of cream set in a window to cool. Her eyes peering out with an ironical meaning, her noise pointing it, her lips confirming it, with a dry pressure we admire indeed. We are delighted, we may envy, but we do not sympathize or very well know what to make of it. We are not electrified, as in the former instance, but animal magnetized. We can manage pretty well with any one feeling or expression, like a clown that must be taught his letters one at a time, if it keeps on in the same even course that expands and deepens by degrees. But we are distracted and puzzled, or at best only amused with that sort of expression which is hardly itself for two moments together, that shifts from point to point, that seems to have no place to rest on, no impulse to urge it forward, and might as well be twenty other things at the same time, where tears come so easily, they can hardly be real, where smiles are so playful they appear put on, where you cannot tell what you are to believe, for these parties themselves do not know whether they are in jest or in earnest, where the whole tone is ironical, conventional, and where the difference between nature and art is nearly imperceptible. This is what we mean by French nature, vis-à-vis -vis, that the feeling and ideas are so slight and discontinuous that they can be changed for others like a dress or visor, or else, to make up for want of truth and breadth, are caricatured into a mask. This is the defect of their tragedy, and the defect and excellency of their comedy. The one is a pompous abortion, the other a facsimile of life, almost too close to be agreeable. A French comic actor might be supposed to have left his shop for half an hour to show himself upon the stage there is no difference worth speaking of between the man and the actor, whether on the stage or at home. He is equally full of gesticulation, equally voluble, and without meaning, as their tragic actors or solemn puppets, moved by rules, pulled by wires and with their mouths stuffed with rant and bombast. This is the harm that could be said of them. They themselves are doubtless best acquainted with the good, and are not too diffident to tell it. Though other people abuse them, they can still praise themselves. I once knew a French lady who said all manner of good things, and forgot them the next moment, who maintained an argument with great wit and eloquence and presently after changed sides, without knowing that she had done so, who invented a story and believed it on the spot, who wept herself and made you weep with the force of her descriptions, and suddenly, drying her eyes, laughed at you for looking grave. Is not this acting? Yet it was not affected in her, but natural, involuntary, incorrigible. The hurry and excitement of her natural spirits was like a species of intoxication, or she resembled a child in thoughtlessness and incoherence. She was a Frenchwoman. It was nature, but nature that had nothing to do with truth or consistency. In one of the Paris journals lately, there was a criticism on two pictures by Giraudet of Bonchamp and Catherine Neu, Vent de Chefs. The paper is well written, and points out the defects of the portraits very fairly and judiciously. These persons are there called illustrious Vendians. The dead dogs of 1812 are the illustrious Vendians of 1842. Monsieur Chateaubriand will have it so, and the French are too polite a nation to contradict him. They, split on this rock of complacence, surrendering every principle to the fear of giving offence, as we do on the opposite one of the party spirit and rancorous hostility, sacrificing the best of causes and our best friends to the desire of giving offence, to the indulgence of our spleen and of an ill tongue. We apply a degrading appellation, or bring on a porbious charge against an individual, and such is our tenaciousness of the painful and disagreeable, so fond of we of brooding over grievances, so incapable are our imaginations of raising themselves above the lowest scurrility or 
the dirtiest abuse that should the person attacked come out an angel from the contest the prejudice against him remains nearly the same if the charge had been fully proved an unpleasant association has been created and this is too delightful an exercise of understanding with the english public easily to be parted with john bull would as soon give up an estate as a bugbear having been once gulled they are not soon ungulled they are too knowing for that nay they represent the attempt to undeceive them as an injury the french apply a brilliant epitaph to the most vulnerable characters and thus gloss over a life of treachery or infamy with them the immediate or last impression is everything with us the first if it is sufficiently strong and gloomy, never wears out. The French critic observes that M. Grodet has given General Bonchamp, though in a situation of great difficulty and danger, a calm and even smiling air, and that the portrait of Cathignot, instead of a hero, looks only like an angry peasant. In fact, the lips in the first portrait are made of marmalade, the complexion is cosmetic and the smile ineffably engaging while the eye of the peasant cathinot darts a beam of light such as no eye however illustrious was ever illuminated with but so it is the senses like a favourite lap-dog are pampered and indulged at any expense the imagination like a gaunt hound is starved and driven away danger and death and ferocious courage and stern fortitude however the subject may exact them are uncourtly topics and kept out of sight but smiling lips and glistening eyes are pleasing objects and there you find them the style of portrait requires it it is of this varnish and glitter of sentiment that we complain perhaps it is no business of ours as what must for ever intercept the true feeling and genuine rendering of nature in French art, as what makes it spurious and counterfeit, and strips it of simplicity, force, and grandeur. Whatever pleases, whatever strikes, holds out a temptation to the French artist too strong to be resisted, and there is too great a sympathy in the public mind with this view of the subject to quarrel with or severely criticise what is so congenial with its own feelings a premature and superficial sensibility is the grave of french genius and of french taste beyond the momentary impulse of a lively organization all the rest is mechanical and pedantic they give you rules and theories for truth and nature the unities for poetry and the dead body for the living soul of art they colour a greek statue ill and call it a picture they paraphrase a greek tragedy and overload it with long-winded speeches and think they have a national drama of their own any other people would be ashamed of such preposterous pretensions in invention they do not get beyond models in imitation beyond details their microscopic vision hinders them from seeing nature. I observed two young students the other day near the top of Montparé, making oil sketches of a ruinous hovel in one corner of the road. Paris lay below, glittering grey and gold, like a spider's web, in the setting sun, which shot its slant rays upon their shining canvas, and they were busy in giving the finishing touches. The little outhouse was in itself picturesque enough. It was covered with moss, which hung down in a sort of drooping form as the rain had streamed down it, and the whales were loose and crumbling in pieces. Our artist had repaired everything. Not a stone was out of its place. No traces were left of the winter's flaw in the pendant moss. One would think the bricklayer and the gardener had been regularly set to work to do away with everything like sentiment, or keeping in the object before them. Oh, Paris, it was indeed this thy weak side, 
thy inability to connect any two ideas into one that thy barbarous and ruthless foes entered in the french have a great dislike to anything obscure they cannot bear to suppose for a moment there should be anything they do not understand they are shockingly afraid of being mystified hence they have no idea either of mental or aerial perspective everything must be distinctly made out and in the foreground for if it is not so clear that they can take it up bit by bit it is wholly lost upon them and they can turn away as if from an unmeaning blank this is the cause of the stiff unnatural look of their portraits no allowance is made for the veil that shade as well as the oblique position casts over the different parts of the face every feature and every part of every feature is given the same flat effect and it is owing to this perverse fidelity of detail that which is literally true is naturally false the side of the face seen in perspective does not present so many markings as the one that meets your eye full but if it is put into the vice of french portrait wrenched around by incorrigible affectation and conceit that insists upon knowing all that there is and set it down formally though it is not to be seen what can be the result but that the portrait will look like a head stuck in a vice will be flat hard and finished will have the appearance of reality and at the same time look like paint in short will be a french portrait that is the artist from a pettiness of view and want for more enlargement and liberal notions of art comes forward not to represent nature but like an impertinent commentator to explain what she has left in doubt to insist on that which she passes over or touches only slightly to throw a critical light on what she casts into shade and to pick out the details of what she blends into masses i wonder they allow the existence of the term clair obscure at all but it is a word and a word is a thing they can repeat and remember a french gentleman formally asked me what i thought of a landscape in their exhibition i said i thought it too clear he made answer that he should have conceived that to be impossible i replied that what i meant was that the parts of the several objects were made out too nearly equally distinctness all over the picture and that the leaves of the tree in shadow were as distinct as those in the light the branches of the tree at the distance as plain as those near the perspective arose only from the diminution of the objects and there was no interposition of air i said one could not see the leaves of a tree a mile off but this i added appertained to the question in metaphysics he shook his head thinking that a young englishman could know as little of abstruse philosophy as fine art and no more was said i owe to this gentleman whose name was merimy and who i understand is still living a grateful sense of many friendly attentions and many useful suggestions and i take this opportunity of acknowledging my obligations some one was observing of madame pasta's acting that its chief merit consisted of its being natural to which it was replied not so for that there was an ugly and handsome nature there is an old proverb that home is home be it never so homely and so it may be said of nature that whether ugly or handsome it is nature still besides beauty there is truth which is always one principal thing it doubles the effect of beauty which is mere affectation without it and even reconciles us to deformity nature the truth of nature is imitation denotes a given object a foregone conclusion in reality to which the artist is to conform in his copy in nature real objects exist real causes act which are only supposed to act in art and it is in the subordination of uncertain and superficial combinations of fancy to the more stable and powerful law of reality that the perfection of art consists 
A painter may arrange fine colors on his palette, but if he merely does this, he does nothing. It is accidental or arbitrary. The difficulty and the charm of the combination begins with the truth of imitation, that is, with the resemblance to a given object in nature, or, in other words, with the strength, coherence, and justness of our impressions, which must be verified by a reference to a known and determinate class of objects as the test. Art is so far the development or the communication of knowledge, but there can be no knowledge unless it be of some given or standard object which exists independently of the representation and bends the will to an obedience to it. The strokes of the pencil are what an artist pleases, are mere idleness and caprice without meaning, unless they point to nature. Then they are right or wrong, true or false, as they follow in her steps and copy her style. Art must anchor in nature, or it is the sport of every breath of folly. Natural objects convey given or intelligible ideas, which art embodies and represents, or it represents nothing, is a mere chimera or bubble, and farther, natural objects or events cause certain feelings. In expressing which art manifests its power and genius its prerogative. The capacity of expressing these movements of passion is in proportion to the power with which they are felt, and this is the same as sympathy with the human mind placed in actual situations and influenced by real causes that are supposed to act. Genius is the power which equalizes or identifies the imagination with the reality or with nature. Certain events happening to us naturally produce joy, others sorrow, and these feelings, if excessive, lead to other consequences, such as stupor or ecstasy, and express themselves by certain signs in the countenance or voice or gestures. And we admire and applaud an actress accordingly, who gives these tones and gestures as they would follow in order of things, because then we know that her mind has been affected in like manner, that she enters deeply into the resources of nature and understands the riches of the human heart, for nothing else can impel and stir her up to the imitation of the truth. The way in which real causes act upon feelings is not arbitrary, is not fanciful. It is as true as it is powerful and unforeseen. The effects can only be similar when the exciting causes have a correspondence with each other, and there is nothing like feeling but feeling. The sense of joy can alone produce the smile of joy, and in proportion to the sweetness, the unconsciousness, the expansion of the last, we may be sure it is the fullness and sincerity of the heart from which it proceeds. The elements of joy at least are there, in their integrity and perfection. The death or absence of a beloved object is nothing as a word, as a mere passing thought, till it comes to be dwelt upon, and we begin to feel the revulsion, the long, dreary separation, the stunning sense of the blow to our happiness, as we should in reality. The power of giving this sad and bewildering effect of sorrow on the stage is derived from the force of sympathy, which what we should feel in reality. That is, a great histrionic genius is one that approximates the effects of the words, or of supposed situations on the mind, most nearly to the deep and vivid effect of real and inevitable ones. Joy produces tears. The violence of passion turns to childish weakness, but this could not be foreseen by study, nor taught by rules, nor mimicked by observation. Natural acting is therefore fine, because it implies and calls forth the most varied and strongest feelings that the supposed characters and circumstances can possibly give birth to. It reaches the height of the subject. The conceiving or entering into a part in this sense is everything. The acting follows easily, and of course. 
but art without nature is a nickname a word without meaning a conclusion without any premises to go upon the beauty of madame pasta's acting in nina proceeds upon this principle it's not what she does at any particular juncture but she seems to be in character and to be incapable of divesting herself of it this is true acting anything else is playing tricks may be clever and ingenious is french opera dancing recitation heroics or hysterics but it is not true nature or true art. End of section thirty nine. Recording by Mary Agnew. Section forty of the Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Luna The Plain Speaker Opinions on Books, Men, and Things by William Hazlitt Section 40 Sir Walter Scott, Racine, and Shakespeare The argument at the end of the last essay may possibly serve to throw some light on the often agitated and trite question whether we receive more pleasure from an opera or a tragedy from the words or the pantomime of a fine dramatic representation a musician i can conceive to declare sincerely and conscientiously in favour of the opera over the theatre for he has made it his chief or exclusive study but i have heard some literary persons do the same and in them it appears to me to be more the affectation of candour than candour itself the still small voice is wanting in this preference for however lulling or overpowering the effect of music may be at the time we return to nature at last it is there we find solidity and repose and it is from this that the understanding ought to give its casting vote Indeed, there is a sense of reluctance and a sort of critical remorse in the opposite course as in giving up an old prejudice or a friend to whom we are under considerable obligations. But this very feeling of the conquest or sacrifice of a prejudice is a tacit proof that we are wrong, for it arises only out of the strong interest excited in the course of time and involved in the nature and principle of the drama words are the signs which point out and define the objects of the highest import to the human mind and speech is the habitual and as it were most intimate mode of expressing those signs the one with which our practical and serious associations are most in unison to give a deliberate verdict on the other side of the question seems therefore effeminate and unjust a rose is delightful to the smell a pineapple to the taste the nose and the palate if their opinion were asked might very fairly give it in favour of these against any rival sentiment but the head and the heart cannot be expected to become accomplices against themselves we cannot pay a worse compliment to any pleasure or pursuit than to surrender the pretensions of some other to it everything stands best on its own foundation a sound expresses for the most part nothing but itself a word expresses a million of sounds the thought or impression of the moment is one thing and it may be more or less delightful but beyond this it may relate to the fate or events of a whole life and it is this moral and intellectual perspective that words convey in its full signification and extent and that gives a proportionable superiority in weight in combats and dignity to the denunciations of the tragic muse the language of the understanding is necessary to a rational being man is dumb and prone to the earth without it it is that which opens the vista of our past or future years otherwise a cloud is upon it like the mist of the morning like a veil of roses an exhalation of sweet sounds or rich distilled perfumes no matter what it is the nerve or organ that is chiefly touched the sense that is wrapped in ecstasy or waked to madness the man remains unmoved torpid and listless blind to causes and consequences which he can never remain satisfied without knowing but seems shut up in a cell of ignorance baffled and confounded 
sounds without meaning are like a glare of light without objects or an opera is to a tragedy what a transparency is to a picture we are delighted because we are dazzled but words are a key to the affections they not only excite feelings but they point to the why and wherefore causes march before them and consequences follow after them they are links to the chain of the universe and the grappling irons that bind us to it they open the gates of paradise and reveal the abyss of human woe four lagging winters and four wanton springs die in a word such is the breath of kings but in this respect all men who have the use of speech are kings it is words that constitute all but the present moment but the present object they may not and they do not give the whole of any train of impression which they suggest but they alone answer in any degree to the truth of things unfold the dark labyrinth of fate or unravel the web of the human heart for they alone describe things in the order and relation in which they happen in human life men do not dance or sing through life or an opera or a ballet would come home to the bosoms and businesses of men in the same manner that a tragedy or a comedy does as it is they do not piece on to our ordinary existence nor go to enrich our habitual reflections we wake from them as from a drunken dream or a last night's debauch and think of them no more till the actual impression is repeated on the other hand pantomime action as an exclusive and new species of the drama is like tragedy obtruncated and thrown on the ground gasping for utterance and struggling for breath it is a display of the powers of art i should think more wonderful than satisfactory there is a stifling sensation about it it does not throw off the perilous stuff that weighs upon the heart but must rather aggravate and tighten the pressure give sorrow words the grief that does not speak whispers the o'erfraught heart and bids it break this is perhaps the cause of our backwardness to admit a comparison between mrs siddons and pellerini between shakespeare and vigano poetry and words speak a language proper to humanity every other is comparatively foreign to it the distinction here laid down is important and should be kept sacred even in speaking a foreign language words lose half their meaning and are no longer an echo to the sense virtue becomes a cant term vice sounds like an agreeable novelty and ceases to shock how much more must this effect happen if we lay aside speech our distinguishing faculty altogether all try to gabble most brutishly measure good and evil by the steps of a dance and breed our souls away in dying swan-like symphonies but it may be asked how does all this affect my favourite art of painting I'll leave somebody else to answer that question. It will be a good exercise for their ingenuity, if not for their ingenuousness. I proceed to the more immediate object of this essay, which was to distinguish between the talents of Sir Walter Scott, Racine, and Shakespeare. The subject occurred to me from some conversation with a French lady who entertains a project of introducing Shakespeare in France as i demurred to the probability of this alteration in the national taste she endeavoured to overcome my despotency by several lively arguments and among other things urged the instantaneous and universal success of the scotch novels among all ranks and conditions of the french people as shakespeare had been performing quarantine among them for a century and a half to no purpose i thought this circumstance rather proved the difference in the genius of the two writers than a change in the taste of the nation madame b stoutly maintained the contrary opinion and when an englishman argues with a frenchwoman he has very considerable odds against him the only advantage you have in this case is that you can plead inability to express yourself properly and may be supposed to have a meaning where you have none an eager manner will supply the place of distinct ideas and you have only not to surrender in form to appear to come off with flying colours the not being able to make others understand me, however, prevents me from understanding myself, and I was by no means satisfied with the reasons I alleged in the present instance. I tried to mend them the next day, and the following is the result. It was supposed at one time that the genius of the author of Waverley was confined to Scotland, 
that his novels and tales were a bundle of national prejudices and local traditions, and that his superiority would desert him the instant he attempted to cross the border. He made the attempt, however, and contrary to these unfavourable prognostics, succeeded. Ivanhoe, if not equal to the very best of the Scotch novel, is very nearly so, and the scenery and manners are truly English. In Quentin Durward, again, he made a descend upon France, and gained new laurels instead of losing his former ones. This seemed to bespeak of a satility of talent and a plastic power, which in the first instance had been called in question. A Scotch mist had been suspected to hang its mystery over the page. His imagination was borne up on highland superstitions and obsolete traditions, sailing with supreme dominion through the murky regions of ignorance and barbarism. And if ever at a loss, his invention was eked out and got a cast by means of ancient documents and the records of criminal jurisprudence or fanatic rage. The Black Dwarf was a paraphrase to the current anecdotes of David Ritchie, without any additional point or interest, and the story of Evie Deans had slept for a century in the law reports and depositions relative to the heart of Midlothian. To be sure, nothing could be finer or truer to nature, for the human heart, whenever or however it is wakened, has a stirring power in it, and, as to the truth of nature, nothing can be more like nature than facts, if you know where to find them. But as to sheer invention, there appear to be about as much as there is in the getting up the melodramatic representation of the Maid of the Magpie from the Causes Celebre. The invention is much greater, and the effect is not less, in Mrs. Inchbald's Nature and Art, where there is nothing that can have been given in evidence but the trial scene near the end, and even that is not a legal antidote, but a pure dramatic fiction. Before I proceed, I may as well dwell on this point a little. The heroine of the story, the once innocent and beautiful Hannah, is brought by a series of misfortunes and crimes, the effect of a misplaced attachment, to be tried for her life at the old Bailey, and, as her judge, her former lover and seducer, is about to pronounce sentence upon her, she calls out in agony, Oh, not from you! and as the Honourable Mr. Norwine proceeds to finish his solemn address, falls in a swoon, and is taken senseless from the bar. I know nothing in the world so affecting as this. Now, if Mrs. Inchbald had merely found this story in the Newgate calendar, and transplanted it into a novel, I conceive that her merit in point of genius, not to say feeling, would be less than if having all the other circumstances given, and the apparatus ready, and this exclamation alone left blank, she had filled it up from her own heart, that is, from an intense conception of the situation of the parties, so that from the harrowing recollections passing through the mind of the poor girl so circumstanced, this uncontrollable gush of feeling would burst from her lips. Just such, I apprehend, generally speaking, is the amount of the difference between the genius of Shakespeare and that of Sir Walter Scott. It is the difference between originality and the want of it, between writing and transcribing. Almost all the finest scenes and touches, the great master strokes in Shakespeare, are such as must have belonged to the class of invention, where the secret lay between him and his own heart, and the power exerted is in adding to the given materials and working something out of them. In the author of Waverley, not all but the principal and characteristic beauties are such as may and do belong to the class of compilation, that is, consist in bringing the materials together and leaving them to produce their own effect. Sir Walter Scott is much such a writer as the Duke of Wellington is a general. I am profaning a number of great names in this article by unequal comparisons. The one gets a hundred thousand men together, and wisely leaves it to them to fight out the battle, for if he meddled with it he might spoil sport. The other gets an innumerable quantity of facts together, and lets them tell their own story, as best they may. The facts are stubborn in the last instance, as the men are in the first and in neither case is the broth spoiled by the cook. This abstinence from interfering with their resources, lest they should defeat their own success, shows great modesty and self-knowledge in the compiler of romances and the leader of armies, 
but little boldness or inventiveness of genius. We begin to measure Shakespeare's height from the superstructure of passion and fancy he has raised out of his subject and story, on which, too, rests the triumphal arc of his fame. If we were to take away the subject and story, the portrait and history from the Scotch novels, no great deal would be left worth talking about. No one admires or delights in the Scottish novels more than I do. But at the same time, when I hear it asserted that his mind is of the same class with Shakespeare's, or that he imitates nature in the same way, I confess I cannot assent to it. No two things appear to me more different. Sir Walter is an imitator of nature, and nothing more. But I think Shakespeare is infinitely more than this. The creative principle is everywhere restless and redundant in Shakespeare, both as it relates to the invention of feeling and imagery. In the author of Waverley it lies for the most part dormant, sluggish, and unused. Sir Walter's mind is full of information, but the o'er-informing power is not there. Shakespeare's spirit, like fire, shines through him. Sir Walter's, like a stream, reflects surrounding objects. It is true, he has shifted the scene from Scotland into England and France, and the manners and characters are strikingly English and French, but this does not prove that they are not local, and that they are not borrowed, as well as the scenery and costume, from comparatively obvious and mechanical sources. Nobody from reading Shakespeare would know, except from the Dramatis Personae, that Lear was an English king. He is merely a king and a father. The ground is common, but what a well of tears he has dug out of it! The tradition is nothing or a foolish one. There are no data in history to go upon, no advantages taken of costume, no acquaintance with geography or architecture or dialect is necessary. But there is an old tradition, human nature, an old temple, the human mind, and Shakespeare walks into it and looks about him with a lordly eye and seizes on the sacred spoils as his own. The story is a thousand or two years old, and yet the tragedy has no smack of antiquarism in it. I should like very well to see Sir Walter give us a tragedy of this kind, a huge globose of sorrow swinging round in mid-air, independent of time, place, and circumstance, sustained by its own weight and motion, and not propped up by the levers of custom or patched up with quaint old-fashioned dresses, or set off by grotesque backgrounds or rusty armour but in which the mere paraphernalia and accessories were left out of the question, and nothing but the soul of passion and the pith of imagination was to be found. A dukedom to a beggarly denier, he would make nothing of it. Does this prove he has done nothing, or that he has not done the greatest things? No, but that he is not like Shakespeare. For instance, when Lear says, The little dogs and all, Trey, Blanche, and Sweetheart, see they bark at me there is no old chronicle in the line of brute no black letter broadside no tattered ballad no vague rumour in which these exclamation is registered there is nothing romantic quaint mysterious in the objects introduced the illustration is borrowed from the commonest and most casual images in nature and yet it is this very circumstance that lends its extreme force to the expression of his grief by showing that even the lowest thing in creation, and that the last you would think of, had in his imagination turned against him. All nature was, as he supposed, in a conspiracy against him, and the most trivial and insignificant creatures concerned in it were the most striking proofs of its malignity and extent. It is the depth of passion, however, or of the poet's sympathy with it, that distinguishes this character of torturing familiarity in them, invests them with corresponding importance, and suggests them by the force of contrast. It is not that certain images are surcharged with a prescriptive influence over the imagination from known and existing prejudices, so that to approach or even mention them is sure to excite a pleasing awe and horror in the mind. The effect in this case is mostly mechanical. The whole sublimity of the passage is from the weight of passion thrown into it, and this is the poet's own doing. This is not trick, but genius. Meg Merrilies, on her deathbed, says, Lay my head to the east. Nothing can be finer or more thrilling than this in its way. But the author has little to do with it. 
it is an oriental superstition it is a proverbial expression it is part of the gibberish sublime though it be of her gypsy clan nothing but his unkind daughters could have brought him to this pass this is not a cant phrase nor the fragment of an old legend nor a mysterious spell nor the butt-end of a wizard's denunciation it is the mere natural ebullition of passion urged nearly to madness and that will admit no other cause of dire misfortune but its own which swallows up all other griefs the force of despair hurries the imagination over the boundary of fact and common sense and renders the transition sublime but there is no precedent or authority for it except in the general nature of the human mind i think but am not sure that sir walter scott has imitated this turn of reflection by making madge wildfire ascribe jeanie dean's uneasiness to the loss of her baby which had unsettled her own brain again lear calls on the heavens to take his part for they are old like him here there is nothing to prop up the image but the strength of passion confounding the infirmity of age with the stability of the firmament and equalling the complainant through the sense of suffering and wrong with the majesty of the highest this finding out a parallel between the most unlike objects because the individual would wish to find one to support the sense of his own misery and helplessness is truly shakespearean it is an instinctive law of our nature and the genuine inspiration of the muse racine but let me not anticipate would make him pour out three hundred verses of lamentation for his loss of kingdom his feebleness and his old age coming to the same conclusion at the end of every third couplet instead of making him grasp at once at the heavens for support the witches in macbeth are traditional preternatural personages and there sir walter would have left them after making what use of them he pleased as a sort of gothic machinery shakespeare makes something more of them and adds to the mystery by explaining it the earth hath bustles as the water has and these are of them we have their physiognomy, too. You seem to understand me, by each at once her choppy finger laying upon her skinny lips. And the mode of their disappearance is thus described. Banquo? Whither are they vanished? Macbeth? Into the air. What an idea is here conveyed of silence and vacancy! The geese of Micklestane Moor, the countrywoman and her flock of geese turned into stone in the Black Dwarf, are a fine and petrifying metamorphosis but it is the tradition of the country and no more sir walter has told us nothing further of it than the first clown whom we might ask concerning it i do not blame him for that though i cannot give him credit for what he has not done the poetry of the novel is a fixture of the spot meg merrily's i also allow with all possible good will to be a most romantic and astounding personage yet she is a little melodramatic her exits and entrances are pantomimic and her long red cloak her elf locks the rock on which she stands and the white cloud behind her are or might be made the property of a theatre shakespeare's witches are nearly exploded on the stage their broomsticks are left their metaphysics are gone buried five editions deep in captain medwin's conversations the passion in othello is made out of nothing but itself there is no external machinery to help it on its highest intermediate agent is an old-fashioned pocket handkerchief yet there's magic in the web of thoughts and feelings done after the commonest pattern of human life the power displayed in it is that of intense passion and powerful intellect wielding overday events and imparting its force to them not swayed or carried along by them as in a go-cart the splendour is that of genius darting out its forked flame on whatever comes in its way and kindling and melting it in the furnace of affection whether it be flax or iron the colouring the form the motion the combination of objects depend on the predisposition of the mind moulding nature to its own purposes in sir walter the mind is as wax to circumstances and owns no other impress shakespeare is a half worker with nature sir walter is like a man who has got a romantic spinning jenny which he has only to set a-going and it does his work for him much better and faster than he can do it for himself 
he lays an embargo on all appliances and means to boot, on history, tradition, local scenery, costume and manners, and makes his characters chiefly up of these. Shakespeare seizes only on the ruling passion, and miraculously evolves all the rest from it. The eagerness of desire suggests every possible event that can irritate or thwart it, foresees all obstacles, catches at every trifle, clothes itself with imagination, and tantalizes itself with hope. Sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt, starts at a phantom, and makes the universe tributary to it, and the plaything of its fancy. There is none of this overweening importunity of the imagination in the author of Waverley. He does his work well, but in another guest manner. His imagination is a matter-of-fact imagination. To return to Othello, take the celebrated dialogue in the third act. Tis common. There is nothing but the writhings and contortions of the heart, probed by affliction's point, as the flesh shrinks under the surgeon's knife. All its starts and flaws are but the conflicts and misgivings of hope and fear in the most ordinary but trying circumstances. The not a jot, not a jot has nothing to do with any old legend or prophecy. It is only the last poor effort of human hope taking refuge on the lips. When after being infected with jealousy by Iago, he retires apparently comforted and resigned, and then, without anything having happened in the interim, returns stung to madness, crowned with his wrongs, and raging for revenge. The effect is like that of poison inflaming the blood, or like fire enclosed in a furnace. The sole principle of invention is the sympathy with the natural revulsion of the human mind, and its involuntary transition from false security to uncontrollable fury. The springs of mental passion are fretted, and rout to madness, and produce this explosion in the poet's breast. So, when Othello swears, by yon marble heaven, the epithet is suggested by the hardness of his heart from the sense of injury. The texture of the outward object is borrowed from that of the thoughts, and that noble simile, like the propontic, and etc., seems only an echo of the sounding tide of passion, and to roll from the same source the heart. The dialogue between Hubbard and Arthur, and that between Brutus and Cassius, are among the finest illustrations of the same principle, which indeed is everywhere predominant, perhaps to a fault, in Shakespeare. His genius is like the Nile, overflowing and enriching its banks. That of Sir Walter is like a mountain stream, rendered interesting by the picturesqueness of the surrounding scenery. Shakespeare produces his most striking dramatic effects out of the workings of the finest and most intense passions. Sir Walter places his dramatis personae in romantic situations, and subjects them to extraordinary occurrences, and narrates the results. The one gives us what we see and hear, the other what we are. Hamlet is not a person whose nativity is cast, or whose death is forestalled by portents, he weaves the web of his destiny out of his own thoughts, and a very quaint and singular one it is. We have, I think, a stronger fellow-feeling with him than we have with Bertram or Waverley. All men feel and think, more or less, but we are not all foundlings, Jacobites, or astrologers. We might have been overturned with these gentlemen in a stage-coach. We seem to have been schoolfellows with Hamlet at Wittenberg. I will not press this argument further lest I should make it tedious, and run into questions I have no intention to meddle with. All I mean to insist upon is that Sir Walter's forte is in the richness and variety of his materials, and Shakespeare's in the working them up. Sir Walter is distinguished by the most amazing retentiveness of memory, and vividness of conception of what would happen, be seen, and felt by everybody in given circumstances, as Shakespeare is by inventiveness of genius, by a faculty of tracing and unfolding the most hidden yet powerful springs in action, scarce recognized by ourselves, and by an endless and felicitous range of poetical illustrations, added to a wide scoop of reading and of knowledge. One proof of the justice of these remarks is that whenever Sir Walter comes to a truly dramatic situation, he declines it, or fails. Thus, in The Black Dwarf, all that relates to the traditions respecting this mysterious personage, 
to the superstitious stories founded on it is admirably done and to the life with all the spirit and freedom of originality but when he comes to the last scene for which all the rest is a preparation and which is full of the highest interest and passion nothing is done instead of an address from sir edward morley recounting the miseries of his old life and withering up his guilty rival with the recital the dwarf enters with a strange rustling noise the opposite doors fly open and the frightened spectators rush out like the figures of a pentamin this is not dramatic but melodramatic there is a palpable disappointment and falling off where the interest had been worked up to the highest pitch of expectation the gratifying of this appalling curiosity and interest was all that was not done to sir walter's hand and this he has failed to do all that was known about the black dwarf his figure his desolate habitation his unaccountable way of life his wrongs his bitter execrations against intruders on his privacy the floating and exaggerated accounts of him all these are given with a masterly and faithful hand this is matter of description and narrative but when the true imaginative and dramatic part comes, when the subject of this disastrous tale is to pour out the accumulated and agonizing effects of all this series of wretchedness and torture upon his own mind, that is, when the person is to speak from himself and to stun us with the recoil of passion upon external agents or circumstances that hath caused it, we find that it is Sir Walter Scott, and not Shakespeare, that is his counsel keeper that the author is a novelist and not a poet all that is gossiped in the neighbourhood all that is handed down in print all of which a drawing or an etching might be procured is gathered together and communicated to the public what the heart whispers to itself in secret what the imagination tells in thunder this alone is wanting and this is the great thing required to make good the comparison in question sir walter has not then imitated shakespeare but he has given us nature such as he found and could best describe it and he resembles him only in this that he thinks of his characters and never of himself and pours out his works with such unconscious ease and prodigality of resources that he thinks nothing of them and is even greater than his own fame the genius of shakespeare is dramatic that of scott narrative or descriptive that of racine is didactic he gives us i conceive the commonplaces of the human heart better than any one but nothing or very little more he enlarges on a set of obvious sentiments and well-known topics with considerable elegance of language and copiousness of declamation but there is scarcely one stroke of original genius nor anything like imagination in his writings he strings together a number of moral reflections and instead of reciting them himself puts them into the mouths of his dramatis personae who talk well about their own situations and the general relations of human life instead of laying bare the heart of the sufferer with all its pleading wounds and palpitating fibres he puts into his hand a commonplace book and he reads us a lecture from this this is not the essence of the drama whose object and privilege it is to give us the extreme and subtle workings of the human mind in individual circumstances to make us sympathize with the sufferer or feel as we should feel in his circumstances not to tell the indifferent spectator what the indifferent spectator could just as well tell him tragedy his human nature tried in the crucible of affliction not exhibited in the vague theorems of speculation the poet's pen that paints all this in words of fire and images of gold is totally wanting in racine he gives neither external images nor the internal and secret workings of the human breast sir walter scott gives the external imagery or machinery of passion shakespeare the soul and racine the moral or argument of it the french object to shakespeare for his breach of the unities and hold up racine as a model of classical propriety who makes a greek hero address a grecian heroine as madame yet this is not barbarous why because it is french and because nothing that is french can be barbarous in the eyes of this frivolous and pedantic nation who would prefer a peruke of the age of louis fourteen to a simple greek headdress End of section 40. Recording by Sandra Luna.
Section 41 of The Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Plain Speaker. Opinions on Books, Men, and Things by William Hazlitt. Section 41. On Depth and Superficiality. I wish to make this essay a sort of study of the meaning of several words which have at different times a good deal puzzled me. Among these are the words wicked, false, and true, as applied to feeling, and lastly, depth and shallowness. It may amuse the reader to see the way in which I work out some of my conclusions underground before throwing them up on the surface. A great but useless thinker once asked me if I had ever known a child of a naturally wicked disposition, and I answered yes, that there was one in the house with me that cried from morning to night for spite. I was laughed at for this answer, but still I do not repent it. It appeared to me that this child took a delight in tormenting itself and others that the love of tyrannizing over others and subjecting them to its caprices was a full compensation for the beating it received, that the screams it uttered soothed its peevish, turbulent spirit, and that it had a positive pleasure in pain from the sense of power accompanying it, his principus nascunto tyranny, his carnifex animus. I was supposed to magnify and overrate the symptoms of the disease, and to make a childish humor into a bugbear. But indeed, I have no other idea of what is commonly understood by wickedness than that perversion of the will or love of mischief for its own sake, which constantly displays itself, though in trifles and on a ludicrously small scale, in early childhood. I have often been reproached with extravagance for considering things only in their abstract principles and with heat and ill-temper for getting into a passion about what no ways concerned me. If any one wishes to see me quite calm, they may cheat me in a bargain, or tread upon my toes. But a truth repelled, a sophism repeated, totally disconcerts me, and I lose all patience. I am not, in the ordinary acceptation of the term, a good-natured man. That is, many things annoy me besides what interferes with my own ease and interest. I hate a lie. A piece of injustice wounds me to the quick, though nothing but the report of it reach me. Therefore I have made many enemies and few friends, for the public know nothing of well-wishers, and keep a wary eye on those who would reform them. Coleridge used to complain of my irascibility in this respect, and not without reason. Would that he had possessed a little of my tenaciousness and jealousy of temper, and then with his eloquence to paint the wrong, and acuteness to detect it. His country and the cause of liberty might not have fallen without a struggle. The craniologists give me the organ of local memory of which faculty I have not a particle, although they may say that my frequent allusions to conversations that occurred many years ago prove the contrary. I once spent a whole evening with Dr. Spurzheim, and I utterly forgot all that passed, except that the doctor waltzed before we parted. The only faculty I do possess is that of a certain morbid interest in things, which makes me equally remember or anticipate by nervous analogy whatever touches it. And for this our nostrum mongers have no specific organ, so that I am quite left out of their system. No wonder that I should pick a quarrel with it. It vexes me beyond all bearing to see children kill flies for sport, for the principle is the same as in the most deliberate and profligate acts of cruelty they can afterwards exercise upon their fellow creatures. And yet I let moths burn themselves to death in the candle, for it makes me mad, and I say it is in vain 
to prevent fools from rushing upon destruction. The author of the rhyme of the ancient mariner, who sees farther into such things than most people, could not understand why I should bring a charge of wickedness against an infant before it could speak, merely for squalling and straining its lungs a little. If the child had been in pain or in fear, I should have said nothing. But it cried only to vent its passion and alarm the house, and I saw in its frantic screams and gestures that great baby, the world, tumbling about in its swaddling clothes and tormenting itself and others for the last six thousand years. The pleas of ignorance, of folly, of grossness or selfishness, makes nothing either way. It is the downright love of pain and mischief for the interest it excites, and the scope it gives to an abandoned will. That is the root of all the evil, and the original sin of human nature. There is a love of power in the mind, independent of the love of good, and this love of power, when it comes to be opposed to the spirit of good, and is leagued with the spirit of evil, to commit it with greediness, is wickedness. I know of no other definition of the term. A person who does not foresee consequences is a fool. He who cheats others to serve himself is a knave. He who is immersed in sensual pleasure is a brute. But lie alone. Who has a pleasure in injuring another, or in debasing himself? That is, who does a thing with a particular relish because he ought not is properly wicked. This character implies the fiend at the bottom of it, and is mixed up pretty plentifully, according to my philosophy, in the untoward composition of human nature. It is this craving after what is prohibited, and the force of contrast adding its zest to the violations of reason and propriety, that accounts for the excesses of pride, of cruelty, and lust and at the same time frets and vexes the surface of life with petty evils, and plants a canker in the bosom of our daily enjoyments. Take away the enormities dictated by the wanton and pampered pride of human will, glutting itself with the sacrifice of the welfare of others, or with the desecration of its own best feelings, and also the endless bickerings, heart-burnings, and disappointments produced by the spirit of contradiction on a smaller scale, and the life of man would spin round on its soft axle, unharmed and free, neither appalled by huge crimes nor infested by insect follies. It might indeed be monotonous and insipid, but it is the hankering after mischievous and violent excitement that leads to this result that causes that indifference to good and proneness to evil, which is the very thing complained of. The griefs we suffer are for the most part of our own seeking and making, or we incur or inflict them, not to avert other impending evils, but to drive off in you. There must be a spice of mischief and willfulness thrown into the cup of our existence to give its sharp taste and sparkling color. I shall not go into a formal argument on this subject for fear of being tedious, nor endeavor to enforce it by extreme cases for fear of being disgusting, but shall contend myself with some desultory and familiar illustrations of it. I laugh at those who deny that we ever wantonly or unnecessarily inflict pain upon others when I see how fond we are of ingeniously tormenting ourselves. What is sullenness in children or grown people but revenge against ourselves? We had rather be the victims of this absurd and headstrong feeling than give up an inveterate purpose, retract an error, or relax from the intensity of our will, whatever it may cost us. A surly man is his own enemy and knowingly sacrifices his interest to his ill-humor, because he would at any time rather disoblige you than serve himself, as I believe I have already shown in another place. 
the reason is he has a natural aversion to everything agreeable or happy he turns with disgust from every such feeling as not according with the severe tone of his mind and it is in excluding all interchange of friendly affections or kind offices that the ruling bias and the chief satisfaction of his life consist is not every country town supplied with its scolds and scandal mongers the first cannot cease from plaguing themselves and everybody about them with their senseless clamor because the rage of words has become by habit and indulgence a thirst a fever on their parched tongue and the others continue to make enemies by some smart hit or sly insinuation at every third word they speak because with every new enemy there is an additional sense of power one man will sooner part with his friend than his joke because the stimulus of saying a good thing is irritated instead of being repressed by the fear of giving offence and by the imprudence or unfairness of the remark malice often takes the garb of truth we find a set of persons who pride themselves on being plain spoken people that is who blurt out everything disagreeable to your face by way of wounding your feelings and relieving their own and this they call honesty even among philosophers we may have noticed those who are not contented to inform the understandings of their readers unless they can shock their prejudices and among poets those who tamper with the rotten parts of their subject adding to their fancied pretensions by trampling on the sense of shame there are rigid reasoners who will not be turned aside from following up a logical argument by any regard to consequences or the compunctious visitings of nature such is their love of truth i never knew one of these scrupulous and hard-mouthed logicians who would not falsify the facts and distort the inference in order to arrive at a distressing and repulsive conclusion such is the fascination of what releases our own will from thraldom and compels that of others reluctantly to submit to terms of our dictating we feel our own power and disregard their weakness and effeminacy with prodigious self-complacency lord clive when a boy saw a butcher passing with a calf in a cart a companion whom he had with him said i should not like to be that butcher i should not like to be that calf replied the future governor of india laughing at all sympathy but that with his own sufferings the wicked lord lyttelton as he was called dreamt a little before his death that he was confined in a huge subterranean vault the inside of this round globe where as far as the eye could see he could discern no living object till at last he saw a female figure coming towards him and who should it turn out to be but mother brownrig whom of all people he most hated that was the very reason why he dreamt of her you ask her crime why she whipped two prentices to death and hid them in the coal hole i do not know that hers is exactly a case in point but i conceive that in the well-known catastrophe here alluded to words led to blows bad usage brought on worse from mere irritation and opposition and that probably even remorse and pity urged on to aggravated acts of cruelty and depression as the only means of drowning reflection on the past in the fury of present passion i believe that poetry of the anti jacobin remorse for past offences has sometimes made the greatest criminals as the being unable to appease a wounded conscience renders men desperate and if i hear a person express great impatience and uneasiness at some error that he is liable to i am tolerably sure that the conflict will end in a repetition of the offence if a man who got drunk overnight repents bitterly the next morning he will get drunk again at night for both in his repentance and his self-gratification he is led away by the feeling of the moment but this is not wickedness but despondency and want of strength of mind and i only attribute wickedness to those who carry their wills in their hands 
and who wantonly and deliberately suffer them to tyrannize over conscience, reason, and humanity, and who even draw an additional triumph from this degrading conquest. The wars, persecutions, and bloodshed occasioned by religion have generally turned on the most trifling differences in forms and ceremonies, which shows that it was not the vital interests of the questions that were at stake, but that these were made a handle and pretext to exercise cruelty and tyranny on the score of the most trivial and doubtful points of faith. There seems to be a love of absurdity and falsehood as well as mischief in the human mind, and the most ridiculous as well as barbarous superstitions have on this account been the most acceptable to it. A lie is welcome to it, for it is, as it were, its own offspring, and it likes to believe, as well as act, whatever it pleases, and in the pure spirit of contradiction. The old idolatry took vast hold of the earliest ages, for to believe that a piece of painted stone or wood was a god, in the teeth of the fact, was a fine exercise of the imagination. The modern fanaticism thrives in proportion to the quantity of contradictions and nonsense it pours down the throats of the gaping multitude, and the jargon and mysticism it offers to their wonder and credulity. Credo quia impossible is the standing motto of bigotry and superstition. That is, I believe because to do so is a favorite act of the will, and to do so in defiance of common sense and reason enhances the pleasure and the merit tenfold of this indulgence of blind faith and headstrong imagination. Methodism in particular, which at once absolves the understanding from the rules of reasoning and the conscience from the restraints of morality, throwing the whole responsibility upon a vicarious righteousness and an abstract belief, must besides its rant its vulgarity and its amatory style have a double charm both for saints and sinners i have also observed a sort of fatuity an indolence or indocility of the will to circumstances which i think has a considerable share in the common affairs of life i would willingly compound for all the mischiefs that are done me voluntarily if I could escape those which are done me without any motive at all, or even with the best intentions. For instance, if I go to a distance where I am anxious to receive an answer to my letters, I am sure to be kept in suspense. My friends are aware of this, as also of my impatience and irritability, and they cannot prevail on themselves to put an end to this dramatic situation of the parties. There is pleasure, an innocent and well-meaning one, in keeping a friend in suspense, in not putting oneself out of one's way for his ill-humors and apprehensions, though one would not for the world do him a serious injury, as there is in dangling the finny prey at the end of a hook, or in twirling round a cockchafer after sticking a pin through him at the end of a string. There is no malice in the case, no deliberate cruelty, but the buzzing noise and the secret consciousness of superiority to any annoyance or inconvenience ourselves lull the mind into a delightful state of listless torpor and indifference. If a letter requires an immediate answer, send it by a private hand to save postage. If our messenger falls sick or breaks a leg and begs us to forward it by some other means, return it to him again and insist on its being conveyed according to its first destination. His cure may be slow but sure. In the meantime our friend can wait. We have done our duty in writing the letter and are in no hurry to receive it. We know the contents and they are matters of perfect indifference to us. No harm is meant by all this but a great deal of mischief may accrue. There is, in short, a sluggishness and untractableness about the will that does not easily put itself in the situation of others, and that consults its own bias best by giving itself no trouble about them. Human life is so far a game of cross-purposes. If we wish a thing to be kept secret, it is sure to transpire. If we wish it to be known, not a syllable is breathed about it. 
This is not meant, but it happens so from mere simplicity and thoughtlessness. No one has ever yet seen through all the intricate folds and delicate involutions of our self-love, which is wrapped up in a set of smooth, flimsy pretexts like some precious jewel in covers of silver paper. End of section 41section forty two of the plain speaker this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the plain speaker opinions on books men and things by william hazlitt section forty two on depth and superficiality I proceed to say something of the words false and true as applied to moral feelings. It may be argued that this is a distinction without a difference, for that is feelings only exist by being felt, wherever and in so far as they exist, they must be true, and that there can be no falsehood or deception in the question. The distinction between true and false pleasure, between real and seeming good, would be thus done away with, for the reality and the appearance are here the same, and this would be the case if our sensations were simple and detached, and one had no influence on another, but it is in their secret and close dependence one on another that the distinction here spoken of takes its rise. That then is true or pure pleasure that has no alloy or drawback in some other consideration that is free from remorse and alarm and that will bear the soberest reflection because there is nothing that upon examination can be found acting indirectly to check and throw a damp upon it on the other hand we justly call those pleasures false and hollow not merely which are momentary and ready to elude our grasp, but which even at the time are accompanied with such a consciousness of other circumstances as must embitter and undermine them. For instance, putting morality quite out of the question, is there not an undeniable and wide difference between the gaiety and animal spirits of one who indulges in a drunken debauch to celebrate some unexpected stroke of good fortune? and his who does the same thing to drown care for the loss of all he is worth the outward objects the immediate and more obvious sensations are perhaps very much the same in the latter case as in the former the rich viands the sparkling wines the social merriment the wit the loud laughter and the maddening brain but the still small voice is wanting there is a reflection at bottom that however stifled and kept down poisons and spoils all even by the violent effort to keep it from intruding the mirth in the one case is forced in the other is natural the one reveller is we all know by experience a gay laughing wretch the other a happy man i profess to speak of human nature as i find it and the circumstances that any distinction I can make may be favorable to the theories of virtue will not prevent me from setting it down from the fear of being charged with cant and prejudice. Even in a case less palpable than the one supposed where some sweet oblivious antidote has been applied to the mind and is lulled to temporary forgetfulness of its immediate cause of sorrow, does it therefore cease to gnaw the heart by stealth? Are no traces of it left in the careworn brow or face? Is the state of mind the same as it was? Or is there the same buoyancy, freedom, and erectness of spirit as in more prosperous circumstances? On the contrary, it is torpid, vexed, and sad, enfeebled or harassed, and weighed down by the corroding pressure of care whether it thinks of it or not the pulse beats slow and languid the eye is dead no object strikes us with the same alacrity 
the avenues to joy or content are shut and life becomes a burden and a perplexing mystery even in sleep we are haunted with the broken images of distress or the mockery of bliss and we in vain try to still the idle tumult of the heart the constantly tampering with the truth the putting off the day of reckoning the fear of looking our situation in the face gives the mind a wandering and unsettled turn makes our waking thoughts a troubled dream or sometimes ends in madness without any violent paroxysm without any severe pang without any overt act but from that silent operation of the mind which preys internally upon itself and works the decay of its powers the more fatally because we dare not give it open and avowed scope do we not in case of any untoward accident or event know when we wake in the morning that something is the matter before we recollect what it is the mind no more recovers its confidence and serenity after a staggering blow than the haggard cheek and sleepless eye their color and vivacity because we do not see them in the glass is it to be supposed that there is not a firm and healthy tone of the mind as well as of the body or that when this has been deranged we do not feel pain lassitude and fretful impatience though the local cause or impression may have been withdrawn is the state of the mind or of the nervous system and its disposition or indisposition to receive certain impressions from the remains of others still vibrating on it nothing shall we say that the laugh of a madman is sincere or that the wit we utter in our dreams is sterling we often feel uneasy at something without being able to tell why or attribute it to a wrong cause our unconscious impressions necessarily give a color to and react upon our conscious ones and it is only when these two sets of feeling are in accord that our pleasures are true and sincere where there is a discordance and misunderstanding in this respect they are said not absurdly as it is pretended to be false and hollow there is then a serenity of virtue a peace of conscience a confidence in success and the pride of intellect which subsist and are a strong source of satisfaction independently of outward and immediate objects as the general health of the body gives a glow and animation to the whole frame notwithstanding a scratch we may have received in our little finger and certainly very different from a state of sickness and infirmity the difficulty is not so much in supposing one mental cause or phenomenon to be affected and imperceptibly molded by another as in setting limits to the everlasting ramifications of our impressions and in defining the obscure and intricate ways in which they communicate together suppose a man to labor under an habitual indigestion does it not oppress the very sun in the sky beat down all his powers of enjoyment and imprison all his faculties in a living tomb yet he perhaps long labored under this disease and felt its withering effects before he was aware of the cause it was not the less real on this account nor did it interfere the less with the sincerity of his other pleasures tarnish the face of nature and throw a gloom over everything he was hurt and knew it not let the pressure be removed and he breathes freely again his spirits run with a livelier current and he greets nature with smiles yet the change is in him not in her do we not pass the same scenery that we have visited but a little before and wonder that no object appears the same because we have some secret cause of dissatisfaction let anyone feel the force of disappointed affection and he may forget and scorn his error laugh and be gay to all outward appearance but the heart is not the less seared and blighted ever after the splendid banquet does not supply the loss of appetite 
nor the spotless ermine cure the itching palm, nor gold nor jewels redeem a lost name, nor pleasure fill up the void of affection, nor passion stifle conscience. Moralists and divines say true when they talk of the unquenchable fire and the worm that dies not. The human soul is not an invention of priests, whatever fables they have engrafted on it, nor is there an end of all our natural sentiments, because French philosophers have not been able to account for them. Hume, I think, somewhere contends that all satisfactions are equal, because the cup can be no more than full. But surely, though this is the case, one cup holds more than another. As to mere negative satisfaction, the argument may be true, but as to positive satisfaction or enjoyment, I see no more how this must be equal than how the heat of a furnace must in all cases be equally intense. Thus, for instance, there are many things with which we are contented, so as not to feel an uneasy desire after more, but yet we have a much higher relish of others. We may eat a mutton chop without complaining, though we should consider a haunch of venison as a greater luxury if we had it. Again, in travelling abroad, the mind acquires a restless and vagabond habit. There is more of hurry and novelty, but less of our sincerity, and certainly in our pursuits, than at home. We snatch hasty glances of a great variety of things, but want some central point of view. After making the grand tour, and seeing the finest sights in the world, we are glad to come back at last to our native place and our own fireside. Our associations with it are the most steadfast and habitual. We there feel most at home and at our ease. We have a resting place for the sole of our foot. The flutter of hope, anxiety, and disappointment is at an end, and whatever our satisfactions may be, we feel most confidence in them, and have the strongest conviction of their truth and reality. There is then a true and a false, or spurious, in sentiment as well as in reasoning, and I hope the train of thought I have here gone into may serve in some respects as a clue to explain it. The hardest question remains behind. What is depth, and what is superficiality? It is easy to answer that the one is what is obvious, familiar, and lies on the surface, and that the other is recondite and hid at the bottom of a subject. The difficulty recurs. What is meant by lying on the surface or being concealed below it in moral and metaphysical questions? Let us try for an analogy. Depth consists, then, in tracing any number of particular effects to a general principle, or in distinguishing an unknown cause from the individual and varying circumstances with which it is implicated, and under which it lurks unsuspected. It is, in fact, resolving the concrete into the abstract. Now this is a task of difficulty, not only because the abstract naturally merges in the concrete, and we do not well know how to set about separating what is this jumbled or cemented together in a single object, and presented under a common aspect, but being scattered over a larger surface, and collected from a number of undefined sources, there must be a strong feeling of its weight and pressure, in order to dislocate it from the object and bind it into a principle. The impression of an abstract principle is faint and doubtful in each individual instance. It becomes powerful and certain only by the repetition of the experiment and by adding the last results to our first hazardous conjectures. We thus gain a distinct hold or clue to the demonstration, when a number of vague and imperfect reminiscences are united and drawn out together by tenaciousness of memory and conscious feeling in one continued act, so that the depth of the understanding or reasoning in such cases may be explained to mean that there is a pile of implicit distinctions analyzed from a great variety of facts and observations, each supporting the other, 
and that the mind, instead of being led away by the last or first object or detached view of the subject that occurs, connects all these into a whole from the top to the bottom, and by its intimate sympathy with the most obscure and random impressions that tend to the same result, evolves a principle of abstract truth. Two circumstances are combined in a particular object to produce a given effect. How shall I know which is the true cause? But by finding it in another instance. But the same effect is produced in a third object which is without the concomitant circumstance of the first or second case. I must then look out for some other latent cause in the rabble of contradictory pretensions huddled together which I had not noticed before and to which I am eventually led by finding a necessity for it. But if my memory fails me, or I do not seize on the true character of different feelings, I shall make little progress or be quite thrown out in my reckoning, insomuch that according to the general diffusion of any element of thought or feeling, and its floating through the mixed mass of human affairs, do we stand in need of a greater quantity of that refined experience I have spoken of, and of a quicker and firmer tact in connecting or distinguishing its results. However, I must make a reservation here. Both knowledge and sagacity are required, but sagacity abridges and anticipates the labor of knowledge, and sometimes jumps instinctively at a conclusion. That is, the strength or fineness of the feeling by association or analogy sooner elicits the recollection of a previous and forgotten one in different circumstances, and the two together, by a sort of internal evidence and collective force, stamp any proposed solution with a character of truth or falsehood. Original strength of impression is often, in usual questions at least, a substitute for accumulated weight of experience, and intensity of feeling is so far synonymous with depth of understanding. It is that which here gives us a contentious and palpable consciousness of whatever affects it in the smallest or remotest manner, and leaves to us the hidden springs of thought and action through our sensibility and jealousy of whatever touches them. To give an illustration or two of this very abstruse subject, elegance is a word that means something different from ease, grace, beauty, dignity, yet it is akin to all these but it seems more particularly to imply a sparkling brilliancy of effect, with finish and precision. We do not apply the term to great things. We should not call an epic poem or a head of Jupiter elegant, but we speak of an elegant copy of verses, an elegant headdress, an elegant fan, an elegant diamond brooch or bunch of flowers. In all of these cases and others, where the same epithet is used, there is something little and comparatively trifling in the objects and the interests they inspire. So far, I have dealt chiefly in examples, conjectures, and negatives. But this is far from a definition. I think I know what personal beauty is, because I can say in one word what I mean by it. Harmony of form. And this idea seems to me to answer to all the eases to which the term personal beauty is ever applied. Let us see if we cannot come to something equally definitive with respect to the other phrase. Sparkling effect, finish, and precision are characteristic, as I think, of elegance, but as yet I see no reason why they should be so any more than why blue, red, and yellow should form the colors of the rainbow. I want a common idea as a link to connect them, or to serve as a substratum for the others. Now suppose I say that elegance is beauty, or at least the pleasurable in little things. We then have a ground to rest upon at once. For elegance being beauty or pleasure in little or slight impressions, precision, finish, and polished smoothness follow from this definition as matters of course. In other words, for a thing that is little to be beautiful, 
or at any rate to please, it must have precision of outline, which in larger masses and gigantic forms is not so indispensable. In what is small, the parts must be finished, or they will offend. Lastly, in what is momentary and evanescent, as in dress, fashions, etc., there must be a glossy and sparkling effect, for brilliancy is the only virtue of novelty, that is to say, by getting the primary conditions of essential qualities of elegance in all circumstances whatever, we see how these branch off into minor divisions in relation to form, details, color, surface, etc., and rise from a common ground of abstraction into all the variety of consequences and examples. The Hercules is not elegant. The Venus is simply beautiful. The French, whose ideas of beauty or grandeur never amount to more than an elegance, have no relish for Rubens, nor will they understand this definition. When Sir Isaac Newton saw the apple fall, it was a very simple and common observation, but it suggested to his mind the law that holds the universe together. What then was the process in this case? In general, when we see anything fall, we have the idea of a particular direction, of up and down, associated with a notion by invariable and everyday experience. The earth is always, as we conceive, under our feet, and the sky above our heads, so that according to this local and habitual feeling, all heavy bodies must everlastingly fall in the same direction, downward, or parallel to the upright position of our bodies. Sir Isaac Newton, by a bare effort of abstraction, or by a grasp of mind, comprehending all the possible relations of things, got rid of this prejudice, turned the world as it were on its back, and saw the apple fall not downwards, but simply towards the earth, so that it would fall upwards on the same principle if the earth were above it, or towards it, at any rate, in whatever direction it lay. This highly abstracted view of the case answer to all the phenomena of nature, and no other did, and this view he arrived at by a vast power of comprehension, retaining and reducing the contradictory phenomena of the universe under one law, and counteracting and banishing from his mind that almost invincible and instinctive association of up and down as it relates to the position of our own bodies and the gravitation of all others to the earth in the same direction. From a circumscribed and partial view, we make that which is general particular. The great mathematician here spoken of, from a wide and comprehensive one, made it general again, or he perceived the essential condition or cause of a general effect, and that which acts indispensably in all circumstances, separate from other accidental and arbitrary ones. I lately heard an anecdote related of an American lady, one of two sisters, who married young and well, and had several children. Her sister, however, was married soon after herself to a richer husband, and had a larger, if not finer, family. And after passing several years of constant repining and wretchedness, she died at length of pure envy. The circumstance was well known and generally talked of. Someone said on hearing this that it was a thing that could only happen in America, that it was a trait of the republican character and institutions where alone the principle of mutual jealousy, having no high and distant objects to fix upon, and diverted from immediate and private mortifications, seized upon the happiness or outward advantages even of the nearest connections as its natural food, and having them constantly before its eyes, gnawed itself to death upon them. I assented to this remark, and I confess it struck me as showing a deep insight into human nature. Here was a sister envying a sister, and that not for objects that provoke strong passion, but for common and contentional advantages 
till it ends in her death. They were also represented as good and respectable people. How then is this extraordinary development of an ordinary human frailty to be accounted for? From the particular circumstances, these were the country and state of society. It was in America that it happened. The democratic level, the flatness of imagery, the absence of those towering and artificial heights that in old and monarchical states act as conductors to attract and carry off the splenetic humors and run curious hostilities of a whole people and to make common and petty advantages sink into perfect insignificance were full in the mind of the person who suggested the solution and in this dearth of every other mark or vent for it it was felt intuitively that the natural spirit of envy and discontent would fasten upon those that were next to it and whose advantages there being no great difference in point of elevation would gall in proportion to their proximity and repeated recurrence the remote and exalted advantages of birth and station in countries where the social fabric is constructed of lofty and unequal materials necessarily carry the mind out of its immediate and domestic circle whereas take away those objects of imaginary spleen and moody speculation and they leave as the inevitable alternative the envy and hatred of our friends and neighbors at every advantage we possess as so many eyesores and stumbling blocks in their way where these selfish principles have not been curbed or given way altogether to charity and benevolence the fact as stated in itself is an anomaly as thus explained by combining it with a general state of feeling in a country it seems to point out a great principle in society now this solution would have been attained but for the deep impression which the operation of certain general causes of moral character had recently made and the quickness with which the consequence of its removal were felt i might give other instances but these will be sufficient to explain the argument or set others upon elucidating it more clearly acuteness is depth or sagacity in connecting of individual effects with individual causes or vice versa as in stratagems of war policy and the knowledge of character and the world comprehension is the power of combining in vast number of particulars in some one view as in mechanics or the game of chess but without referring them to any abstract or general principle a commonplace differs from an abstract discourse in this that it is trite and vague instead of being new and profound it is a commonplace at present to say that heavy bodies fall by attraction it would always have been one to say that this falling is the effect of a law of nature or the will of god this is assigning a general but not adequate cause the depth of passion is where it takes hold of two circumstances too remote or indifferent for notice from the force of association or analogy and turns the current of other passions by its own dramatic power in the depth of the knowledge of the human heart is chiefly shown in tracing this effect for instance the fondness displayed by a mistress for a lover as she is about to desert him for a rival is not mere hypocrisy or art to deceive him but nature or the reaction of her pity or parting tenderness toward a person she is about to injure but does not absolutely hate shakespeare is the only dramatic author who has laid open this reaction or involution of the passions in a manner worth speaking of the rest are commonplace declaimers and may be very fine poets but not deep philosophers there is a depth even in superficiality that is the affections cling round obvious and familiar objects not recondite and remote ones and the intense continuity of feeling thus obtained forms the depth of sentiment 
it is that that redeems poetry and romance from the charge of superficiality the habitual impressions of things are as to feeling the most refined ones the painter also in his mind's eye penetrates beyond the surface or husk of the object and sees into the labyrinth of forms an abyss of color my head has grown giddy in following the windings of the drawing in raphael and i have gazed on the breath of titian where infinite imperceptible gradations were blended in a common mass as into a dazzling mirror this idea is more easily transferred to rembrandt's chiara scura where the greatest clearness and the nicest distinctions are observed in the midst of obscurity in a word i suspect depth to be that strength and at the same time subtlety of impression which will not suffer the slightest indication of thought or feeling to be lost and gives warning of them over whatever extent of surface they are diffused or under whatever disguises of circumstances they lurk End of chapter 42section 43 of the plain speaker this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by martin geeson the plain speaker opinions on books men and things by william hazlitt section 43 on respectable people there is not any term that is oftener misapplied or that is a stronger instance of the abuse of language than this same word respectable by a respectable man is generally meant a person whom there is no reason for respecting or none that we choose to name for if there is any good reason for the opinion we wish to express we naturally assign it as the ground of his respectability if the person whom you are desirous to characterize favorably is distinguished for his good nature you say that he is a good-natured man if by his zeal to serve his friends you call him a friendly man if by his wit or sense you say that he is witty or sensible if by his honesty or learning you say so at once but if he is none of these and there is no one quality which you can bring forward to justify the high opinion you would be thought to entertain of him you then take the question for granted and jump at a conclusion by observing gravely that he is a very respectable man it is clear indeed that where we have any striking and generally admitted reasons for respecting a man the most obvious way to ensure the respect of others will be to mention his estimable qualities where these are wanting the wisest course must be to say nothing about them but to insist on the general inference which we have our particular reasons for drawing only vouching for its authenticity if for instance the only motive we have for thinking or speaking well of another is that he gives us good dinners as this is not a valid reason to those who do not like us partake of his hospitality we may without going into particulars content ourselves with assuring them that he is a most respectable man if he is a slave to those above him and an oppressor of those below him but sometimes makes us the channels of his bounty or the tools of caprice it will be as well to say nothing of the matter but to confine ourselves to the safer generality that he is a person of the highest respectability 
if he is a low dirty fellow who has amassed an immense fortune which he does not know what to do with the possession of it alone will guarantee his respectability if we say nothing of the manner in which he has come by it or in which he spends it a man may be a knave or a fool or both as it may happen and yet be a most respectable man in the common and authorised sense of the term provided he saves appearances and does not give common fame a handle for no longer keeping up the imposture the best title to the character of respectability lies in the convenience of those who echo the cheat and in the conventional hypocrisy of the world any one may lay claim to it who is willing to give himself airs of importance and can find means to divert others from inquiring too strictly into his pretensions it is a disposable commodity not a part of the man that sticks to him like his skin but an appurtenance like his goods and chattels it is meat drink and clothing to those who take the benefit of it by allowing others the credit it is the current coin the circulating medium in which the factitious intercourse of the world is carried on the bribe which interest pays to vanity respectability includes all that vague and undefinable mass of respect floating in the world which arises from sinister motives in the person who pays it and is offered to adventitious and doubtful qualities in the person who receives it it is spurious and nominal hollow and venal to suppose that it is to be taken literally or applied to sterling merit would betray the greatest ignorance of the customary use of speech when we hear the word coupled with the name of any individual it would argue a degree of romantic simplicity to imagine that it implies any one quality of head or heart any one excellence of body or mind any one good action or praiseworthy sentiment but as soon as it is mentioned it conjures up the ideas of a handsome house with large acres round it a sumptuous table a cellar well stocked with excellent wines splendid furniture a fashionable equipage with a long list of elegant contingencies it is not what a man is but what he has that we speak of in the significant use of this term he may be the poorest creature in the world himself but if he is well to do and can spare some of his superfluities if he can lend us his purse or his countenance upon occasion he then buys golden opinions of us it is but fit that we should speak well of the bridge that carries us over and in return for what we can get from him we embody our servile gratitude hopes and fears in this word respectability by it we pamper his pride and feed our own necessities it must needs be a very honest uncorrupted word that is the go-between in this disinterested kind of traffic we do not think of applying this word to a great poet or a great painter to the man of genius or the man of virtue for it is seldom we can sponge upon them it would be a solecism for any one to pretend to the character who has a shabby coat to his back who goes without a dinner or has not a good house over his head he who has reduced himself in the world by devoting himself to a particular study or adhering to a particular cause occasions only a smile of pity or a shrug of contempt at the mention of his name while he who has raised himself in it by a different course 
who has become rich for want of ideas and powerful from want of principle is looked up to with silent homage and passes for a respectable man the learned pate ducks to the golden fool we spurn at virtue and genius in rags and lick the dust in the presence of vice and folly in purple when otway was left to starve after having produced venice preserved there was nothing in the frenzied action with which he devoured the food that choked him to provoke the respect of the mob who would have hooted at him the more for knowing that he was a poet spencer kept waiting for the hundred pounds which burley grudged him for a song might feel the mortification of his situation but the statesman never felt any diminution of his sovereign's regard in consequence of it charles the second's neglect of his favourite poet butler did not make him look less gracious in the eyes of his courtiers or of the wits and critics of the time burns's embarrassments and the temptations to which he was exposed by his situation degraded him but left no stigma on his patrons who still meet to celebrate his memory and consult about his monument in the face of day to enrich the mind of a country by works of art or science and leave yourself poor is not the way for any one to rank as respectable at least in his lifetime to oppress to enslave to cheat and plunder it is a much better way the time gives evidence of it but the instances are common respectability means a man's situation and success in life not his character or conduct the city merchant never loses his respectability till he becomes a bankrupt after that we hear no more of it or him the justice of the peace and the parson of the parish the lord and the squire are allowed by immemorial usage to be very respectable people though no one ever thinks of asking why they are a sort of fixtures in this way to take an example from one of them the country parson may pass his whole time when he is not employed in the cure of souls in nattering his rich neighbours and leaguing with them to snub his poor ones in seizing poachers and encouraging informers he may be exorbitant in exacting his tithes harsh to his servants the dread and byword of the village where he resides and yet all this though it may be notorious shall abate nothing of his respectability it will not hinder his patron from giving him another living to play the petty tyrant in or prevent him from riding over to the squires in his carriage and being well received or from sitting on the bench of justices with due decorum and with clerical dignity the poor curate in the meantime who may be a real comfort to the bodies and minds of his parishioners Will be passed by without notice parson adams drinking ale in sir thomas booby's kitchen makes no very respectable figure but sir thomas himself was right worshipful and his widow a person of honour a few such historiographers as fielding would put an end to the farce of respectability with several others like it peter pounce in the same author was a consummation of this character translated into the most vulgar english the character of captain bliffill his epitaph and funeral sermon are worth tomes of casuistry and patched-up theories of moral sentiments 
pope somewhere exclaims in his fine indignant way what can ennoble sots or knaves or cowards alas not all the blood of all the howards but this is the heraldry of poets not of the world in fact the only way for a poet nowadays to emerge from the obscurity of poverty and genius is to prostitute his pen turn literary pimp to some borough-mongering lord canvass for him at elections and by this means aspire to the same importance and be admitted on the same respectable footing with him as his valet his steward or his practising attorney a jew a stock jobber a war contractor a successful monopolist a nabob an india director or an african slave dealer are all very respectable people in their turn a member of parliament is not only respectable but honourable all honourable men yet this circumstance which implies such a world of respect really means nothing to say of any one that he is a member of parliament is to say at the same time that he is not at all distinguished as such nobody ever thought of telling you that mr fox or mr pitt were members of parliament such is the constant difference between names and things the most mischievous and offensive use of this word has been in politics by respectable people in the fashionable cant of the day are meant those who have not a particle of regard for any one but themselves who have feathered their own nests and only want to lie snug and warm in them they have been set up and appealed to as the only friends of their country and the constitution while in truth they were friends to nothing but their own interest with them all is well if they are well off they are raised by their lucky stars above the reach of the distresses of the community and are cut off by their situation and sentiments from any sympathy with their kind they would see their country ruined before they would part with the least of their superfluities pampered in luxury and their own selfish comforts they are proof against the calls of patriotism and the cries of humanity they would not get a scratch with a pin to save the universe they are more affected by the overturning of a plate of turtle soup than by the starving of a whole county the most desperate characters picked from the most necessitous and depraved classes are not worse judges of politics than your true staunch thorough-paced lives and fortunes men who have what is called a stake in the country and see everything through the medium of their cowardly and unprincipled hopes and fears london is perhaps the only place in which the standard of respectability at all varies from the standard of money there things go as much by appearance as by weight and he may be said to be a respectable man who cuts a certain figure in company by being dressed in the fashion and venting a number of commonplace things with tolerable grace and fluency if a person there brings a certain share of information and good manners into mixed society it is not asked when he leaves it whether he is rich or not lords and fiddlers authors and common council men editors of newspapers and parliamentary speakers meet together and the difference is not so much marked as one would suppose 
to be an edinburgh reviewer is i suspect the highest rank in modern literary society end of section 43 recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey Section 44 of The Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Plain Speaker Opinions on Books, Men, and Things by William Hazlitt. Section 44 On the Jealousy and the Spleen of Party. Part 1. Mary, this is a milking melico. It means mischief. Hamlet. I was sorry to find the other day, on coming to Vivy, and looking into some English books at a library there, that Mr. Moore had taken an opportunity, in his Rhyme on the Road, of abusing Madame Warren's, Rousseau, and men of genius in general. It's an ill bird, as the proverb says. This appears to me, I confess, to be pick-thank work, as needless as it is ill-timed, and considering from whom it comes particularly unpleasant. In conclusion, he thanks God with the Levite, that he is not one of those, and would rather be anything, a worm, the meanest thing that crawls, than numbered among those who give light and law to the world by an excess of fancy and intellect. Footnote. Out on the craft I'd rather be one of those hinds that round me tread with just enough sense to see the noonday sun that's o'er my head, than thus with high-built genius curse that hath no heart for its foundation, be all at once that's brightest, worst, sublimest, meanest in creation. Rhymes on the Road. End of footnote. Perhaps posterity may take him at his word, and no more trace be found of his rhymes upon the onward tide of time than of the snowfall in the river a moment white then melts forever. It might be some increasing consciousness of the frail tenure by which he holds his rank among the great heirs of fame that urged our bard to pawn his reversion of immortality for an indulgent smile of patrician approbation as he raised his puny arm against the mighty dead to lower by a flourish of his pen the aristocracy of letters nearer to the level of the aristocracy of rank two ideas that keep up a perpetual seesaw in mr moore's mind like buckets in a well and to which he is already ready to lend a helping hand according as he is likely to be hoisted up or in danger of being let down with either of them the mode in which our author proposes to correct the extravagance of public opinion and qualify the interest taken in such persons as rousseau and madame de warrens is singular enough and savours of the late unlucky bias of his mind it is by referring us to what the well-bred people in the neighbourhood thought of rousseau and his pretensions a hundred years ago or thereabouts so shall their anticipation prevent our discovery and doubtless among the grave and good and gentle of their neighbourhood if known at all they were but known as strange low people low and bad madame herself to footman prone and her young pauper all but mad this is one way of reversing the judgment of posterity and setting aside the ex post facto evidence of taste and genius so after all that's come and gone yet after the anxious doubts and misgivings of his mind as to his own destiny after all the pains he took to form himself in solitude and obscurity after the slow dawn of his faculties and their final explosion that like an eruption of another vesuvius dazzling all men with its light and leaving the burning lava behind it shook public opinion and overturned a kingdom after having been the gaze and show of the time after having been read by all the classes criticized condemned admired in every corner of europe after bequeathing a name that at the end of half a century is never repeated but with emotion as another name for genius and misfortune, after having given us an interest in his feelings as in our own, and drawn the veil of lofty imagination or of pensive regret over all that relates to his own being, so that we go a pilgrimage to the places where he lived, and recall the names he loved with tender affection, worshipping at the shrines where his fires were first kindled, and where the purple light of love still lingers, Elysian beauty, melancholy grace, after all this and more, instead of taking the opinion which one half the world have formed of Rousseau with eager emulation, and the other have been forced to admit in spite of themselves, we are to be sent back by Mr. Moore's eavesdropping muse to what the people in the neighbourhood thought of him, if ever they thought of him at all, before he had shown any one proof of what he was, as the fairer test of truth and candour, and as coming nearer to the standard of greatness, that is, of something asked to dine out, existing in the author's own mind. 
This, this is the unkindest cut of all. Mr. Moore takes the inference which he chooses to attribute to the neighboring gentry concerning the pauper lad, namely, that he was mad because he was poor, and flings it to the passengers out of a landau and four as the true version of his character by the fashionable and local authorities of the time. He need not have gone out of his way to Charmette merely to drag the reputation of Jean-Jacques and his mistress after him, chained to the car of aristocracy, as people low and bad, on the strength of his enervated sympathy with the genteel conjectures of the day as to what and who they were. We have better and more authentic evidence. What would he say if this method of neutralizing the voice of the public were applied to himself, or to his friend Mr. Chantry? If we were to deny that the one ever rode in an open carriage tete a tete with a lord because his father stood behind a counter or were to ask the sculptor's customers when he drove a milk cart what are we to think of his bust of sir walter it will never do it is the peculiar hardship of genius not to be recognized with the first breath it draws often not to be admitted even during its lifetime to make its way slow and late through good report and evil report through clouds of detraction of envy and lies to have to contend with the injustice of fortune, with the prejudices of the world. Rash judgments and the sneers of selfish men, to be shamed by personal defects, to pine in obscurity, to be the butt of pride, the just of fools, the byword of ignorance and malice, to carry on a ceaseless warfare between the consciousness of inward worth and the slights and neglect of others, and to hope only for its reward in the grave and in the undying voice of fame and when, as in the present instance, that end has been marvellously attained and a final sentence has been passed, would any one but Mr. Moore wish to shrink from it, to revive the injustice of fortune and the world, and to abide by the idle conjectures of a fashionable coterie empanelled on the spot, who would come to the same shallow conclusion whether the individual in question were an idiot or a god? There is a degree of gratuitous impertinence and frivolous servility in all this, not easily to be accounted for or forgiven. There is something more particularly offensive in the cant about people low and bad, applied to the intimacy between Rousseau and Madame Warrens, inasmuch as the volume containing this nice strain of morality is dedicated to Lord Byron, who was at that very time living on the very same sentimental terms with an Italian lady of rank, and whose memoirs Mr. Moore has since thought himself called upon to suppress, out of regard to his lordship's character, and to that of his friends, most of whom were not low people. Is it quality, not charity, that with Mr. Moore covers all sorts of slips? But tis the fall degrades her to a whore, let greatness own her, and she's mean no more. What also makes the dead set at the heroine of the confession seem the harder measure is that it is preceded by an effusion to Mary Magdalene in the devotional style of Madame Guillon, half amatory, half pious, but so tender and rapturous that it dissolves Canova's marble in tears and heaves a sigh from Guido's canvas. The melting pathos that trickles down one page is frozen up into the most rigid morality, and hangs like an icicle upon the next. Here Thomas Little smiles and weeps in ecstasy, there Thomas Brown, not the younger, but the elder, surely, frowns dip disapprobation and meditates his like. Why, it may be asked, does Mr. Moore's insect muse always hover round this alluring subject, now in glimmer and now in gloom, now basking in the warmth, now writhing with the smart, now licking his lips at it? now making wry faces, but always fidgeting and fluttering about the same gandy, luscious topic, either in flimsy raptures or trumpery horrors. I hate, for my own part, this alteration of meretricious rhapsodies and methodistical cant, though the one generally ends in the other. One would imagine that the author of Rhymes on the Road had lived too much in the world and understood the tone of good society too well to link the phrases people low and bad together as synonymous. But the crossing the Alps has, I believe, given some of our fashionables a shivering fit of morality, as the sight of Mont Blanc convinced our author of the being of a god. They are seized with an amiable horror and remorse for the vices of others, of course so much worse than their own, so that several of our blue stockings have got the blue devils, and Mr. Moore, as the squire of dames, chimes in with the cue that is given him. The panic, however, is not universal. He must have heard of the romping, the languishing, the masquerading, the intriguing, and the platonic attachments of English ladies of the highest quality and Italian opera singers. He must know what Italian manners are, what they were a hundred years ago, at Florence or at Turin, better than I can tell him. Not a word does he hint on the subject. 
No, the elevation and splendor of the examples dazzle him, the extent of the evil overpowers him, and he chooses to make Madame Warren's the scapegoat of his little budget of querulous casuistry, as if her errors and irregularities were to be set down to the account of the genius of Rousseau and of modern philosophy, instead of being the result of the example of the privileged class to which she belonged, and of the licentiousness of the age and country in which she lived. She appears to have been a handsome, well-bred, fascinating, condescending demirep of the day, like any of the author's fashionable acquaintances in the present, but the eloquence of her youthful protégé has embalmed her memory and thrown the illusion of fancied perfections and of hallowed regrets over her frailties, and it is this that Mr. Moore cannot excuse, and that draws down upon her his pointed hostility of attack and rouses all the venom of this moral indignation. Why does he not in like manner pick a quarrel with that celebrated monument in the Père Lachaise brought there from Paraclete's white walls and silver springs? Or why does he not leave a lampoon instead of an elegy on Laura's tomb? The reason is he dare not. The cant of morality is not here strong enough to stem the opposing current of the cant of sentiment, to which he by turns commits the success of his votive rhymes. Not content with stripping off the false colors from the frail fair, one of whose crimes it is not to have been young, the poet makes a swan-like end and falls foul of men of genius, fancy, and sentiment in general, as impostors and mountebanks, who feel the least themselves of what they describe and make others feel. I beg leave to enter my flat and peremptory protest against this view of the matter as an impossibility. I am not absolutely blind to the weak sides of authors, poets, and philosophers, for tis my vice to spy into abuses, but that they are not generally in earnest in what they write, that they are not the dupes of their own imagination and feelings, before they turn the heads of the world at large, is what I must utterly deny. So far from the likelihood of any such antipathy between their sentiments and their professions, from their being recreants to truth and nature, quite callous and insensible to what they make such a rout about, it is pretty certain that whatever they make others feel in any marked degree they must themselves feel first, and further they must have this feeling all their lives. It is not a fashion got up and put on for the occasion, it is the very condition and groundwork of their being. What the reader is and feels at the instant, that the author is and feels at all other times. It is stamped upon him at birth. It only quits him when he dies. His existence is intellectual, ideal. It is hard to say he takes no interest in what he is. His passion is beauty, his pursuit is truth. On whomsoever else these may sit light, to whomever else they may appear indifferent, whoever else may play at fast and loose with them, may laugh at or despise them, may take them up or lay them down as it suits their convenience or pleasure, it is not so with him. He cannot shake them off or play the hypocrite or renegade if he would. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? They are become a habit, a second nature to him. He is totus in illis. He has no other alternative or resource, and cannot do without them. The man of fashion may resolve to study as a condescension, the man of business as a relaxation, the idler to employ his time. But the poet is married to immortal verse, the philosopher to lasting truth. Whatever the reader thinks fine in books, and Mr. Moore acknowledges that fine and rare things are to be found there, assuredly existed before in the living volume of the author's brain, that which is a passing and casual impression in the one case, a floating image, an empty sound, is, in the other, an heirloom of the mind, the very form into which it is warped and moulded, a deep and inward harmony that flows on forever, as the springs of memory and imagination unlock their secret stores. Thoughts that glow and words that burn are his daily sustenance. He leads a spiritual life and walks with God. The personal is, as much as may be, lost in the universal. He is nature's high priest, and his mind is a temple where she treasures up her fairest and loftiest forms. These he broods over, till he becomes enamored of them, inspired by them, and communicates some portion of his ethereal fires to others. For these he has given up everything, wealth, pleasure, ease, health. And yet we are to be told he takes no interest in them, does not enter into the meaning of the words he uses, or feel the force of the ideas he imprints upon the brain of others. Let us give the devil his due. An author, I grant, may be deficient in dress or address, may neglect his person and his fortune, but his soul is fair, bright as the children of yon azure sheen. He may be full of inconsistencies elsewhere, but he is himself in his books." He may be ignorant of the world we live in, but that he is not at home and enchanted with that fairy world which hangs upon his pen, that he does not reign and revel in the creations of his own fancy, or tread with awe and delight 
the stately domes and empyrean palaces of eternal truth, the portals of which he opens to us, is what I cannot take Mr. Moore's word for. He does not give us reason with his rhyme. An author's appearance or his actions may not square with his theories or descriptions, but his mind is seen in his writings as his face is in the glass. All the faults of the literary character, in short, arise out of the predominance of the professional mania of such persons, and their absorption in those ideal studies and pursuits, their affected regard to which the poet tells us is a mere mockery, and a barefaced insult to people of plain, straightforward, practical sense and unadored pretensions like himself. Once more, I cannot believe it. I think that Milton did not dictate Paradise Lost by rote, as a mouthing player repeats his part, that Shakespeare worked himself up with a certain warmth to express the passion in Othello, that Stern had some affection for my uncle Toby, Rousseau a hankering after his dear Charmette, that Sir Isaac Newton really forgot his dinner in his fondness for flexions, and that Mr. Locke prosed in sober sadness about the malleability of gold. Further, I have no doubt that Mr. Moore himself is not an exception to this theory, that he has infinite satisfaction in those tinkling rhymes and those glittering conceits with which the world are so taken, and that he had very much the same sense of mawkish sentiment and flimsy reasoning in indicting the stanzas in question that many of his admirers must have experienced in reading them. In turning to the Castle of Indolence for the lines quoted a little way back, I chance to light upon another passage which I cannot help transcribing. I care not, Fortune, what you may deny. You cannot rob me of free nature's grace. You cannot shut the windows of the sky through which Aurora shows her brightening face. You cannot bar my constant feet to trace the woods and lawns by living stream at eve. Let health my nerves and finer fibres brace, and I their toys to the great children leave, of fancy, reason, virtue, naught can me bereave. Were the sentiments here so beautifully expressed mere affectation in Thompson? Or are we to make it a rule that as a writer imparts to us a sensation of disinterested delight, he himself has none of the feeling he excites in us? This is one way of showing our gratitude and being even with him, but perhaps Thompson's works may not come under the intention of Mr. Moore's strictures, as they were never, like Rousseau's, excluded from the libraries of English noblemen. Books, dreams, are each a world, and books we know are a substantial world, both pure and good round which, with tendrils strong as flesh and blood, our pastime and our happiness may grow. Let me then conjure the gentle reader who has ever felt an attachment to books, not hastily to divorce them from their authors. Whatever love or reverence may be due to the one is equally owing to the other. The volume we prize may be little old shabbily bound, an imperfect copy, does not step down from the shelf to give us our graceful welcome, nor can it extend a hand to serve us in extremity, and so far may be like the author, but whatever there is of truth or good, or of proud consolation, or of cheering hope in the one, all this existed in a greater degree in the imagination and the heart and the brain of the other. To cherish the work and damn the author is as if the traveller who slakes his thirst at the running stream should revile the spring-head from which it gushes. I do not speak of the degree of passion felt by Rousseau toward Madame Morin's, nor of his treatment of her, nor hers of him but that he thought of her for years with the tenderest yearnings of affection and regret, and felt towards her all that he has made his readers feel. This I cannot for a moment doubt. So far, then, he is no impostor or juggler. Still less could he have given a new and personal character to the literature of Europe, and changed the tone of sentiment and the face of society, if he had not felt the strongest interest in persons and things, or had been the heartless pretender he has sometimes held out to us. End of section 44。section 45 of the plain speaker。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org。the plain speaker。opinions on books men and things。by william hazlitt。section 45 。On the Jealousy and the Spleen of Party Part Two. The tone of politics and of public opinion has undergone a considerable and curious change even in the few short years I can remember. In my time, that is, in the early part of it, the love of liberty, at least by all those whom I came near, was regarded as the dictate of common sense and common honesty. 
It was not a question of depth or learning, but an instinctive feeling, prompted by a certain generous warmth of blood in every one worthy the name of Britain. A man would as soon avow himself to be a pimp or a pickpocket as a tool or a pander to corruption. This was the natural and at the same time the national feeling. Patriotism was not at variance with philanthropy. To take an interest in humanity, it was only thought necessary to have the form of a man. To espouse its cause, nothing was wanting but to be able to articulate the name. It was not inquired what coat a man wore, where he was born or bred, what his party or his profession, to qualify him to vote on this broad and vital question. To take his share in advancing it was the undisputed birthright of every man. No one was too high or too low, no one was too wise or too simple to join in the common cause. It would have been construed into lukewarmness and cowardice not to have done so. The voice, as of one crying in the wilderness, had gone forth. Peace on earth and good will towards men. The dawn of a new era was at hand. Might was no longer to lord it over right, opinion to march hand in hand with falsehood. The heart swelled at the mention of a public as of a private wrong. The brain teemed with projects for the benefit of mankind. History, philosophy, all well-intentioned and well-informed men agreed in the same conclusion. If a good one was to be done, let it. If a truth was to be told, let it. There could be no harm in that. It was only necessary to distinguish right from wrong, truth from lies, to know which we should give the preference. A rose was then doubly sweet. The notes of a thrush went to the heart. There was a witchery in the soft blue sky because we could feel and enjoy such things by the privilege of our common nature, not by the sufferance of supernal power, and because the common feelings of our nature were not trampled upon and sacrificed in scorn to show and external magnificence. Humanity was no longer to be crushed like a worm as it had hitherto been. Power was to be struck at wherever it had reared its serpent crest. It had already roamed too long unchecked. Kings and priests had played the game of violence and fraud for thousands of years into each other's hands, on pretenses that were now seen through, and were no farther feasible. The despot's crown appeared tarnished and blood-stained. The cowl of superstition fell off, that had been so often made a cloak for tyranny. The doctrine of the jus divinum squeaked and gibbered in our streets, ashamed to show its head. Holy oil had lost its efficacy, and was laughed at as an exploded mummery. Mr. Locke had long ago, in his Treatise of Government, written at the express desire of King William, settled the question as it affected our own revolution, and naturally every other, in favor of liberal principles as a part of the law of the land, and as identified with the existing succession. Blackstone and de Lome, the loudest panegyrists of the English Constitution, founded their praise on the greater alloy of liberty implied in it. Tyranny was on the wane, at least in theory public opinion might be said to rest on an inclined plane, tending more and more from the heights of arbitrary power and the individual pretension to the level of public good. And no man of common sense or reading would have had the face to object as a bar to the march of truth and freedom, the right divine of kings to govern wrong. No one had then dared to answer the claim of a whole nation to the choice of a free government with the impudent taunt, Your king is at hand. Mr. Burke had in vain sung his requiem over the age of chivalry. Mr. Pitt bowed out his speeches on the existence of social order to no purpose. Mr. Malthus had not cut up liberty by the roots by passing the grinding law of necessity over it, and entailing vice and misery on all future generations as their happiest lot. Mr. Ricardo had not pared down the schemes of visionary projectors and idle talkers into the form of rent. Mr. Southey had not surmounted his cap of liberty with the laurel wreath, nor Mr. Wordsworth proclaimed carnage as God's daughter nor Mr. Coleridge, to patch up a rotten cause, written the friend. Everything had not then been done, or had, like a devilish engine, back recoiled upon itself to stop the progress of truth, to stifle the voice of humanity, to break in pieces and defeat opinion by sophistry, calumny, intimidation, by tampering with the interests of the proud and selfish, the prejudices of the ignorant, the fears of the timid, the scruples of the good, and by resorting to every subterfuge which art could devise to perpetuate the abuses of power. Freedom then stood erect, crowned with orient light, with looks commercing with the skies. Since then she has fallen by the sword, and by slander, whose edge is sharper than the sword by her own headlong zeal or the watchful malice of her foes, and through that one unrelenting purpose in the hearts of sovereigns to baffle, degrade, and destroy the people whom they had hitherto considered as their property, and whom they now saw, oh, unheard of presumption, setting up a claim to be free. 
This claim has been once more set aside, annulled, overthrown, trampled upon with every mark of insult and ignominy, in word or deed, and the consequence has been that all those who had stood forward to advocate it have been hurled into the air with it, scattered, stunned, and have never yet recovered from their confusion and dismay. The shock was great as it was unexpected, the surprise extreme, liberty became a sort of byword, and such was the violence of party spirit and the desire to retaliate former indignities, that all those who had ever been attached to the fallen cause seemed to have suffered contamination and to labor under a stigma. The party, both of Whigs and Reformers, were left completely in the lurch, and what may appear extraordinary at first sight, instead of wishing to strengthen their cause, took every method to thin their ranks and make the terms of admission to them more difficult. In proportions as they were scouted by the rest of the world, they grew more captious, irritable, and jealous of each other's pretensions. The general obloquy was so great that every one was willing to escape from it in the crowd, or to curry favor with the victors by denouncing the excesses or picking holes in the conduct of his neighbors, while the victims of popular prejudice and ministerial persecution were eagerly sought for, no one was ready to own that he was one of the set. Unpopularity doth part the flux of company. Each claimed an exception for himself or party, was glad to have any loophole to hide himself from this open and apparent shame, and to shift this blame from his own shoulders, and would by no means be mixed up with Jacobins and levellers, the terms with which their triumphant opponents qualified indiscriminately all those who differed with them in any degree. Where the cause was so disreputable, the company should be select. As the floodgates of Billingsgate abuse and courtly malice were let loose, each coterie drew itself up in a narrower circle. The louder and more sweeping was the storm of Tory spite without. The finer were the distinctions, the more fastidious the precautions used within. The Whigs, completely cowed by the Tories, threw all the odium on the reformers, who in return, with equal magnanimity, vented their stock of spleen and vituperative rage on the Whigs. The common cause was forgotten in each man's anxiety for his own safety and character. If any one, bolder than the rest, wanted to ward off the blows that fell in showers, or to retaliate on the assailants, he was held back or turned out as one who longed to bring an old house about their ears. One object was to give as little offence as possible to the powers that be, to lie by, to trim, to shuffle, to wait for events, to be severe on our own errors, just to the merits of a prosperous adversary, and not to throw away the scabbard or make reconciliation hopeless. Just as all was hushed up, and the chop-fallen wigs were about to be sent for to court, a great cloutering blow from an incorrigible Jacobin might spoil all, and put off the least chance of anything being done for the good of the country, till another reign or the next century. But the great thing was to be genteel, and keep out the rabble. They that touch pitch are defiled. No connection with the mob was labelled on the back of every friend of the people. Every pitiful retainer of opposition took care to disclaim all affinity with such fellows as Hunt, Carlyle, or Cobbett. As it was the continual drift of the ministerial writers to confound the different grades of their antagonists, so the chief dread of the minority was to be confounded with the populace, the canaille, etc. They would be thought neither with the government nor of the people. They are an awkward mark to hit at. It is true they have no superfluous popularity to throw sway upon others and they may be so far right in being shy in the choice of their associates. They are critical in examining volunteers into the service. It is necessary to ask leave of a number of circumstances equally frivolous and vexatious before you can enlist in their skeleton regiment. Thus you must have a good coat to your back, for they have no uniform to give you. You must bring a character in your pocket, for they have no respectability to lose. If you have any scars to show, you had best hide them, or procure a certificate for your pacific behavior from the opposite side, with whom they wish to stand well, and not to be always wounding the feelings of distinguished individuals. You must have vouchers that you were neither born, bred, nor reside within the bills of mortality, or Mr. Theodore Hook will cry cockney. You must have studied at one or other of the English universities, or Mr. Croker will prove every third word to be a bull. If you are a patriot and a martyr to your principles, this is a painful consideration, and must act as a drawback to your pretensions, which would have a mere glossy and creditable appearance if they had never been tried. If you are a lord, or a dangler after lords, it is well. The glittering star hides the plebeian stains. The obedient smile and habitual cringe of approbation are always welcome. A courtier abuses courts with a better grace, for one who has held a place to rail at placemen and pensioners shows candor and a disregard to self. There is nothing low, vulgar, or disreputable in it. I doubt whether this martinet discipline and spruceness of demeanor is favorable to the popular side. 
The Tories are not so squeamish in their choice of tools. If a writer comes up to a certain standard of dullness, impudence, and want of principle, nothing more is expected. There is fat Mudford, lean J, black Croker, flimsy H, lame Gifford, and one-eyed Miller. Do they not form an impenetrable phalanx round the throne, and worthy of it? Who ever thought of inquiring into the talents, qualifications, birth, or breeding of a government scribbler? If the workman is fitted to the work, they care not one straw what you or I say about him. This shows a confidence in themselves, and is the way to assure others. The Whigs, who do not feel their ground so well, make up for their want of strength by a proportionable want of spirit. Their cause is ticklish, and they support it by the least hazardous means. Any violent or desperate measures on their part might recoil upon themselves. When they ensure the age, they are cautious and sage, lest the courtiers offended should be. Whilst they are pelted with the most scurrilous epithets and unsparing abuse, they insist on language the most classical and polished in return, and if any unfortunate devil lets an expression or allusion escape that stings, or jars the tone of good company, he has given up without remorse to the tender mercies of his foes for this infraction of good manners and breach of treaty. The envy or cowardice of these half-faced friends of liberty regularly sacrifices its warmest defenders to the hatred of its enemies, mock patriotism and effeminate self-love ratifying the lists of prescription made out by servility and intolerance. This is base, and contrary to all the rules of political warfare. What, if the Tories give a man a bad name, must the Whigs hang him? If a writer annoys the first, must he alarm the last? or when they find he has irritated his and their opponents beyond all forgiveness and endurance, instead of concluding from the abuse heaped upon him that he has done the state some service, must they set him aside as an improper person merely for the odium which he has incurred by his efforts in the common cause, which, had they been of no effect, would have left him still fit for their purposes of negative success and harmless opposition. Their ambition seems to be to exist by sufferance, to be safe in a sort of conventional insignificance, and in their dread of exciting the notice or hostility of the lords of the earth, they are like the man in the storm, who silenced the appeal of his companion to the gods, Call not so loud, or they will hear us. One who would think that in all ordinary cases honesty to feel for a losing cause, capacity to understand it, and courage to defend it, would be sufficient introduction and recommendation to fight the battles of a party, and serve at least in the ranks. But this, of Whig opposition, is, it seems, a peculiar case there is more in it than meets the eye. The corps may one day be summoned to pass muster before majesty, and in that case it will be expected that they should be of crack materials, without a stain and without a flaw. Nothing can be too elegant, too immaculate and refined for their imaginary return to office. They are in a pitiable dilemma, having to reconcile the hopeless reversion of court favor with the most distant and delicate attempts at popularity. They are strangely puzzled in the choice and management of their associates, some of them must undergo a thorough ventilation and perfuming, like poor Morgan, before Captain Whiffle would suffer him to come into his presence. Neither can anything base and plebeian be supposed to come betwixt the wind and their nobility. As their designs are doubtful, their friends must not be suspected. As their principles are popular, their pretensions must be proportionably aristocratic. The reputation of Whiggism, like that of women, is a delicate thing, and will bear neither to be blown upon nor handled. It has an ill odor which requires the aid of fashionable essences and court powders to carry it off. It labors under the frown of the sovereign and swoons at the shout and pressure of the people. Even in its present forlorn and abject state it relapses into convulsions if any low fellow offers to lend it a helping hand. These who would have their overtures of service accepted must be bedizened and sparkling all over with titles, wealth, place, connections, fashion, in lieu of zeal and talent as a set-off to the imputation of low designs and radical origin, for there is nothing that the patrons of the people dread so much as being identified with them, and of all things the patriotic party abhor, even in their dreams, a misalliance with the rabble. Why must I mention the instances in order to make the foregoing statement intelligible or credible? I would not, but that I and others have suffered by the weakness here pointed out, and I think the cause must ultimately suffer by it, unless some antidote be applied by reason or ridicule. Let one example serve for all. At the time that Lord Byron thought proper to join with Mr. Lee Hunt and Mr. Shelley in the publication called The Liberal, Blackwood's magazine overflowed, as might be expected, with tenfold gall and bitterness. The John Bull was courageous, and Mr. Jordan black in the face at this unheard-of and disgraceful union. 
but who would have supposed that Mr. Thomas Moore and Mr. Hobhouse, those staunch friends and partisans of the people, should also be thrown into almost hysterical agonies of well-bred horror at the coalition between their noble and ignoble acquaintance, between the patrician and the newspaper man? Mr. Moore darted backwards and forwards from Cold Bathfield's prison to the examiner office, from Mr. Longman's to Mr. Murray's shop, in a state of ridiculous trepidation, to see what was to be done to prevent this degradation of the aristocracy letters, this indecent encroachment of plebeian pretensions, this undue extension of patronage and compromise of privilege. The Tories were shocked that Lord Byron would grace the popular side by his direct countenance and assistance. The Whigs were shocked that he should share his confidence and counsels with any one who did not unite the double recommendations of birth and genius but themselves. Mr. Moore had lived so long among the great that he fancied himself one of them, and regarded the indignity as done to himself. Mr. Hobhouse had lately been blackballed by the clubs, and must feel particularly sore and tenacious on the score of public opinions. Mr. Shelley's father, however, was an older baronet than Mr. Hobhouse's. Mr. Lee Hunt was to the full as genteel a man as Mr. Moore in birth, appearance, and education. The pursuits of all four were the same, the muse, the public favor, and the public good. Mr. Moore was himself invited to assist in the undertaking, but he professed an utter aversion to, and warned Lord Byron against, having any concern with joint publications, as of a very neutralizing and leveling description. He might speak from experience. He had tried his hand in that Ulysses bow of critics and politicians, the Edinburgh Review, though his secret had never transpired. Mr. Hobhouse, too, had written illustrations of Child Herald, a sort of partnership concern, Yet to quash the publication of the Liberal, he seriously proposed that his noble friend should write once a week in his own name in the Examiner. The Liberal scheme he was afraid might succeed. The newspaper one he knew could not. I have been whispered that the member for Westminster, for whom I once gave an ineffectual vote, has also conceived some distaste for me. I do not know why, except that I was at one time named as the writer of the famous Tricenti Uravimus letter to Mr. Canning which appeared in the examiner and was afterwards suppressed. He might feel the disgrace of such a supposition. I confess I did not feel the honor. The cabal, the bustle, the significant hints, the confidential rumors were at the height, when, after Mr. Shelley's death, I was invited to take part in this obnoxious publication, obnoxious alike to friend and foe, and when the essay on the spirit of monarchy appeared, which must indeed have operated like a bombshell thrown into the coteries that Mr. Moore frequented, as well as those that he had left, this gentleman wrote off to Lord Byron to say that there was a taint in the liberal, and that he should lose no time in getting out of it. And this, from Mr. Moore to Lord Byron, the last of whom had just involved the publication, against which he was cautioned as having a taint in it, a prosecution for libel, by his vision of judgment, and the first of whom had scarcely written anything all his life that had not a taint in it. It is true that the Holland House party might be somewhat staggered by a jeu d'esprit that set their Blackstone and de Lome theories at defiance, and that they could as little write as answer, but it was not that. Mr. Moore also complained that I had spoken against Lala Rook, though he had just before sent me his fudge family. Still, it was not that. But at the time he sent me that very delightful and spirited publication, my little bark was seen hulling on the flood, in a kind of dubious twilight, and it was not known whether I might not prove a vessel of gallant trim. Mr. Blackwood had not then directed his Grub Street battery against me, but as soon as this was the case, Mr. Moore was willing to whistle me down the wind and let me pray at fortune. Not that I proved haggard, but the contrary. It is sheer cowardice and want of heart. The sole object of the set is not to stem the tide of prejudice and falsehood, but to get out of the way themselves. The instant another is assailed, however unjustly, instead of standing manfully by him, they cut the connection as fast as possible, and sanction by their silence and reserve the accusations they ought to repel. Sauve qui peut! Everyone has enough to do to look after his own reputation or safety, without rescuing a friend or propping up a fallen cause. It is only by keeping in the background on such occasions like Gil Blas, when his friend Ambrose Lamella was led by in triumph to the auto de fe, that they can escape the like honors and a summary punishment. A shower of mud, a flight of nicknames, glancing a little out of their original direction, might obscure the last glimpse of royal favor, or stop the last gasp of popularity. Nor could they answer it to their noble friends and more elegant pursuits to be seen in such company, or to have their names coupled with similar outrages. Their sleek, glossy, aspiring pretensions should not be exposed to vulgar contamination, or to be trodden under foot of a swinish multitude. 
their birthday suits unused should not be dragged through the kennel nor their tricksy laurel wreaths stuck in the pillory this would make them equally unfit to be taken into the palaces of princes or the carriages of peers if excluded from both what would become of them the only way therefore to avoid being implicated in the abuse poured upon others is to pretend that it is just the way not to be made the object of the hue and cry raised against a friend is to aid it by underhand whispers it is pleasant neither to participate in disgrace nor to have honours divided the more lord byron confined his intimacy and friendship to a few persons of middling rank but of extraordinary merit the more it must redound to his and their credit the lines of pope to view with scornful yet with jealous eyes and hate for arts which caused himself to rise might still find a copy in the breast of more than one scribbler of politics and fashion mr moore might not think without a pang of the author of rimini sitting at his ease with the author of child harold mr hobhouse might be averse to see my dogged prose bound up in the same volume with his lordship's splendid verse and assuredly it would not facilitate his admission to the clubs that his friend lord byron had taken the editor of the examiner by the hand and that their common friend mr moore had taken no active steps to prevent it those who have the least character to spare can the least afford to part with their good word to others a losing cause is always most divided against itself if the whigs are fastidious the reformers are sour if the first are frightened at the least breath of scandal the last are disgusted with the smallest approach to popularity the one desert you if all men do not speak well of you the other never forgive your having shaken off the incognito which they assume so successfully or your having escaped from the grub into the butterfly state the one require that you should enjoy the public favour in its newest gloss with the other set the smallest elegance of pretension or accomplishment is fatal the whigs never stomached the account of the characters of shakespeare's plays in the quarterly the reformers never forgave me for writing them at all or for being suspected of an inclination to the belles lettres the gods they feared had made me poetical and poetry with them is not a true thing to please the one you must be a dandy not to incur the censure of the other you must turn cynic the one are on the alert to know what the world think or say of you the others make it a condition that you shall fly in the face of all the world to think and say exactly as they do the first thing the westminster review did was to attack the edinburgh the fault of the one is too great a deference for established and prevailing opinions that of the other is a natural antipathy to everything with which any one else sympathizes they do not trim but they are riveted to their own sullen and violent prejudices they think to attract by repulsion to force others to yield to their opinion by never giving up an inch of ground and to cram the truth down the throats of their starveling readers as you cram turkeys with gravel and sawdust they would gain proselytes by prescribing all those who do not take their shibboleth and advance a cause by shutting out all that can adorn or strengthen it they would exercise a monstrous ostracism on every ornament of style or blandishment of sentiment and unless they can allure by barrenness and deformity and convince you against the grain think they have done nothing they abjure sir walter's novels and mr moore's poetry as light and frivolous who but they nothing satiates or gives them pleasure that does not give others pain they scorn to win you by flattery and fair words they set up their grim bare idols and expect you to fall down and worship them and truth is with them a sphinx that in embracing pierces you to the heart all this they think is the effect of philosophy but it is temper and a bad sour cold malignant temper into the bargain if the whigs are too effeminate and susceptible of extraneous impressions these underlings are too hard and tenacious of their own they are certainly the least amiable people in the world nor are they likely to reform others by their self-willed dogmatism and ungracious manner if they had this object at heart they would correct both for true humanity and wisdom are the same but they would rather lose the cause of humankind than not shock and offend while they would be thought only anxious to convince as mr place lost mr hobhouse his first election by a string of radical resolutions which so far gained their end one is hard bested in times like these and between such opposite factions when almost every one seems to pull his own way and to make his principles a stalking horse to some private end when you offend some without conciliating others when you incur most blame where you expected most favour when a universal outcry is raised against you on one side which is answered by as dead a silence on the other when none but those who have the worst designs appear to know their meaning or to be held together by any mutual tie 
and when the only assurance you can obtain that your intentions have been upright, or in any degree carried into effect, is that you are the object of their unremitting obloquy and ill-will. If you look for any other testimony to it, you will look in vain. The Tories know their enemies, the people do not know their friends. The frown and the lightning glance of power is upon you, and points out the path of honour and of duty, but you can hope to receive no note of encouragement or approbation from the painted booths of Whig aristocracy or the sordid styes of reform. THE END End of section 45 End of The Plain Speaker, Opinions on Books, Men, and Things by William Hazlitt